Section 15 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. Expectation of America by Richard Hacklute. 1552 to 1616. Richard Hakluyt has himself told how, when he was one of Queen Elizabeth's scholars at Westminster, he was inspired to the study of cosmography by a visit to the chamber of a kinsman, a gentleman of the Inner Temple in London. He saw there all manner of books on geography and resolved thereupon to make their acquaintance. And while studying for holy orders at Oxford and afterward in France, as chaplain to Sir Edward Stafford, both reading and observation gave him knowledge of English slothfulness in maritime discovery and enterprise. Before Hakluyt was sent as ambassador's chaplain to Paris, however, he had published his first work, Divers Voyages Touching the Discovery of America and the Islands, adjacent unto the same, made first of all by our Englishmen, and afterwards by the Frenchmen and Britons, and certain notes of advertisements for observations, necessary for such as shall hereafter make the like attempt, with two maps annexed hereunto, for the plainer understanding of the whole matter, imprinted at London for Thomas Woodcock, dwelling in Paul's churchyard, at the sign of the Black Bear, 1582. The book, which appeared when he was thirty, he was born about 1552, was dedicated to the right worshipful and very virtuous gentleman, Master Philip Sidney Esquire, and in the address to his patron, Hakluyt complains of England's failure to possess herself of lands rightly hers. This was to preface a plea for the establishment of a lectureship to advance the art of navigation for which cause I have dealt with the right worshipful Sir Francis Drake, that, seeing God hath blessed him so wonderfully, he would do this honor to himself and benefit to his country, to be at the cost to erect such a lecture. But his efforts proved futile. The most memorable fruit of Hakluyt's life in Paris was a particular discourse concerning the great necessity and manifold commodities that are like to grow to this realm of England by the Western discoveries lately attempted, written in the year 1584, by Richard Hakluyt of Oxford, at the request and direction of the rightful worshipful Mr. Walter Raleigh, now night, before the coming home of his two barks, a part of which notable paper is given at the end of this article. The energy, zeal, vigor, and conviction the peace displays bear out the claims of Robertson, who, in his History of America, asserts that it is the Elizabethan preacher to whom England is more indebted for its American possessions than to any man of that age. Hakluyt's faith and earnestness were so eager that he even had a thought a personal hazard, as a second letter to Walsingham bears witness. During a visit to England in 1584, he had presented his particular discourse concerning Western discoveries, along with one in Latin upon Aristotle's politics, to his royal mistress, who, in recognition of his pains and loyalty, had given him a prebend at Bristol. In May 1585, he brought in person before the chapter of the cathedral at Bristol the Queen's order for the preferment. Upon this, and like ecclesiastical stipends, he lived and did his work. The most versed man in that skill. Cosmography, says Hackett, that England bred. While in Paris, Hakluyt translated and published in 1587 Londemir's Histoire Notable de la Florida, under the title A Notable History Containing Four Voyages, made by certain French captains into Florida. At the same time, and in the same year, he was preparing and publishing the Ordo Novo Petri Matrius Angeli, Decades Octo Illustrati, Labori e Industria 
Ricardo Hakluti. In this work is the copper plate map upon which the name of Virginia is for the first time set down. In 1588, Hakluti returned to England and in the following year published a solitary volume, the precursor of his magnus opus, the principal navigations, voyages, traffics, and discoveries of the English nation, which appeared in London in three folio volumes between 1598 and 1600. In a word, says Thomas Fuller in his Worthies, many of such useful tracts of sea adventure, which before were scattered as several ships, Mr. Hucklet hath embodied into a fleet divided into three squadrons, so many several volumes, a work of great honor to England, it being possible that many ports and islands in America which, being bare and barren, bear only a bare name for the present, may prove rich places for the future, and then these voyages will be produced and pleaded, as good evidence of their belonging to England, as first discovered and dominated by Englishmen. The work is invaluable, a storehouse of the facts of life, the habits of thinking and doing, of the discoveries abroad of the Englishmen of the high seas in Elizabeth's day. The salt air of the northern seas blows over Hucklet's pages, as well as the hot simoon and baffling winds. We run aground with the castaways, adventure in bargaining with natives, and in company with the mariners lament the casting overboard to save our good bark of three tons of spice. The men of that day were seekers after a golden fleece, the argonauts of the modern world, and their rough-hewn stories are untellable save in their hardy vernacular. Some of them were traders, with now and then the excitement of a skirmish or freebooting expedition, a salt to harden the true tender flesh of easy commerce. All were self-gainers and all soldiers of fortune, and by the simplest fact, the forerunners of the seventeenth-century buccaneers, and every sort of excess and turpitude that name connotes. After Hakluyt had completed his great work, he edited translation from the Portuguese, The Discoveries of the World, 1601, and in 1609, published his own translation of De Soto's discoveries in Florida. In this work, called Virginia Richly Valued, he endeavored to promote the interest of the infant settlement. Certain of his manuscripts fell after his death into the hands of Samuel Purchase, and were by him edited and included in his Pilgrims, 1625-26. to He paid his last debt to nature, says Anthony A. Wood. 23rd November, in 1616, and was buried in the Abbey Church of Westminster, dedicated to St. Peter, on the 26th of the same month. The particular discourse was first printed from a contemporary manuscript by Dr. Woods of Bordeaux College and Mr. Charles Dean of Cambridge, Massachusetts, in 1877. Dr. Woods had trace of the paper while searching in England for historical documents on behalf of the Historical Society of Maine. The copy from which he made his transcript was doubtless one of the four which Hocklet prepared at the time he presented this discourse to Queen Elizabeth. Its object was evidently to gain Elizabeth's support for Raleigh's adventure, which he had undertaken under a patent granted him in March 1584. The paper is most curious and valuable, and from the point of view of today, seems to a degree prophetic. Besides proving that Hocklet had sagacity, penetrative insight, and an imagination that could seize upon and construct in practical affairs, it is typical of the English attitude through all centuries. A moral impulse is in Anglo-Saxon blood, and whatever it undertakes, morality, or an admixture of morality and religion, is its potential incentive. The English, in all such works as Hacklet deals with, have started out with religion or a moral question and ended with commerce. Hacklet's principal navigations and voyages were republished in 1809 to 1812. The voyages of the English nation to America were edited by Mr. Edmund Goldsmith 
in 1889. The particular discourse appears in these later volumes, as well as in the publications of the Maine Historical Society. Expectations of America A particular discourse concerning the great necessity in manifold commodities that are like to grow to this realm of England by the Western discoveries lately attempted, written in the year 1584 by Richard Hacklett of Oxford, at the request and direction of the right worshipful Mr. Walter Raleigh, now night, before the coming home of his two barks. Copyrighted by the Maine Historical Society and reprinted by its permission, singe that the people of that part of America from 30 degrees in Florida northward into 63 degrees, with years, yet is no Christian princess, actual possession, are idolaters, and that those which Stephen Gomes brought from the coast of Norumberga in the year 1524 worshipped the sun, the moon, and the stars, and used other idolatry. It remains to be thoroughly weighed and considered by what means and by whom this most godly and Christian work may be performed of in Laringe, the glorious gospel of Christ. Now the kings and queens of England had the name of defenders of the faith, by which title I think they are not only charged to maintain and patronize the faith of Christ, but also to enlarge and advance the same. Neither ought this to be their last work, but rather the principal and chief of all others, according to the commandments of our Savior, Christ, Matthew 6, First seek the kingdoms of God and the righteousness thereof, and all other things shall misinterred unto you. Now the means to send such as shall labor effectually in this business is, by planting one or two colonies of our nation upon that farm, where they shall remain in safety and first learn the language of the people near adjoining, the gift of tongues being now taken away, and by little and little acquaint themselves with their manner, and so with discretion and mildness, distill into their purged minds the sweet and lively liquor of the gospel. Now, therefore, I trust the time is at hand, when by Her Majesty's forwardness in this enterprise, not only this objection and such like, it shall be answered by our fruitful labor in God's harvest among the infidels, but also many inconveniences and strifes amongst ourselves at home and matters of ceremony shall be ended. But those of the clergy, which by reason of idleness here at home, are now always copying up new opinions, having by this voyage to set themselves on work in reducing the savages to the chief principles of our faith, will become less contentious, and be contented with the truth and religion already established by authority. So they that shall bear the name of Christians, shall show themselves worthy of their vocation. The next thing is that now I declare unto you the commodities of this new western discovery, and what merchandise are there to be had, and from thence to be expected, wherein first you are to have regard unto the situation of the places which are left for us to be possessed. The countries, therefore, of America, whereunto we have just title as being first discovered by Sebastian Cabot, at the cost of that prudent prince, King Henry the Seventh, from Florida northwards to 67 degrees, and not yet in any Christian prince's actual possession, being answerable to climate to Barbary, Egypt, Syria, Persia, Turkey, Greece, all the islands of the Levant Sea, Italy, Spain, Portugal, France, Flanders, High Almain, Denmark, Esland, Poland, and Muscovy may presently within a short space afford unto us for little or nothing, and with much more safety, either all or a great part of the commodities which the aforesaid countries do yield us at a very dear hand and with manifold dangers. First, therefore, to begin at the south from thirty degrees and to quote unto you the leaf and page of the printed voyages of those which personally have with diligence searched and viewed these countries. John Ribault writeth thus, 
in the first leaf of his discourse, extant in print, both in French and English. We entered, saith he, and viewed the country, which is the fairest, fruitfulest, and pleasantest of all the world, abounding in honey, wax, venison, wild fowl, forests, woods of all sorts, palm trees, cypresses, cedars, bays, the highest and greatest, which also the fairest vines in all the world, with grapes according, which naturally without art or man's help or trimming will grow to tops of oaks and other trees that be of wonderful greatness and height. And the sight of the fair meadows is a pleasure, not able to be expressed with tongue, full of herons, curlews, bitters, mallards, epigrets, woodcocks, and all other kind of small birds, with hearts, hinds, bucks, wild swine, and all other kind of wild beasts, as we perceived well, both by their footings there, and also afterward in other places by their cry and roaring in the night. Also there be conies and hares, silkworms in marvelous number, a great deal fairer and better than be our silkworms. Again, in the sixth leaf and second page, they showed unto us by signs that they had in the land gold and silver and copper, whereof we had brought some home, also led like unto ours, which we showed them, also turkises and great abundance of pearls, which as they are declared unto us they took out of oysters, whereof there is taken ever along the riverside, and amongst the reeds, and in the marshes, in so marvellous abundance as it is scant credible. And we have perceived that there be as many and as great perils found there as in any country in the world. In the seventh leaf it followeth thus, the situation is under thirty degrees, a good climate, healthful, and of good temperature, marvellous pleasant, the people good, and of a gentle and amiable nature, which willingly will obey, yea, be contented to serve those that shall with gentleness and humanity go about to allure them, as yet is necessary for those that be sent, thither hereafter so to do. In the eighth leaf, it is a place wonderful, fertile, and of strong situation, the ground fat, so that it is like that it would bring forth wheat and all other corn twice a year. Verisana, falling in the latitude of 34 degrees, described the situation and commodities in this manner. Beyond this, we saw the open country rising in height above the sandy shore, with many fair fields and plains, full of mighty great woods, some very thick and some very thin, replenished with divers sorts of trees, and pleasant and delectable to behold, as is possible to imagine. And your majesty may not think that those are like the woods of Hycenia, or the wild deserts of Tartaria, and the northern coast, full of fruitless trees, but full of palm, day trees, bays, and high cypresses, and many of the sorts of trees to us unknown in Europe, which yield more sweet savors far from the shore. Neither do we think that they, partaking of the estate world round about them, are altogether void of drugs and spicery, and other riches of gold, seeing the color of the land, doth altogether argue yet. And the land is full of many beasts, as red deer, fallow deer, and hares, and likewise of lakes and pools of fresh water, with great plenty of fowls, convenient for all pleasant game. This land is in latitude thirty-four degrees, with good and wholesome air, temperate between hot and cold. No vehement winds do blow in these regions, etc. Again, in the fourth leaf, as it is in English, speaking of the next country, he saith, We saw in this country many vines growing naturally, which springing up took hold of the trees as they do in Lombardy, which, if by husbandmen they were dressed in good order, without all doubt they would yield excellent wines. For having oftenest seen the fruit thereof dried, 
which was sweet and pleasant and not differing from ours. We think they do esteem of the same, because then in every place where they grow, they take away the underbranches growing round about, that the fruit thereof may ripen the better. We found also roses, violets, lilies, and many sorts of herbs, and sweet and odiferous flowers. And after, in the sixth leaf, he saith, We were oftentimes within the land five or six leagues, which we found as pleasant as is possible to declare, apt for any kind of husbandry of corn, wine, and oil. For therein there are plains, twenty-five or thirty leagues broad, open and without any impediment of trees, of such fruitfulness that any seed being sown herein will bring forth most excellent fruit. We entered afterwards into the woods, which we found so great and thick that an army, were it never so great, might have hid itself therein. The trees whereof were oaks, cypress, and other sorts unknown in Europe. We found palmy appy, plumes, and nuts, and many other sorts of fruits to us unknown. There are beasts in great abundance, as red deer and fallow deer, leopards and other kinds, which they take with their bows and arrows, which are their chiefest weapon. This land is situated in the parallel of Rome in forty-one degrees and two terces, and towards the end he saith, We saw many of the people wear earrings of copper hanging at their ears, thus far out of the relation of Verisana. This coast, from Cape Britain, two hundred leagues to the southwest, was again discovered at the charges of the Cardinal of Bourbon by my friend Stephen Bellinger of Rome, the last year, 1583, who found a town of fourscore houses, covered with the barks of trees upon a river side, about one hundred leagues from the aforesaid Cape Britain. He reported that the country is of the temperature of the coast of Cascoin and Goliath. He brought home a kind of mineral matter, supposed to hold silver, whereof he gave me some, a kind of muffs called castor, divers bee skins, as beavers, otters, martins, lucernes, seals, buffs, deer skins, all dressed and painted on the inner side with divers excellent colors, as red, tawn, yellow, and vermilion, all which things I saw and divers other merchandise he hath, which I saw not. But he told me that he had four hundred and forty crowns for that in Rome, which, in trifles bestowed upon the savages, strode him not in forty crowns. The nature and quality of the other part of America from Cape Britain, being in forty-six degrees unto the latitude of fifty-two, for two hundred leagues within the land even to Hawk Lega, is notably described in the two voyages of Jacques Cartier. In the fifth chapter of his second relation, thus he writeth, From the 19th till the 28th of September, we sailed up the river, never losing one hour of time, all which space we saw, as goodly a country as possibly could be wished for, full of all sorts of goodly trees, that is to say, oaks, elms, walnut trees, cedars, firs, ashes, box, willows, and great store of vines, all as full of grapes as could be, that if any of our fellows went on shore, they came home laden with them. There were likewise many cranes, swans, geese, mallards, pheasants, partridges, thrushes, blackbirds, turtles, finches, redbreasts, nightingales, sparrows, with other sorts of birds, even as in France, and great plenty in store. Again, in the tenth chapter of the said relation, there ye mention of silver and gold to be upon a river, that is three months sailing, navigable southward from Holiginga, and that red copper is in Saguenay. All that country is full of sundry sorts of wood and many vines. There is great store of stags, red deer, fallow deer, bears, and other such, like sorts of beasts, as conies, hares, martins, foxes, artists, beavers, squirrels, badgers, and rats, 
exceedingly great, and divers other sorts of beasts for hunting. There were also many sorts of fowls, as cranes, swans, outards, wild geese, white and gray, ducks, thrushes, blackbirds, turtles, wild pigeons, linnets, finches, redbreasts, stairs, nightingales, sparrows, and other birds, even as in France. Also, as we have said before, the said river is the plentifulest of fish that ever hath been seen or heard of, because that from the head to the mouth of it you shall find all kind of fresh and salt water fish according to their season. There are also many whales, porpoises, seahorses, and adhudis, which is a kind of fish which we have never seen nor heard of before. And in the eleventh chapter thus, we understood of Donacana and others that there are people clad with clothes, as we are, very honest in many inhabited towns, and that they had great store of gold and red copper, and that within the land beyond the said first river unto Hokalaga and Saguenay is an island environed round about with that and other rivers, and that there is a sea of fresh water found, and as they have heard, say of those of Saguenay, there was never man heard of that found out the beginning and end thereof. Finally, in the postscript of the second relation, we read these words, They of Canada say that it is a moon sailing to go to a land where cinnamon and cloves are gathered. Thus having alleged many printed testimonies of these credible persons, which were personally between 30 and 63 degrees in America, as well as on the coast as within the land, which affirmed unto the princes and kings which set them out, that they found there. I may well and truly conclude with reason and authority that all the commodities of all our old, decayed, and dangerous trades in all Europe, Africa, and Asia, haunted by us, may in short space for little or nothing, and many for the very workmanship, in a manner he had in that part of America which lieth between thirty and sixty degrees of northerly latitude. If by our slackness we suffer not the French or others to prevent us. Chapter 4 That this enterprise will be for the manifold employment of numbers of idle men, and for breeding of many sufficient, and for utterance of the great quantity of the commodities of our realm. It is well worth the observation to see and consider what the like voyages of discovery and planting in the East and West Indies hath wrought in the kingdoms of Portugal and Spain, both which realms, behind, of themselves poor and barren and hardly able to sustain their inhabitants, by their discoveries have found such occasion of employment that these many years we have not heard scarcely of any pirate or those two nations, whereas we and the French are most infamous for our outrageous common and daily piracies. Again, when heard, we almost of one thief amongst them. The reason is that by these new discoveries they have so many honest ways to set them on work as they rather want men than means to employ them. But we, for all the statutes that hitherto can be devised, and the sharp execution of the same, in punishing idle, lazy persons, for want of sufficient occasion of honest employment, cannot deliver our commonwealth from multitudes of loiterers and idle vagabonds. Truth it is, that through our long peace and seldom sickness, Two singular blessings of Almighty God, we are grown more populous than ever heretofore, so that now there are of every art and science so many that they can hardly live one by another, nay, rather, they are ready to eat up one another. Yea, many thousands of idle persons are within this realm, which, having no way to be set on work, be either mutinous or seek alteration in the state or at least very burdensome, to the commonwealth, and often fall to pilfering and thieving and other lewdness, whereby all the prisons of the land are daily pestered and stuffed full of them, where either they pitifully pine away 
or else at length are miserably hanged, even twenty at a clap out of some one jail. Whereas, if this voyage were put in execution, these petty thieves might be condemned for certain years in the western parts, especially in Newfoundland, in saying, and felling, of timber of four masts of ships, and deal boards, in burning of the fires and pine trees to make pitch, tar, rosin, and soap ashes, in beating and working of hemp for cordage, and in the more southern parts, in setting them to work in mines of gold, silver, copper, lead, and iron, in dragging for pearls and curry all, in planting of sugar canes, as the Portugals have done in Maldera, in maintenance and increasing of silkworms for silk, and in dressing the same, in gathering up cotton whereof there is plenty, in tilling of the soil there for grain, in dressing of vines whereof there is great abundance for wine, olives whereof the soil is capable for oil, trees for oranges, lemons, almonds, figs, and other fruits, all which are found to grow there already, in sowing of wood and matter for dyers, as the Portuguese have done in the Azores, in dressing of raw hides of divers kinds of beasts, in making and gathering of salt, as in Roquel and Bayon, which may serve for the new land fishing, in killing the whale, seal, porpoise, and whirlpool, for train oil, in fishing, salting, and draining of linge, cod, salmon, herring, in making and gathering of honey, wax, turpentine, in hewing and shaping of stone, as marble, jeet, crystal, freestone, which will be good ballast for our ships homewards, and have to serve for noble buildings, in making of casks, oars, and all other matter of staves, in building of forts, towns, churches, in podridge and barrelage of fish, fowls, and flesh, which will be notable provision for sea and land, in drying, sorting, and packing of feathers, whereof may be had their marvellous great quantity. Beside this, such as by any kind of infirmity cannot pass the seas thither, and now are chargeable to the realm at home, by this voyage shall be made profitable members by employing them in England, in making of a thousand trifling things, which will be very good merchandise for those countries where we shall have most ample vent thereof. And seeing the savages of the Grand Bay, and all along the mighty river runneth up to Canada and Hoklaga, are greatly delighted with any cap or garment made of coarse woolen cloth. Their country being cold and sharp in the winter, it is manifest we shall find great utterance of our clothes, especially of our courses and bases more than dozens, and our Irish and Welsh friezes and rugs whereby all occupations belonging to clothing and knitting shall be freshly set on work, as cappers, knitters, clothiers, woolmen, carters, spinners, weavers, fullers, shearmen, dyers, drapers, hatters, and such like, whereby many decayed towns may be repaired. In sum, this enterprise will minister matter for all sorts and states of men to work upon, namely, all several kinds of artificers, husbandmen, seamen, merchants, soldiers, captains, physicians, lawyers, divines, cosmographers, hydrographers, astronomers, historiographers, yea, old folk, lame persons, women, and young children, by many means which hereby shall still be ministered unto them, shall be kept from idleness and be made able by their own honest and easy labor, to find themselves without surcharging others. Whatsoever clothe, we shall vent on the tract of that frame, or in the island of the same, or in other lands, islands, and territories beyond, be they within the circle Arctic, or without. All these clothes, I say, are to pass out of this realm, full wrought by our natural subjects in all degrees of labor. And if it come about in time, that we shall vent that mass, 
there that we vented in the base countries, which is hoped by great reason. Then shall all that clothe pass out of this realm in all degrees of labor, full wrought by the poor natural subjects of this realm. Like as the quantity of our clothes doth pass, that goeth hence to Russia, Barbary, Turkey, Persia, etc. And then consequently it followeth, that the like number of people alleged to the emperor shall be set on work in England of our poor subjects more than hath been. And so her majesty shall not be troubled with the pitiful outcries of cappers, knitters, spinners, etc. And on the other side, we are to note that all the commodities we shall bring thence, we shall not bring them brought, as we bring now the commodities of France and Flanders, etc., but shall receive them all substances unwrought to the employment of a wonderful multitude of the poor subjects of this realm in return. And so to conclude, what in the number of things to go out wrought, and to come in unwrought, they need not one poor creature to steal, to starve, or to beg, as they do. And to answer objections, we fools for the swarming of beggars allege that the realm is too populous. Solomon saith that the honor and strength of a prince consisteth of the multitude of the people, and if this come about, that work may be had for the multitude, where the realm hath now one thousand for the defense thereof, the same may have five thousand. But when people know how to live, and how to maintain and feed their wives and children, they will not abstain, for marriage is now they do. And the soil thus abounding with corn, flesh, milk, butter, cheese, herbs, roots and fruits, etc., and the seas that environ the same, so infinitely abounding in fish, I dare truly affirm that if the number in this realm were as great as all Spain and France have, the people, being industrious, I say, there should be found fiddles enough at the full in all bounties to suffice them all, and taking order to carry hence, thither are clothes made in hose, coats, cloaks, woods, etc., and to return thither hides of their own beasts, canned and turned into shoes and boots, and other skins of goats, whereof they have store into gloves, etc., no doubt, but we shall set on work in this realm, besides sailors and such as shall be seated there in those western discovered countries, at the least CM subjects, to the great abating of the good estate of subjects of foreign princes, enemies, or doubtful friends. And this absque injuria, as the lawyers say, albeit not senadano. Chapter 15 that speedy planting in diverse fit places is most necessary upon those last lucky western discoveries, for fear of the danger of being prevented by other nations, which have the like intention, with the other thereof, and other reasons therewithal alleged. Having by God's good guidance and merciful direction achieved happily this present western discovery, after the seeking the advancement of the kingdom of Christ, the second chief, the principal end of the same, is traffic, which consisteth in the vent of the mass of our clothes and other commodities of England, and in receiving back of the needful commodities that we now receive from all other places of the world. But for as much as this is a matter of great importance, and a thing of so great gain as foreign princes will stomach at. This one thing is to be done without which it were in vain to go about this, and that is the matter of planting and fortification, without due consideration whereof in vain were to think of the former, and therefore upon the first said view taken by the ships that are to be sent thither, we are to plant upon the mouths of the great navigable rivers which are there by strong order of fortification, and there to plant our colonies, and so being first settled in strength with men, 
arm munition, and having our navy within our bays, havens, and roads, we shall be able to let the entrance of all subjects of foreign princes, and so with our fresh powers to encounter their ships at the sea, and to renew the same with fresh men, as the sodden fleet shall require, and by our forge shall be able to hold fast our first footing, and readily to annoy such weary power of any that shall seek to arrive, and shall be able without navy to send advertisement into England upon every sodden whatsoever shall happen, and these fortifications shall keep the natural people of the country in obedience and good order, and these forts at the mouths of those great portable and navigable rivers may at all times send up their ships, barks, barges, and boats into the inland with all the commodities of England, and return unto the said forts all the commodities of the inlands that we shall receive in exchange, and thence at pleasure convey the same into England, and thus settled in those forts, if the next neighbors shall attempt any annoy to our people, we are kept safe by our forts, and we may, upon violence and wrong offered by them, run upon the rivers with our ships, pinnaces, barks, and boats, and enter into league with the petite princes, their neighbors, that have always likely wars one with another, and so entrench league now with the one and then with the other. We shall purchase our own safety and make ourselves lords of the whole. Contrarywise, without this planting in due time, we shall never be able to have full knowledge of the language, manners, and customs of the people of those regions. Neither shall we be able to thoroughly to know the riches and commodities of the inlands, with many other secrets, whereof as yet we have but a small taste. And although by other means we might attain to the knowledge thereof, yet being not there fortified and strongly seated, the French that swarm with multitude of people, or other nations, might secretly fortify and settle themselves before us, hearing of the benefit that is to be reaped of that voyage. And so we should beat the bush and other men, take the birds. We should be at the charge and travail, and other men reap the gain. If we do procrastinate the planting, and where our men have now presently discovered, and found it to be the best part of America that is left, and in truth more agreeable to our natures, and more near unto us than Nova Hispania, the French, the Normans, the Britons, or the Dutch, or some other nation, will not only prevent us of the mighty bay of St. Lawrence, where they have gotten the start of us already, though we had the same revealed to us by books published and printed in English before them, but also will deprive us of that good land which now we have discovered. God, which doth all things in his due time, and hath in his hand the hearts of all princes, stir up the mind of her majesty at length to assist her most willing and forward subjects to the performance of this most godly and profitable action which was begun at the charges of king henry the seventh her grandfather followed by king henry the eighth her father and left as it seemeth to be accomplished by her as the three years golden voyage to ophir by solomon to the making of her realm and subjects most happy, and herself most famous to all posterity. Amen. End of section 15. Section 16 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. Edward Everett Hale. Born 1822. 
The city of Boston has been long remarkable for its distinguished figures in science, politics, and affairs, in art and literature, and particularly in the walk of letters. Edward Everett Hale is one of these figures. Dr. Hale's long and still productive life has been one of great and varied usefulness, the religious, philanthropic, civic, and literary circles of his community have felt for many years the impact of his vigorous personality, and his reputation as preacher and writer has become national. His family is a noted one. His father was Nathan Hale, first editor of the Boston Daily Advertiser, Nathan Hale the martyr being of the same line while several of the immediate kin of Edward Hale find places in American biography. Born in Boston, April 3, 1822, Edward Everett Hale was educated at the famous Latin School, then at Harvard, of which he is one of the most noteworthy sons. Hale read theology and was licensed to preach by the Boston Association of Congregational Ministers, his first regular settlement being in Worcester, where he was pastor of the Church of the Unity from 1846 to 1856. Thence he went to the Boston Unitarian Society, known as the South Congregational Church, and for more than forty years has been its active head. As a clergyman, Dr. Hale has shown rare qualities as preacher and organizer. His theology has been of the advanced liberal type, his teaching emphasizing good works, his earnest helpful efforts in the broadest humanitarian undertakings have gone far outside the conventional limits of his calling, making him more widely known as a public man both by direct personal endeavor and through the influence of his writings he has been instrumental in founding many societies for beneficent work of all kinds of which the harry wadsworth clubs and the look-up legion with members by the tens of thousands in different lands are examples he has kept closely in touch with his alma mater at cambridge serving it as member of the board of overseers and as president of the phi beta kappa society the degree of s t d was conferred upon him by harvard in eighteen seventy nine his journalistic enterprises have been too many for enumeration here he began early setting type in his father's office as a lad and showing himself a diligent scribbler Perhaps his best-known editorial connections have been with the magazine Old and New, started under Unitarian auspices with the idea of giving literary expression to liberal Christianity, and afterwards merged in Scribner's Monthly and Lend a Hand, a sort of record of organized charity, founded in 1886. Few writing clergymen have been so voluminous as Dr. Hale, few so successful. In addition to the long list of his magazine papers and articles of every sort, his books number upwards of fifty titles, as is inevitable in one who is so prolific, throwing off literary work with a running pen, often with a practical rather than an artistic aim, much of his writing is occasional in motive and ephemeral in character. It includes histories, essays, novels, poems, and short stories, and the average quality, considering the variety and extent of the performance, and the fact that with Dr. Hale literature is an advocation, and aside from his main business in life, is decidedly high. The short story is the literary form in which he has best expressed his gift and character. One of his stories, The Man Without a Country, is a little American classic. Others, such as My Double and How He Undid Me, and The Skeleton in the Closet, have also won permanent popularity. 
They were written a generation ago, when the short story was not the familiar form it has since become, so that, in addition to their merit, they are of interest as early ventures in the tale distinguished from the full-length novel. The Man Without a Country, selections from which follow, well represents Dr. Hale's characteristics. Its manner has ease, felicity, and good breeding. The narrative runs along in such an honest, straightforward way, there is such an air of verisimilitude, that the reader is half inclined to accept it all as history, although the idea of a United States naval officer kept a prisoner at sea for a long lifetime, and never permitted to hear or know of his native land, is hardly more credible than the idea of the flying Dutchman or the wandering Jew. Yet, when the tale appeared, the writer received letters of inquiry, indicating that the fiction was taken in sober earnest, and in a later edition he stated in an appendix that it lacked all foundation in fact, but over and above its literary fascination, the man without a country is surcharged with ethical significance. It is a beautiful allegory showing the dire results of a momentary and heedless lapse from patriotism, and so preaching love of country. It develops a lively sense of what it is to have a flag to fight for, a land to love, this lesson is conveyed with power and pathos, and the story's instant and continued acceptance is testimony, were any needed, that Americans felt the appeal while enjoying the lovely fiction for its own sake. Such work on the moral side is typical of Dr. Hale. He cannot write without a spiritual or moral purpose. If his literature is didactic, it is not dull, and hence, doing good, it also justifies itself as art. Selection Philip Nolan by Edward Everett Hale From The Man Without a Country Copyrighted, reprinted by permission of Dr. Hale and J. S. Smith & Company, Publishers, Boston Philip Nolan was as fine a young officer as there was in the Legion of the West, as the Western Division of our army was then called. When Aaron Burr made his first dashing expedition down to New Orleans in 1805 at Fort Massac, or somewhere above on the river, he met, as the devil would have it, this gay dashing bright young fellow at some dinner party, I think, Burr marked him, talked to him, walked with him, took him a day or two's voyage in his flatboat, and, in short, fascinated him. For the next year, barrack life was very tame to poor Nolan. He occasionally availed himself of the permission the great man had given him to write to him. Long, high-worded, stilted letters the poor boy wrote and rewrote and copied but never a line did he have in reply from the gay deceiver. The other boys in the garrison sneered at him, because he sacrificed in this unrequited affection for a politician the time which they devoted to Monongahela, Hazard, and High-Low Jack. Bourbon, Euchre, and Poker were still unknown. But one day Nolan had his revenge. This time Burr came down the river, not as an attorney seeking a place for his office, but as a distinguished conqueror. He had defeated I know not how many district attorneys. He had dined at I know not how many public dinners. He had been heralded in I know not how many weekly argosies, and it was rumored that he had an army behind him and an empire before him. It was a great day, his arrival, to poor Nolan. Burr had not been at the fort an hour before he sent for him. That evening he asked Nolan to take him out in his skiff, to show him a cane brake or a cottonwood tree, as he said, really to seduce him, 
and by the time the sale was over nolan was enlisted body and soul from that time though he did not yet know it he lived as a man without a country what burr meant to do i know no more than you dear reader it is none of our business just now only when the grand catastrophe came and jefferson and the house of virginia of that day undertook to break on the wheel all the possible clarences of the then house of york by the great treason trial at richmond some of the lesser fry in that distant mississippi valley which was further down from us than puget sound is to-day introduced the like novelty on their provincial stage and to while away the monotony of the summer at fort adams got up for spectacles a string of court-martials on the officers there one and another of the colonels and majors were tried and to fill out the list little nolan against whom heaven knows there was evidence enough that he was sick of the service had been willing to be false to it and would have obeyed any order to march any whither with any one who would follow him had the order been signed by command of his excellency a burr the courts dragged on the big flies escaped rightly for all i know nolan was proved guilty enough as i say yet you and i would never have heard of him reader but that when the president of the court asked him at the close whether he wished to say anything to show that he had always been faithful to the united states he cried out in a fit of frenzy damn the united states i wish i may never hear of the united states again i suppose he did not know how the words shocked old colonel morgan who was holding the court half the officers who sat in it had served through the revolution and their lives not to say their necks had been risked for the very idea which he so cavalierly cursed in his madness he on his part had grown up in the west of those days in the midst of spanish plot orleans plot and all the rest he had been educated on a plantation where the finest company was a spanish officer or a french merchant from orleans his education such as it was had been perfected in commercial expeditions to vera cruz and i think he told me his father once hired an englishman to be a private tutor for a winter on the plantation he had spent half his youth with an older brother hunting horses in texas and in a word to him united states was scarcely a reality yet he had been fed by united states for all the years since he had been in the army he had sworn on his faith as a christian to be true to united states it was united states which gave him the uniform he wore and the sword by his side nay my poor nolan it was only because united states had picked you out first as one of her own confidential men of honor that a burr cared for you a straw more than for the flatboat men who sailed his ark for him i do not excuse nolan i only explain to the reader why he damned his country and wished he might never hear her name again he never did hear her name but once again from that moment september twenty third eighteen o seven till the day he died may eleventh eighteen sixty three he never heard her name again for that half century and more he was a man without a country old morgan as i said was terribly shocked if nolan had compared george washington to benedict arnold or had cried god save king george morgan would not have felt worse he called the court into his private room and returned in fifteen minutes with a face like a sheet to say prisoner hear the sentence of the court the court decides subject to the approval of the president that you never hear the name of the united states again nolan laughed but nobody else laughed old morgan was too solemn and the whole room was hushed dead as night for a minute 
Even Nolan lost his swagger in a moment. Then Morgan added, Mr. Marshall, take the prisoner to Orleans in an armed boat and deliver him to the naval commander there. The marshal gave his orders, and the prisoner was taken out of court. Mr. Marshall, continued old Morgan, see that no one mentions the United States to the prisoner. Mr. Marshall, make my respects to Lieutenant Mitchell at Orleans, and request him to order that no one shall mention the United States to the prisoner while he is on board ship. You will receive your written orders from the officer on duty here this evening. The court is adjourned without day. Since writing this, and while considering whether or no I would print it as a warning to the young Nolans and Vallandinghams and Tatnalls of to-day of what it is to throw away a country, I have received from Danforth, who is on board the Levant, a letter which gives an account of Nolan's last hours. It removes all my doubts about telling this story. To understand the first words of the letter, the non-professional reader should remember that after 1817 the position of every officer who had Nolan in charge was one of the greatest delicacy. The government had failed to renew the order of 1807 regarding him. What was a man to do? Should he let him go? What then if he were called to account by the department for violating the order of 1807? Should he keep him? What then if Nolan should be liberated some day, and should bring an action for false imprisonment or kidnapping against every man who had had him in charge? I urged and pressed this upon Southard, and I have reason to think that other officers did the same thing but the secretary always said, as they so often do at Washington, that there were no special orders to give, and that we must act on our own judgment. That means, if you succeed, you will be sustained. If you fail, you will be disavowed. Well, as Danforth says, all that is over now, though I do not know, but I expose myself to a criminal prosecution on the evidence of the very revelation I am making. Here is the letter. Levant, two degrees, two seconds, south at 131 degrees west. Dear Fred, I try to find heart and life to tell you that it is all over with dear old Nolan. I have been with him on this voyage more than I ever was, and I can understand wholly now the way in which you used to speak of the dear old fellow. I could see that he was not strong, but I had no idea the end was so near. The doctor has been watching him very carefully, and yesterday morning came to me and told me that Nolan was not so well, and had not left his stateroom, a thing I never remember before. He had let the doctor come and see him as he lay there, the first time the doctor had been in the stateroom, and he said he should like to see me. Oh, dear, do you remember the mysteries we boys used to invent about his room in the old intrepid days? Well, I went in, and there, to be sure, the poor fellow lay in his berth, smiling pleasantly as he gave me his hand, but looking very frail. I could not help a glance round, which showed me what a little shrine he had made of the box he was lying in. The stars and stripes were triced up above and around a picture of Washington, and he had painted a majestic eagle with the lightnings blazing from his beak, and his foot just clasping the whole globe which his wings overshadowed. The dear old boy saw my glance, and said with a sad smile, here, you see, I have a country. And then he pointed to the foot of his bed, where I had not seen before a great map of the United States, as he had drawn it from memory, and which he had there to look upon as he lay. Quaint, queer old names were on it in large letters, Indiana Territory, Mississippi Territory, and Louisiana Territory. As I suppose our fathers learned such things, but the old fellow had patched in Texas, too. He had carried his western boundary all the way to the Pacific, 
but on that shore he had defined nothing. "'Oh, Danforth,' he said, "'I know I am dying. I cannot get home. Surely you will tell me something now. Stop, stop. Do not speak till I say what I am sure you know, that there is not in this ship, that there is not in America, God bless her, a more loyal man than I.' There cannot be a man who loves the old flag as I do, or prays for it as I do, or hopes for it as I do. There are thirty-four stars in it now, Danforth. I thank God for that, though I do not know what their names are. There has never been one taken away. I thank God for that. I know by that that there has never been any successful burr. Oh, Danforth, Danforth, he sighed out. How like a wretched knight's dream a boy's idea of personal fame or of separate sovereignty seems, when one looks back on it after such a life as mine. But tell me, tell me something, tell me everything, Danforth, before I die. Ingham, I swear to you that I felt like a monster, that I had not told him everything before. Danger or no danger, delicacy or no delicacy— who was I that I should have been acting the tyrant all this time, over this dear sainted old man, who had years ago expiated in his whole manhood's life the madness of a boy's treason? Mr. Nolan, said I, I will tell you everything you ask about, only where shall I begin? Oh, the blessed smile that crept over his white face, and he pressed my hand and said, God bless you, "'Tell me their names,' he said, and he pointed to the stars on the flag. "'The last I know is Ohio. My father lived in Kentucky, but I have guessed Michigan and Indiana and Mississippi. "'That was where Fort Adams is. They make twenty. But where are your other fourteen? "'You have not cut up any of the old ones, I hope.' Well, that was not a bad text, and I told him the names in as good order as I could, and he bade me take down his beautiful map and draw them in as I best could with my pencil. He was wild with delight about Texas, told me how his cousin died there. He had marked a gold cross near where he supposed his grave was, and he had guessed at Texas. Then he was delighted as he saw California and Oregon, that, he said, he had suspected, partly because he had never been permitted to land on that shore, though the ships were there so much. And the men, said he, laughing, brought off a good deal besides furs. Then he went back, heavens how far, to ask about the Chesapeake, and what was done to Baron for surrendering her to the leopard, and whether Burr ever tried again and he ground his teeth with the only passion he showed. But in a moment that was over, and he said, God forgive me, for I am sure I forgive him. Then he asked about the old war, told me the true story of his serving the gun the day we took the Java, asked about dear old David Porter, as he called him. Then he settled down more quietly, and very happily, to hear me tell in an hour the history of fifty years. How I wished it had been somebody who knew something. But I did as well as I could. I told him of the English war. I told him about Fulton and the steamboat beginning. I told him about old Scott and Jackson. Told him all I could think of about the Mississippi and New Orleans and Texas and his own old Kentucky. And do you think, he asked, who was in command of the Legion of the West, I told him it was a very gallant officer named Grant, and that by our last news he was about to establish his headquarters at Vicksburg. Then, where was Vicksburg? I worked that out on the map. It was about a hundred miles, more or less, above his old Fort Adams, and I thought Fort Adams must be a ruin now. It must be at old Vicks Plantation at Walnut Hills, said he. Well, that is a change. I tell you, Ingham, it was a hard thing to condense the history of half a century into that talk with a sick man. And I do not now know what I told him. 
of immigration and the means of it, of steamboats and railroads and telegraphs, of inventions and books and literature, of the colleges and West Point and the Naval School, but with the queerest interruptions that ever you heard. You see, it was Robinson Crusoe asking all the accumulated questions of fifty-six years. I remember he asked, all of a sudden, who was president now, and when I told him, he asked if old Abe was General Benjamin Lincoln's son. He said he met old General Lincoln when he was quite a boy himself at some Indian treaty. I said no, that old Abe was a Kentuckian like himself, but I could not tell him of what family he had worked up from the ranks. "'Good for him,' cried Nolan. "'I am glad of that. "'As I have brooded and wondered, "'I have thought our danger was in keeping up those regular successions "'in the first families. "'Then I got talking about my visit to Washington. "'I told him of meeting the Oregon Congressman Harding. "'I told him about the Smithsonian and the exploring expedition. "'I told him about the Capitol and the statues for the pediment.' and Crawford's Liberty, and Greenow's Washington. Ingham, I told him everything I could think of that would show the grandeur of his country and its prosperity, but I could not make up my mouth to tell him a word about this infernal rebellion, and he drank it in and enjoyed it as I cannot tell you. He grew more and more silent, yet I never thought he was tired or faint. I gave him a glass of water, but he just wet his lips and told me not to go away. Then he asked me to bring the Presbyterian book of public prayer which lay there, and said with a smile that it would open at the right place, and so it did. There was his double red mark down the page, and I knelt down and read, and he repeated with me, For ourselves and our country— O oh, gracious God, we thank Thee that notwithstanding our manifold transgressions of Thy holy laws, Thou hast continued to us Thy marvelous kindness, and so to the end of that thanksgiving. Then he turned to the end of the same book, and I read the words more familiar to me. Most heartily we beseech Thee with Thy favor to behold and bless Thy servant, the President of the United States, and all others in authority, and the rest of the Episcopal collect. Danforth, said he, I have repeated those prayers night and morning. It is now fifty-five years. And then he said he would go to sleep. He bent me down over him, and kissed me, and he said, Look in my Bible, Danforth, when I am gone. And I went away, but I had no thought it was the end. I thought he was tired and would sleep. I knew he was happy, and I wanted him to be alone. But in an hour, when the doctor went in gently, he found Nolan had breathed his life away with a smile. He had something pressed close to his lips. It was his father's badge of the Order of the Cincinnati. We looked in his Bible, and there was a slip of paper at the place where he had marked the text— they desire a country, even a heavenly, wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. On this slip of paper he had written, Bury me in the sea. It has been my home, and I love it. But will not someone set up a stone for my memory at Fort Adams or at Orleans, that my disgrace may not be more than I ought to bear? Say on it, in memory of Philip Nolan, lieutenant in the Army of the United States. He loved his country as no other man has loved her, but no man deserved less at her hands. End of section 16section 17 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, volume 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros.
Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. Ludovic Alevi, born 1834. Ludovic Alevi, known to American readers chiefly as the author of the graceful little novel The Abbe Constantin, entered French letters as a dramatist and writer of librettos, born in Paris in 1834 of Jewish parentage. He is the son of Léon Alevi, a poet and littérateur of some note in his day and he is, as well, the nephew of the composer of The Jewess and of The Queen of Cyprus. He grew up in the atmosphere of the theatre. After leaving college he entered his country's civil service, and rapidly rose to occupy positions of distinction. At the same time he gave his leisure to writing plays and short stories, looking forward to the day when he would be able to throw off the burdensome yoke of clerical duties and to devote himself entirely to literature unsuccessful at first alevi finally worked his way into public favor especially after associating his pen with that of henri Mayac. In collaboration with the latter, Alevi wrote many of the librettos of Offenbach's most brilliant and satiric operettas, including the Pericole, the Brigands, the Belle Hélène, and the Grand Duchess of Gerolstein, a burlesque opera which had such vogue that it is said to have been the first thing the Emperor Alexander of Russia wished to hear when he came to Paris to attend the exposition of 1867. Several serious librettos of high excellence are from the same hands, including that for Bizet's Carmen. In spoken drama, Frou Frou and Tricoche and Cacolet are among the most popular plays the two dramatists produce together. In speaking of the collaboration of Alevi with Mayek in humorous drama, Francisque Sarcy says, Gifted with an exquisite appreciation of the real, Alevi has preserved the more fantastic and bizarre characteristics of the imagination of the latter. From this mutual work have sprung plays which, in my opinion, are not sufficiently estimated by us, we have seen them hundreds of times, and have referred to them with a grimace of contempt. There is a great deal of imagination, of wit, and of good sense in these amusing parodies of everyday life. Yet, great as was the success of his dramatic work, Alevi's claim to a place in French literature rests on what he produced alone after the collaboration with Mayek had suffered a rupture in 1881. At the same time, he ceased writing for the stage and turned to fiction. L'Abbé Constantin, the first of his novels, is also the most popular. It opened to him the French Academy. It was for more than one season the French story of the day. It is a charming story, full of fresh air and sun, simply and skillfully told, it presented a view of American character and temperament not usual in French fiction, and irreproachable in its moral tone, it has become a sort of classic for American schools and colleges. La Famille Cardinal, the Cardinal Family, and Crichette are others of Alevi's studies in fiction of aspects of Parisian life. Notes and souvenirs embody observations during the Prussian invasion of 1871. They are interesting as giving faithful pictures of the temper of the people during those days. Among his short stories, Un mariage d'amour, A Marriage for Love, is one of the most delightful and a highly characteristic one. The most beautiful woman in Paris is appended to this sketch, says Mr. Brander Matthews, 
in all these books there are the same artistic qualities the same sharpness of vision the same gentle irony the same constructive skill and the same dramatic touch m alevet's irony is delicate and playful there is no harshness in his manner and no hatred in his mind we do not find in his pages any of the pessimism which is perhaps the dominant characteristic of the best french fiction of our time more than maupassant or flaubert or Mary may is m alevé a parisian whether or not the characters of his tales are dwellers in the capital whether or not the scene of his story is laid in the city by the seine the point of view is always Parisian. His style, even, his swift and limpid prose, the prose which somehow corresponds to the best verse de société in its brilliancy and buoyancy, is the style of one who lives at the centre of things. Cardinal Newman once said that while Livy and Tacitus and Terence and Seneca wrote Latin, Cicero wrote Roman so while m zola on one side and m georges onet on the other may write french m alevé writes parisian selection the most beautiful woman in paris by ludovic alevé from parisian points of view copyright eighteen ninety four by harper and brothers on Friday, April 19th, Prince Agenor was really distracted at the opera during the second act of Sigurd. The prince kept going from box to box, and his enthusiasm increased as he went. That blonde, oh, that blonde, she is ideal. Look at that blonde. Do you know that blonde? It was from the front part of Madame de Marisi's large first-tier box, that all these exclamations were coming at that moment. "'Which blonde?' asked Madame de Marisy. "'Which blonde? Why, there is but one this evening in the house, opposite to you, over there in the first box, the saint mem box. Look, Baroness, look straight over there.' "'Yes, I am looking at her. She is atrociously got up, but pretty.' "'Pretty? She is a wonder.' simply a wonder got up yes agreed some country relative the saint mem have cousins in perigord but what a smile how well her neck is set on and the slope of the shoulders ah especially the shoulders come either keep still or go away let me listen to madame caron the prince went away as no one knew that incomparable blonde yet she had often been to the opera but in an unpretentious way in the second tier of boxes and to prince agenor above the first tier of boxes there was nothing absolutely nothing there was emptiness space the prince had never been in a second tier box so the second tier boxes did not exist while Madame Caron was marvellously singing the marvellous phrase of Ryer, O oh, mon sauveur silencieux, la Valkyrie est ta conquête, the prince strolled along the passages of the opera. Who was that blonde? He wanted to know, and he would know. And suddenly he remembered that good Madame Picard was the box opener of the Saint Mem, and that he, Prince of Nerin, had had the honour of being, for a long time, a friend of that good Madame Picard. "'Ah, Prince,' said Madame Picard, on seeing Agenor, "'there is no one for you to-night in my boxes. Madame de Semillan is not here, and Madame de saint Mem has rented her box.' "'That's precisely it. Don't you know the people in Madame de saint Mem's box?' Not at all, Prince. It's the first time I have seen them in the Marquis's box. Then you have no idea? None, Prince. Only to me they don't appear to be people of... She was going to say of our set. A box opener of the first tier of boxes at the opera 
having generally only to do with absolutely high-born people, considers herself as being a little of their set, and shows extreme disdain for unimportant people. It displeases her to receive these unimportant people in her boxes. Madame Picard, however, had tact which rarely forsook her, and so stopped herself in time to say, People of your set, they belong to the middle class, to the wealthy middle class, but still the middle class. That doesn't satisfy you. You wish to know more on account of the blonde. Is it not so, Prince? Those last words were spoken with rare delicacy. They were murmured more than spoken, box opener to Prince. It would have been unacceptable without that perfect reserve in accent and tone. Yes, it was a box opener who spoke, but a box opener who was a little bit the aunt of former times, the aunt à la mode de Cethère. Madame Picard continued, Ah, oh, she is a beauty. She came with a little dark man, her husband, I'm sure, for while she was taking off her cloak, it always takes some time, he didn't say a word to her. No eagerness, no little attentions. Yes, he could only be a husband. I examined the cloak. People one doesn't know puzzle me and my colleague. Madame Flachet and I always amuse ourselves by trying to guess from appearances. Well, the cloak comes from a good dressmaker, but not from a great one. It is fine and well made, but it has no style. I think they are middle-class people, Prince. But how stupid I am! You know, Monsieur Palmer? Well, a little while ago he came to see the beautiful blonde. Monsieur Palmer? Yes, and he can tell you. Thanks, Madame Picard, thanks. Good-bye, Prince, good-bye. And Madame Picard went back to her stool, near her colleague Madame Flachet, and said to her, Ah, my dear, what a charming man the prince is! True gentlefolks, there is nothing like them. But they are dying out, they are dying out. There are many less than formerly. Prince Agenor was willing to do Palmer, Big Palmer, Rich Palmer, Vain Palmer, the honour of being one of his friends. He deigned, and very frequently, to confide to Palmer his financial difficulties, and the banker was delighted to come to his aid. The prince had been obliged to resign himself to becoming a member of two boards of directors, presided over by Palmer, who was much pleased at having, under obligations to him, the representative of one of the noblest families in France. Besides, the prince proved himself to be a good prince, and publicly acknowledged Palmer showing himself in his box, taking charge of his entertainments, and occupying himself with his racing stable. He had even pushed his gratitude to the point of compromising Madame Palmer in the most showy way. "'I am removing her from the middle class,' he said. "'I owe it to Palmer, who is one of the best fellows in the world.' The prince found the banker alone in a lower box, what is the name, the name of that blonde in the saint Mem box? Madame Derline. Is there a Monsieur Derline? Certainly, a lawyer, my lawyer, the saint Mem lawyer. And if you want to see Madame Derline close too, come to my ball next Thursday. She will be there. The wife of a lawyer. She was only the wife of a lawyer. The prince sat down in the front of the box, opposite Madame Derline, and while looking at that lawyeress, he was thinking, "'Have I,' he said to himself, "'sufficient credit, sufficient power, to make of Madame Derline the most beautiful woman in Paris?' For there was always a most beautiful woman in Paris." and it was he, Prince Agenor, who flattered himself that he could discover, proclaim, crown, and consecrate that most beautiful woman in Paris. 
launch madame darlene in society why not he had never launched any one from the middle class the enterprise would be new amusing and bold he looked at madame darlene through his opera glass and discovered thousands of beauties and perfections in her delightful face after the opera the prince during the exit placed himself at the bottom of the great staircase he had enlisted two of his friends come he had said to them i will show you the most beautiful woman in paris while he was speaking two steps away from the prince was an alert young man who was attached to a morning paper a very widely read paper the young man had sharp ears he caught on the fly the phrase of the prince agenor whose high social position he knew he succeeded in keeping close to the prince, and when Madame Derline passed, the young reporter had the luck of hearing the conversation, without losing a word, of the three brilliant noblemen. A quarter of an hour later he arrived at the office of the paper. "'Is there time,' he asked, "'to write a dozen lines in the society notebook?' "'Yes, but hurry.' The young man was a quick writer." The fifteen lines were done in the twinkling of an eye. They brought seven francs fifty to the reporter, but cost Monsieur Darlene a little more than that. During this time Prince Agenor, seated in the club at the whist table, was saying, while shuffling the cards, This evening at the opera there was a marvellous woman, a certain Madame Darlene. She is the most beautiful woman in Paris. The following morning, in the gossip corner of the Bois, in the spring sunshine, the prince, surrounded by a little group of respectful disciples, was solemnly delivering from the back of his Rowan mare the following opinion. Listen well to what I say. The most beautiful woman in Paris is a certain Madame Darlene. This star will be visible Thursday evening at the Palmer's. Go, and don't forget the name, Madame Darlene. The disciples dispersed, and went abroad, spreading the great news. Madame Darlene had been admirably brought up by an irreproachable mother. She had been taught that she ought to get up in the morning, keep a strict account of her expenses, not go to a great dressmaker, believe in God, love her husband, visit the poor, and never spend but half her income, in order to prepare dowries for her daughters. Madame Darlene performed all these duties. She led a peaceful and serene life in the old house in the Rue Dragon, which had sheltered, since 1825, three generations of Darlene's. The husbands had all three been lawyers, the wives had all three been virtuous. The three generations had passed there a happy and moderate life, never having any great pleasures, but also never being very much bored. The next day Madame Darlene awoke at eight o'clock in the morning with an uneasy feeling. She had passed a troubled night, she who usually slept like a child. The evening before, in the box at the opera, Madame Darlene had vaguely felt that something was going on around her, and during the entire last act, an opera glass obstinately fixed on her, the prince's opera glass, had thrown her into a certain agitation, though not a disagreeable one. She had worn a low dress, too low in her mother's opinion, and two or three times, under the fixity of that opera glass, she had raised the shoulder straps of her dress. So after opening her eyes, Madame Darlene reclosed them lazily, indolently, with thoughts floating between dreamland and reality. She again saw the opera house, and a hundred, two hundred, five hundred opera glasses obstinately fixed on her, on her alone. The maid entered, placed a tray on a little table, made up a big fire in the fireplace, and went away. There was a cup of chocolate and the morning paper on the tray, the same as every morning. 
Then Madame Darlene courageously got up, slipped her little bare feet into fur slippers, wrapped herself in a white cashmere dressing-gown, and crouched shivering in an armchair by the fire. She sipped the chocolate and slightly burnt herself. She must wait a little while. She put down the cup, took up the paper, unfolded it, and rapidly ran her eye over the six columns of the front page. At the bottom, quite at the bottom of the sixth column, were the following lines. Last evening at the opera there was a very brilliant performance of Sigard. Society was well represented there. The beautiful Duchess of Montagnon, the pretty Countess Verdinier of Lardac, the marvellous Marquis of Muriel, the lively Baroness of... To read the name of the Baroness it was necessary to turn the page. Madame Derline did not turn it. She was thinking, reflecting. The evening before she had amused herself by having Palmer point out to her the social leaders in the house, and it so happened that the banker had pointed out to her the marvellous Marquise and madame derline who was twenty-two raised herself a little to look in the glass she exchanged a slight smile with a young blonde who was very pink and white ah she said to herself if i were a marquise the man who wrote this would perhaps have paid some attention to me and my name would perhaps be there i wonder if it's fun to see one's name printed in a paper and while addressing this question to herself, she turned the page and continued reading. The lively Baroness of Mervois, etc. We have to announce the appearance of a new star, which has abruptly burst forth in the Parisian constellation. The house was in ecstasy over a strange and disturbing blonde, whose dark steel eyes, and whose shoulders, ah, what shoulders, the shelters were the event of the evening. From all quarters one heard asked, Who is she? Who is she? To whom do those divine shelters belong? To whom? We know, and our readers will doubtless thank us for telling them the name of this ideal wonder. It is Madame Derline. Her name! She had read her name! She was dazzled! Her eyes clouded! All the letters in the alphabet began to dance wildly on the paper. Then they calmed down, stopped, and regained their places. She was able to find her name and continue reading. It is Madame Darlene, the wife of one of the richest and most agreeable lawyers in Paris. The Prince of Nerin, whose word has so much weight in such matters, said yesterday evening to everyone who would listen, she is the most beautiful woman in Paris. We are absolutely of that opinion. A single paragraph, and that was all. It was enough. It was too much. Madame Darlene was seized with a feeling of indefinable confusion. It was a combination of fear and pleasure, of joy and trouble, of satisfied vanity and wounded modesty. Her dressing-gown was a little open. She folded it over with a sort of violence, and crossed it upon her feet, abruptly drawn back towards the armchair. She had a feeling of nudity. It seemed to her that all Paris was there in her room, and that the Prince de Narin was in front saying to all Paris, "'Look, look, she is the most beautiful woman in Paris!' The Prince of Narin. She knew the name well, for she read with keen interest in the papers all the articles entitled Parisian Life, High Life, Society Echoes, etc., and all the society columns signed Musselin, Fan Frelouche, Brimborion, Veltine, all the accounts of great marriages, great balls, of great comings out, and of great charity sales. The name of the prince often figured in these articles, and he was always quoted as supreme arbiter of Parisian elegances. And it was he who had declared, 
Ah, decidedly pleasure got the better of fear. Still trembling with emotion, Madame Darlene went and placed herself before a long looking-glass, an old cheval glass from Jacob's, which never till now had reflected other than good middle-class women married to good lawyers. In that glass she looked at herself, examined herself, studied herself, long, curiously, and eagerly. Of course she knew she was pretty, but, oh, the power of print! She found herself absolutely delightful. She was no longer Madame Darlene. She was the most beautiful woman in Paris. Her feet, her little feet, their bareness no longer troubled her, left the ground. She raised herself gently towards the heavens, towards the clouds, and felt herself become a goddess. But suddenly an anxiety seized her. Edward! What would Edward say? Edward was her husband. There had been but one man's surname in her life, her husband's. The lawyer was well loved. And almost at the same moment when she was asking herself what Edward would say, Edward abruptly opened the door. He was a little out of breath. He had run upstairs two at a time. He was peacefully rummaging among old papers in his study on the ground floor, when one of his brother lawyers, with forced congratulations, however, had made him read the famous article. He had soon got rid of his brother lawyer, and he had come, much irritated, to his room. At first there was simply a torrent of words. "'Why do these journalists meddle? It's an outrage! Your name! Look, there is your name in this paper!' "'Yes, I know. I've seen—' "'Ah, you know. You have seen. And you think it quite natural. "'But, dear—' "'What times do we live in? It's your fault, too.' "'My fault?' "'Yes, your fault. And how?' "'Your dress last night was too low, much too low. Besides, your mother told you so.' "'Oh, Mama. "'You needn't say, oh, Mama. Your mother was right. There, read, and whose shoulders, ah, what shoulders! And it is of your shoulders they are speaking, and that prince who dares to award you a prize for beauty. The good man had plebeian Gothic ideas, the ideas of a lawyer of old times, of a lawyer of the Rue Dragon. The lawyers of the Boulevard Malacherbe are no longer like that. Madame Durlene, very gently, very quietly, brought the rebel back to reason. Of course there was charm and eloquence in her speech, but how much more charm and eloquence in the tenderness of her glance and smile! Why this great rage and despair? He was accused of being the husband of the most beautiful woman in Paris. Was that such a horrible thing, such a terrible misfortune? and who was the brother-lawyer, the good brother-lawyer, who had taken pleasure in coming to show him the hateful article? Monsieur Renaud. Oh, it was Monsieur Renaud, dear Monsieur Renaud. Thereupon Madame Darlene was seized with a hearty fit of laughter, so much so that the blonde hair, which had been loosely done up, came down and framed the pretty face from which gleamed the dark eyes, which could also, when they gave themselves the trouble, look very gentle, very caressing, very loving. Oh, it was Monsieur Renaud, the husband of that delightful Madame Renaud. Well, do you know what you will do immediately, without losing a minute? Go to the president of the tribunal and ask for a divorce. You will say to him, Monsieur Aubepin, deliver me from my wife. Her crime is being pretty, very pretty, too pretty. I wish another one who is ugly, very ugly, who has Madame Reynaud's large nose, colossal foot, pointed chin, skinny shoulders, and eternal pimples. That's what you want, isn't it? Come, you big stupid, kiss your poor wife, and forgive her for not being a monster." As rather lively gestures had illustrated this little speech, the white cashmere dressing-gown had slipped, 
slipped a good deal, and had opened, very much opened, the criminal shoulders were within reach of M. Derlin's lips. He succumbed. Besides, he too felt the abominable influence of the press. His wife had never seemed so pretty to him, and, brought back to subjection, M. Derlin returned to his study in order to make money for the most beautiful woman in Paris. A very wise and opportune occupation, for scarcely was Madame Derlin left alone when an idea flashed through her head, which was to call forth a very pretty collection of banknotes from the cash-box of the lawyer of the Rue Dragon. Madame Derlin had intended wearing to the Palmer's ball a dress which had already been much seen. Madame Derlin had kept the dressmaker of her wedding dress, her mother's dressmaker, a dressmaker of the left bank. It seemed to her that her new position imposed new duties on her. She could not appear at the Palmer's without a dress which had not been seen, and one stamped with a well-known name. She ordered the carriage in the afternoon, and resolutely gave her coachman the address of one of the most illustrious dressmakers in Paris. She arrived a little agitated, and, to reach the great artist, was obliged to pass through a veritable crowd of footmen, who were in the antechamber, chatting and laughing, used to meeting there and making long stops. Nearly all the footmen were those of society, the highest society. They had spent the previous evening together at the English embassy, and were to be that evening at the Duchess of Grimois. Madame Derlin entered a sumptuous parlour. It was very sumptuous, too sumptuous. Twenty great customers were there, society women and actresses, all agitated, anxious, feverish, looking at the beautiful tall saleswomen come and go before them, wearing the last creations of the master of the house. The great artist had a diplomatic bearing, buttoned-up black frock coat, long cravat with pin, a present from a royal highness who paid her bills slowly, and a many-coloured rosette in his buttonhole, the gift of a small reigning prince who paid slower yet the bills of an opera dancer. He came and went, precise, calm, and cool, in the midst of the solicitations and supplications of his customers. Monsieur Arthur, Monsieur Arthur! One heard nothing but that phrase, he was Monsieur Arthur. He went from one to the other, respectful without too much humility to the duchesses, and easy without too much familiarity to the actresses. There was an extraordinary liveliness and a confusion of marvellous velvets, satins, and embroidered, brocaded, and gold or silver threaded stuffs, all thrown here and there as though by accident. But what science in that accident! on armchairs, tables, and divans. In the first place, Madame Darlene ran against a shop-girl, who was bearing with outstretched arms a white dress, and was almost hidden beneath a light mountain of muslins and laces. The only thing visible was the shop-girl's must-black hair and sly suburban expression. Madame Darlene backed away, wishing to place herself against the wall. But a trier-on was there, a large energetic brunette, who spoke authoritatively in a high staccato. At once, she was saying, bring me at once the princess's dress. Frightened and dazed, Madame Darlene stood in a corner and watched an opportunity to seize a saleswoman on the fly. She even thought of giving up the game. Never, certainly, should she dare to address directly that terrible Monsieur Arthur, who had just given her a rapid glance, in which she believed to have read, Who is she? She isn't properly dressed. She doesn't go to a fashionable dressmaker. At last Madame Darlene succeeded in getting hold of a disengaged saleswoman, and there was the same slightly disdainful glance, a glance which was accompanied by the phrase, Madame is not a regular customer of the house. 
no i am not a customer and you wish a dress a ball dress and i want the dress for next thursday evening thursday next yes thursday next oh madame it is not to be thought of even for a customer of the house it would be impossible but i wished it so much go and see monsieur arthur he alone can and where is monsieur arthur in his office he has just gone into his office over there madame opposite madame derline through a half-open door saw a sombre and severe but luxurious room an ambassador's office on the walls the great european powers were represented by photographs the empress eugenie the princess of wales a grand duchess of russia and an archduchess of austria Monsieur Arthur was there, taking a few moments' rest, seated in a large armchair, with an air of lassitude and exhaustion, and with a newspaper spread out over his knees. He arose on seeing Madame Derline enter. In a trembling voice she repeated her wish. "'Oh, Madame, a ball dress, a beautiful ball dress for Thursday. I couldn't make such a promise. I couldn't keep it.' there are responsibilities to which i never expose myself he spoke slowly gravely as a man conscious of his high position oh i am so disappointed it was a particular occasion and i was told that you alone could two tears two little tears glittered on her eyelashes monsieur arthur was moved a woman, a pretty woman, crying there before him. Never had such homage been paid to his genius. Well, madame, I am willing to make an attempt, a very simple dress. Oh, no, not simple, very brilliant, on the contrary, everything that is most brilliant. Two of my friends are customers of yours, she named them, and I am madame Derline madame derline you are madame derline the two madame derlines were followed by a glance and a smile the glance was at the newspaper and the smile was at madame derline but it was a discreet self-contained smile the smile of a perfectly gallant man this is what the glance and smile said with admirable clearness Ah, you are Madame Derline, that already celebrated Madame Derline, who, yesterday at the opera, I understand, I understand, I was reading just now in this paper, words are no longer necessary, you should have told your name at once, yes, you need me, yes, you shall have your dress, yes, I want to divide your success with you. Monsieur Arthur called, Mademoiselle Blanche, come here at once, Mademoiselle Blanche, and turning towards Madame Derline, he said, She has great talent, but I shall myself superintend it, so be easy, yes, I myself. Madame Derline was a little confused, a little embarrassed by her glory, but happy nevertheless. Mademoiselle Blanche came forward. "'Conduct, madame,' said Monsieur Arthur, "'and take the necessary measures for a ball-dress, "'very low and with absolutely bare arms. "'During that time, madame, "'I am going to think seriously of what I can do for you. "'It must be something entirely new. "'Ah, before going, permit me.' "'He walked very slowly around Madame Derline "'and examined her with profound attention.' Then he walked away, and considered her from a little distance. His face was serious, thoughtful, and anxious, a great thinker wrestling with a great problem. He passed his hand over his forehead, raised his eyes to the sky, getting inspiration by a painful delivery. But suddenly his face lit up. The spirit from above had answered. "'Go, madame,' he said, "'go. Your dress is thought out.' "'When you come back, mademoiselle, bring me that piece of pink satin. "'You know, the one that I was keeping for some great occasion.' 
thus madame derline found herself with mademoiselle blanche in a trying-on room which was a sort of little cabin lined with mirrors a quarter of an hour later when the measures had been taken madame derline came back and discovered monsieur arthur in the midst of pieces of satin of all colours of crapes of tools of lace and of brocaded stuffs no no not the pink satin he said to mademoiselle blanche who was bringing the asked for piece no i have found something better listen to me this is what i wish i have given up the pink and i have decided on this this peach-coloured satin a classic robe outlining all the fine lines and showing the suppleness of the body this robe must be very clinging hardly any underskirts it must be of seurat madame must be melted into it do you thoroughly understand absolutely melted into the robe we will drop over the dress this crepe yes that one but in small light pleats the crepe will be as a cloud thrown over the dress a transparent vapory impalpable cloud the arms are to be absolutely bare as i already told you on each shoulder there must be a simple knot showing the upper part of the arm of what is the knot to be i'm still undecided i need to think it over till to-morrow madame till to-morrow madame derline came back the next day and the next and every day till the day before the famous thursday and each time that she came back while awaiting her turn to try on she ordered dresses very simple ones but yet costing from seven to eight hundred francs each and that was not all on the day of her first visit to m arthur when madame derline came out of the great house she was broken-hearted positively broken-hearted at the sight of her brougham it really did make a pitiful appearance among all the stylish carriages which were waiting in three rows and taking up half the street it was the brougham of her late mother-in-law and it still rolled through the streets of paris after fifteen years service madame derline got into the woebegone brougham to drive straight to a very well-known carriage-maker and that evening cleverly seizing the psychological moment she explained to m derline that she had seen a certain little black coupe lined with blue satin that would frame delightfully her new dresses the coupe was bought the next day by m derline who also was beginning fully to realize the extent of his new duties but the next day it was discovered that it was impossible to harness to that jewel of a coupe the old horse who had pulled the old carriage and no less impossible to put on the box the old coachman who drove the old horse this is how on thursday april twenty fifth at half past ten in the evening a very pretty chestnut mare driven by a very correct english coachman took monsieur and madame derline to the palmers they still lacked something a little groom to sit beside the english coachman but a certain amount of discretion had to be employed the most beautiful woman in paris intended to wait ten days before asking for the little groom while she was going upstairs at the palmers she distinctly felt her heart beat like the strokes of a hammer she was going to play a decisive game she knew that the palmers had been going everywhere saying come on thursday we will show you madame derline the most beautiful woman in paris curiosity as well as jealousy had been well awakened she entered and from the first minute she had the delicious sensation of her success throughout the long gallery of the palmer's house it was a true a triumphal march she advanced with firm and precise step erect and head well held she appeared to see nothing to hear nothing but how well she saw how well she felt the fire of all those eyes on her shoulders 
around her arose a little murmur of admiration and never had music been sweeter to her yes decidedly all went well she was on a fair way to conquer paris and sure of herself at each step she became more confident lighter and bolder as she advanced on the arm of palmer who in passing pointed out the counts the marquis and the dukes and then palmer suddenly said to her i want to present to you one of your greatest admirers who the other night at the opera spoke of nothing but your beauty he is the prince of Nerin. she became as red as a cherry palmer looked at her and began to laugh ah you read the other day in that paper i read yes i read but where is the prince where is he i saw him during the day and he was to be here early madame derlin was not to see the prince of nerin that evening and yet he had intended to go to the palmers and preside at the deification of his lawyeress he had dined at the club and had allowed himself to be dragged off to a first performance at a minor theatre an operetta of the regulation type was being played the principal personage was a young queen who was always escorted by the customary four maids of honour three of these young ladies were very well known to first-nighters as having already figured in the tableau of operettas and in groups of fairies but the fourth oh the fourth she was a new one a tall brunette of the most striking beauty the prince made himself remarked more than all others by his enthusiasm he completely forgot that he was to leave after the first act the play was over very late and the prince was still there having paid no attention to the piece or the music having seen nothing but the wonderful brunette having heard nothing but the stanza which she had unworthily massacred in the middle of the second act and while they were leaving the theatre the prince was saying to whoever would listen that brunette oh that brunette she hasn't an equal in any theatre she is the most beautiful woman in paris the most beautiful it was one o'clock in the morning the prince asked himself if he should go to the palmers poor madame derlin she was of very slight importance beside this new wonder and then too the prince was a methodical man the hour for whist had arrived so he departed to play whist the following morning madame darlene found ten lines on the palmer's ball in the society column there was mention of the marquise the countesses and the duchesses who were there but about madame darlene there was not a word not a word on the other hand the writer of theatrical gossip celebrated in enthusiastic terms the beauty of that ideal maid of honour and said besides the prince of nerin declared that mademoiselle miranda was indisputably the most beautiful woman in paris madame derlin threw the paper into the fire she did not wish her husband to know that she was already not the most beautiful woman in paris she has however kept the great dressmaker and the english coachman but she has never dared to ask for the little groom End of section seventeen. Section eighteen of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume seventeen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. Mr. Samuel Slick from The Clockmaker by Thomas C. Halliburton. Thomas C. Halliburton, 1796 to 1865. In 1835 there appeared in a Nova Scotian journal a series of articles satirizing the New England character 
as expressed in the person of Sam Slick, a Yankee clock peddler. Within a few weeks, these had become so popular that they were republished in book form, the little duodecimo volume called The Clockmaker, or The Sayings and Doings of Samuel Slick of Slickville, being read by all classes of people. Indeed, the popularity of this skit wholly obscured the importance of the author's more serious work as a historian and publicist. Thomas C. Halliburton, the inventor of this famous Yankee character, was born in Windsor, Nova Scotia, 1796, educated in his native town, and called to the bar there in 1820. Eight years later, he was appointed Chief Justice of Common Pleas and presently transferred to the Supreme Court, in which he sat until 1856 when he removed to England, where he died in 1865. While his historical work is not important, his History of Nova Scotia has done more to make Acadia known to the outside world than any other work except Evangeline, and Longfellow acknowledged himself much indebted to Halliburton for material. His Bubbles of Canada and Rule and Misrules of the English in America, dealing with political situations of importance in his time, and his half dozen other books are now forgotten. It is as a humorist only that he is remembered. Of his Sam Slick, Professor Felton of Harvard wrote, We can distinguish the real from the counterfeit Yankee at the first sound of the voice and by the turn of a single sentence, and we have no hesitation in declaring that Sam Slick is not what he pretends to be, that there is no organic life in him, that he is an imposter, an impossibility, a non-entity. The London Antonym, on the other hand, pronounced that he, the clockmaker, deserves to be entered on our list of friends containing the names of Tristram Shandy, the shepherd of the Noctes Ambrosiani, and other rhapsodical discoursers on time and change, who, besides the delight of their discourse, possess also the charm of individuality. The farcical, as is his delineation of the shrewd, conceited, bragging, cozening, hard-working, garrulous Yankee, Little as he admires the institutions that produce this type of citizen, it is plain that Judge Halliburton uses the clockmaker and his kind to point the moral against the dullness, lack of enterprise, laziness, and provincial shiftlessness of the Nova Scotians. He means to sting his fellow countrymen into effort and action if he can. Whether the book really served for admonition and correction, whether the Yankee clock really struck the hour for the Blue Nose Awakening, as its author fondly believed, at least he created the conventional Yankee of general acceptation. The lank, awkward figure, ill-articulated and ill-dressed, with trousers and coat sleeves too short, with hat too large, with hair too long, with sharp nose, keen eyes, shrewd smile, with flattened vowels and nasal tones, with queer vocabulary and queerer syntax. In short, the Yankee of the stage, of caricature, of tradition, universally believed in, at least across the seas, until Lowell's genius revealed the true New Englander in Hosea Biglow. Even as a pretender, therefore, Sam Slick has his important place in the Republic of Letters a place the more important as interest in him becomes more and more merely historic. Mr. Samuel Slick, from The Clockmaker, copyright 1871 by Hurd and Hofton, reprinted by permission of Hofton Mifflin & Company, Publishers, Boston. I had heard of Yankee clock peddlers, tin peddlers, and Bible peddlers, especially of him who sold polyglot Bibles, all in English, to the amount of 16,000 pounds. The house of every substantial farmer had three substantial ornaments, a wooden clock, a tin reflector, and a polyglot Bible. How is it that an American can sell his wares at whatever price he pleases, where a blue nose would fail to make a sale at all? I will inquire of the clockmaker the secret of his success. What a pity it is, Mr. Slick, for such was his name, what a pity it is, said I, that you, who are so successful in teaching these people the value of clocks, could not also teach them the value of time. I guess, said he, they have got that ring to grow on their horns yet, which every four-year-old has in our country. 
we reckon hours and minutes to be dollars and cents. They do nothing in these parts but eat, drink, smoke, sleep, ride about, lounge at taverns, make speeches at temperance meetings, and talk about house of assembly. If a man don't hoe his corn and he don't get a crop, he says it is owing to the bank. And if he runs into debt and is sued, why, he says the lawyers are a curse to the country. They are a most idle set of folks, I tell you. But how is it, said I, that you manage to sell such an immense number of clocks, which certainly cannot be called necessary articles, among a people with whom there seems to be so great a scarcity of money? Mr. Slick paused, as if considering the propriety of answering the question, and, looking me in the face, said in a confidential tone, Why, well, I don't care if I do tell you, for the market is glutted and I shall quit this circuit. It is done by a knowledge of soft solder and human nature. But here is Deacon Flint's, said he. I have but one clock left, and I guess I will sell it to him. At the gate of a most comfortable-looking farmhouse stood Deacon Flint, a respectable old man who had understood the value of time better than most of his neighbors, if one might judge from the appearance of everything about him. After the usual salutation and invitation to alight was accepted by Mr. Slick, who said he wished to take leave of Mrs. Flint before he left Colchester. We had hardly entered the house before the clockmaker pointed to the view from the window and, addressing himself to me, said, if I was to tell them in Connecticut there was such a farm as this way down east here in Nova Scotia, they wouldn't believe me. Why, there ain't such a location in all New England. The deacon has a hundred acres of dyke. Seventy, said the deacon, only seventy. Well, seventy. But then there's your fine deep bottom. Why, I could run a ramrod into it. Interval, we call it, said the deacon, who, though evidently pleased at this eulogium, seemed to wish the experiment of the ramrod to be tried in the right place. Well, interval, if you please, though Professor Eliezer Cumstick, in his work on Ohio, calls them bottoms, is just as good as dyke. Then there is that water privilege, worth three or four thousand dollars, twice as good as what Governor Cass paid fifteen thousand dollars for. I wonder, Deacon, you don't put up a carding mill on it. The same works would carry a turning lathe, a shingle machine, a circular saw, grind bark, and... Too old, said the deacon, too old for all those speculations. Old, repeated the clockmaker. Not you. Why, you are worth a half dozen of the young men we see nowadays. You are young enough to have... Here he said something in a lower tone of voice, which I did not distinctly hear. But whatever it was, the deacon was pleased. He smiled and said he did not think of such things now. But your beasts, dear me, your beasts must be put in and have a feed. Saying which, he went out to order them to be taken to the stable. As the old gentleman closed the door after him, Mr. Slick drew nearer to me and said in an undertone, That is what I call soft solder. An Englishman would pass that man as a sheep passes a hog in a pasture without looking at him, or, said he, looking rather archly, if he was mounted on a pretty smart horse, I guess he'd trot away if he could. Now I find, here his lecture on soft solder was cut short by the entrance of Mrs. Flint. Just come to say good-bye, Mrs. Flint. What, have you sold all your clocks? Yes, and very low, too, for money is scarce. And I wish to close the concern. No, I am wrong in saying all, for I have just one left. Neighbor Steele's wife asked me to have the refusal of it, but I guess I won't sell it. I had but two of them, this one and the feller of it, that I sold Governor Lincoln. General Green, the Secretary of State for Maine, said he'd give me fifty dollars for this one here. It has composition wheels and patent axles. It's a beautiful article, a real first chop, no mistake. Genuine, super fine. But I guess I'll take it back, and besides, Squire Hawk might think kinder hard that I did not give him the offer. Dear me, said Mrs. Flint, I should like to see it. Where is it? It is in a chest of mine over the way at Tom Tape's store. I guess he can ship it on to Eastport. That's a good man, said Mrs. Flint. Just let's look at it. Mr. Slick, willing to oblige, yielded to these entreaties and soon produced the clock. A gaudy, highly varnished, trumpery-looking affair. He placed it on the chimney piece where its beauties were pointed out and duly appreciated by Mrs. Flint, 
whose admiration was about ending in a proposal when Mr. Flint returned from giving his directions about the care of the horses. The deacon praised the clock. He too thought it a handsome one. But the deacon was a prudent man. He had a watch. He was sorry, but he had no occasion for a clock. I guess you're in the wrong furrow this time, deacon. It ain't for sale, said Mr. Slick. And if it was, I reckon neighbor Steele's wife would have it, for she gave me no peace about it. Mrs. Flint said that Mr. Steele had enough to do, poor man, to pay his interest without buying clocks for his wife. It is no concern of mine, said Mr. Slick, as long as he pays me what he has to do, but I guess I don't want to sell it, and besides, it comes too high. That clock can't be made at Rhode Island under forty dollars. Why, it ain't possible, said the clockmaker, in apparent surprise, looking at his watch. Why, as I'm alive, it is four o'clock, and if I haven't been two hours here, how on earth shall I reach River Philip tonight? I'll tell you what, Mrs. Flint, I'll leave the clock in your care till I return on my way to the States. I'll set it a-going and put it to the right time. As soon as this operation was performed, he delivered the key to the deacon with a sort of serial comic injunction to wind up the clock every Saturday night, which Mrs. Flint said she would take care of should be done and promised to remind her husband of it in case he should chance to forget it. That, said the clockmaker as soon as we were mounted, that I call human nature. Now that clock is sold for forty dollars. It cost me just six dollars and fifty cents. Mrs. Flint will never let Mrs. Steele have the refusal, nor will the deacon learn until I call for the clock, having once indulged in the use of a superfluity how difficult it is to give it up. We can do without any article of luxury we have never had, but when once obtained, it is not in human nature to surrender it voluntarily. Of 15,000 sold by myself and partners in this province, 12,000 were left in this manner, and only ten clocks were ever returned. When we called for them, they invariably bought them. We trust a soft solder to get them into the house, and to human nature that they never come out of it. End of section 18, read by Bryce Cries. Section 19 of The Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. Henry Hallam, 1777 to 1859. The work of Henry Hallam as a historian was timely. He filled a distinct want, and he seems likely to hold his place for decades to come. His security rests not upon his power of philosophizing from the great events, crises, and epochs in human affairs, not upon broad generalizations regarding the development and trend of civilization but rather upon his clear and comprehensive vision of the all-important facts of history, upon his calm and legal-like presentation of these facts. He walks forth in the vast valley of crumbling bones and dust, the chaos of the ages, and with painstaking care and unerring judgment takes up on this side and on that from the heap of rubbish the few perfect parts that go to make up a complete framework. He compels us to clothe the skeleton and construct a body of our own fashioning, to form our own theories, to deduce our own philosophy. That, then, is the reason that Hallam will remain a source of profit and inspiration to his readers. In his great work, The Middle Ages, as it is commonly known, though its fuller title is View of the State of Europe During the Middle Ages, published in 1818, Hallam adopted a method to such an end that was peculiarly his own. At the risk of repetition and retracing, he took up first one country after another and sketched in outline its growth into a nation, 
devoting to each a chapter that was a complete book in itself and bringing in the doings of nearby countries only so much as was absolutely necessary in this way hallam traces with admirable arrangement and sense of proportion the main lines in the history of france italy spain germany and of the greeks and saracens to give a detailed narration is furthest from his thought and furthest from his achievement he deals primarily with results and with him as he himself has said a single sentence or paragraph is often sufficient to give the character of entire generations he takes the continent in magnificent sweeps casting aside legend tradition intrigue and disaster and catching up only those greater facts and results which he puts together dexterously and accurately to form indeed the framework of the long story of the middle ages this brief summary of hallam's methods and system applies it should be said more to his middle ages than to any other work of his in fact it would seem that his name for the future rests upon this work almost wholly for while his compendious and careful introduction to the literature of europe in the fifteenth sixteenth and seventeenth centuries published in eighteen thirty eight to eighteen thirty nine shows immense erudition and amazingly wide reading one cannot help getting the impression of confusion and clumsiness in its construction in it hallam's opinions are discriminating as in everything he ever wrote but they are by no means profound and to the average student his literature can hardly fail to be dispiriting and dull it is not surprising that a legal acumen and a logical arrangement of his facts should characterize hallam's historical writings born at windsor july ninth seventeen seventy seven and a christchurch college graduate in seventeen ninety nine he studied for the law at christ college oxford and practised industriously for some years on the oxford circuit of independent means he relinquished the law and devoted himself to his literary life and to his important personal interests and his friends of the latter he had many and they were among the most distinguished of his contemporaries he was a member of the famous holland house circle and a guest at bowood and sydney smith macaulay and other social and literary lights esteemed his society he passed most of his time season by season in his london house in wimpole street an uninteresting and retired neighbourhood as pictured in a line of that in memoriam which lord tennyson wrote as his tribute to a friendship with hallam's beloved son arthur various societies british and foreign honoured his works emphatically he was a member of the institute of france and it is interesting to americans to know that he and washington irving received in eighteen thirty the medals offered by king george the fourth for eminence in historical writings his life was relatively quiet and uneventful it is somewhat curious that we have not more reminiscences and pen pictures of him especially as his contemporaries held him in such affection he had almost nothing to say to political life though his prime came to him during the corn law agitations indeed he kept himself during all his busy years until his death in eighteen fifty nine a student of the past rather than a worker of his day we owe much to his profound studies of the centuries preceding his own yet a real admirer of hallam could wish that he had been less concentrated on his analysis of the past and bolder to cope with questions of the present as he himself says he ended his constitutional history of england 
published in 1827, at the accession of George III, because he had been influenced by unwillingness to excite the prejudices of modern politics. It must be a matter of regret that Hallam should thus stop, ingloriously we might almost say, just at the threshold of what was a most interesting part of England's modern constitutional history. At this ending of a century, every student and historian specializes, takes up some one period, and attempts to exhaust it. Those were not the methods of Hallam's time. Some of the advantages of those methods Hallam undoubtedly missed. This weakness shows occasionally on points which seem to be so obscure in Hallam's thought as to render his expression blind and ambiguous. On the whole, however, such instances are infrequent. It is sufficient praise to say that Hallam has done what he set out to do, to furnish for the intelligent and seeking reader a just and accurate outline, to point out the landmarks and beacons on the way that will guide him unfailingly in his future search. In these respects, Hallam's achievements are remarkable and incomparable. Selection English Domestic Comfort in the Fifteenth Century by Henry Hallam from View of the State of Europe During the Middle Ages It is an error to suppose that the English gentry were lodged in stately or even in well-sized houses. Generally speaking, their dwellings were almost as inferior to those of their descendants in capacity as they were in convenience. The usual arrangement consisted of an entrance passage running through the house, with a hall on one side, a parlour beyond, and one or two chambers above, and on the opposite side, a kitchen, pantry, and other offices. Such was the ordinary manor-house of the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries. Larger structures were erected by men of great estates after the Wars of the Roses but I should conceive it difficult to name a house in England still inhabited by a gentleman, and not belonging to the order of castles, the principal apartments of which are older than the reign of Henry the Seventh. The instances at least must be extremely few. France by no means appears to have made a greater progress than our own country in domestic architecture except fortified castles, I do not find any considerable dwellings mentioned before the reign of Charles the Seventh, and very few of so early a date. Even in Italy, where from the size of her cities and social refinements of her inhabitants, greater elegance and splendor in building were justly to be expected, the domestic architecture of the Middle Ages did not attain any perfection. In several towns the houses were covered with thatch, and suffered consequently from destructive fires. The two most essential improvements in architecture during this period, one of which had been missed by the sagacity of Greece and Rome, were chimneys and glass windows. Nothing apparently can be more simple than the former, yet the wisdom of ancient times had been content to let the smoke escape by an aperture in the centre of the roof and a discovery of which vitruvius had not a glimpse was made perhaps in this country by some forgotten semi-barbarian about the middle of the fourteenth century the use of chimneys is distinctly mentioned in england and in italy but they are found in several of our castles which bear a much older date. This country seems to have lost very early the art of making glass, which was preserved in France, whence artificers were brought into England to furnish the windows in some new churches in the seventh century. But if the domestic buildings of the fifteenth century would not seem very spacious or convenient at present, 
far less would this luxurious generation be content with their internal accommodations a gentleman's house containing three or four beds was extraordinarily well provided few probably had more than two the walls were commonly bare without wainscot or even plaster except that some great houses were furnished with hangings and that perhaps hardly so soon as the reign of edward the fourth it is unnecessary to add that neither libraries of books nor pictures could have found a place among furniture silver plate was very rare and hardly used for the table a few inventories of furniture that still remain exhibit a miserable deficiency and this was incomparably greater in private gentlemen's houses than among citizens and especially foreign merchants we have an inventory of the goods belonging to contarini a rich venetian trader at his house in st botolph's lane a d fourteen eighty one there appear to have been no less than ten beds and glass windows are especially noticed as movable furniture no mention however is made of chairs or looking-glasses if we compare this account however trifling in our estimation with a similar inventory of furniture in skipton castle the great honour of the earls of cumberland and among the most splendid mansions of the north not at the same period for i have not found any inventory of a nobleman's furniture so ancient but in fifteen seventy two after almost a century of continual improvement we shall be astonished at the inferior provision of the baronial residence there were not more than seven or eight beds in this great castle nor had any of the chambers either chairs glasses or carpets it is in this sense probably that we must understand aeneas silvius if he meant anything more than to express a traveller's discontent when he declares that the kings of scotland would rejoice to be as well lodged as the second class of citizens at nuremberg the middle ages as a period of intellectual darkness from a view of the state of europe during the middle ages if we would listen to some literary historians we should believe that the darkest ages contained many individuals not only distinguished among their contemporaries but positively eminent for abilities and knowledge a proneness to extol every monk of whose production a few letters or a devotional treatise survives every bishop of whom it is related that he composed homilies runs through the laborious work of the benedictines of st maur the literary history of france and in a less degree is observable even in tirabashi and in most books of this class bede alcuin hinkmar rabban and a number of inferior names become real giants of learning in their uncritical panegyrics but one might justly say that ignorance is the smallest defect of the writers of these dark ages several of them were tolerably acquainted with books but that wherein they are uniformly deficient is original argument or expression almost every one is a compiler of scraps from the fathers or from such semi-classical authors as botius cassiodorus or martianus capella indeed i am not aware that there appeared more than two really considerable men in the republic of letters from the sixth to the middle of the eleventh century john surnamed scotus or erigena a native of ireland and gerbert who became pope by the name of sylvester the second the first endowed with a bold and acute metaphysical genius the second excellent for the time when he lived in mathematical science and mechanical inventions 
if it be demanded by what cause it happened that a few sparks of ancient learning survived throughout this long winter we can only ascribe their preservation to the establishment of christianity religion alone made a bridge as it were across the chaos and has linked the two periods of ancient and modern civilization without this connecting principle europe might indeed have awakened to intellectual pursuits and the genius of recent times needed not to be invigorated by the imitation of antiquity but the memory of greece and rome would have been feebly preserved by tradition and the monuments of those nations might have excited on the return of civilization that vague sentiment of speculation and wonder with which men now contemplate persepolis or the pyramids it is not however from religion simply that we have derived this advantage but from religion as it was modified in the dark ages such is the complex reciprocation of good and evil in the dispensations of providence that we may assert with only an apparent paradox that had religion been more pure it would have been less permanent and that christianity has been preserved by means of its corruptions the sole hope for literature depended on the latin language and i do not see why that should not have been lost if three circumstances in the prevailing religious system all of which we are justly accustomed to disapprove had not conspired to maintain it the papal supremacy the monastic institutions and the use of a latin liturgy number one a continual intercourse was kept up in consequence of the first between rome and the several nations of europe her laws were received by the bishops her legates presided in councils so that a common language was as necessary in the church as it is at present in the diplomatic relations of kingdoms number two throughout the whole course of the middle ages there was no learning and very little regularity of manners among the parochial clergy almost every distinguished man was either the member of a chapter or a convent the monasteries were subjected to strict rules of discipline and held out more opportunities for study than the secular clergy possessed and fewer for worldly dissipations but their most important service was as secure repositories for books all our manuscripts have been preserved in this manner and could hardly have descended to us by any other channel at least there were intervals when i do not conceive that any royal or private libraries existed in the shadows of this universal ignorance a thousand superstitions like foul animals of night were propagated and nourished it would be very unsatisfactory to exhibit a few specimens of this odious brood when the real character of those times is only to be judged by their accumulated multitude there are many books from which a sufficient number of instances may be collected to show the absurdity and ignorance of the middle ages in this respect i shall only mention two as affording more general evidence than any local or obscure superstition in the tenth century an opinion prevailed everywhere that the end of the world was approaching many charters begin with these words as the world is now drawing to its close an army marching under the emperor otto i was so terrified by an eclipse of the sun which it conceived to announce this consummation as to disperse hastily on all sides as this notion seems to have been founded on some confused theory of the millennium it naturally died away when the seasons proceeded in the eleventh century with their usual regularity a far more remarkable and permanent superstition was the appeal to heaven in judicial controversies 
whether through the means of combat or of ordeal. The principle of these was the same, but in the former it was mingled with feelings independent of religion, the natural dictates of resentment in a brave man unjustly accused and the sympathy of a warlike people with the display of skill and intrepidity these in course of time almost obliterated the primary character of judicial combat and ultimately changed it into the modern duel in which assuredly there is no mixture of superstition but in the various tests of innocence which were called ordeals, this stood undisguised and unqualified. It is not necessary to describe what is so well known, the ceremonies of trial by handling hot iron, by plunging the arm into boiling fluids, by floating or sinking in cold water, or by swallowing a piece of consecrated bread. It is observable that, as the interference of heaven was relied upon as a matter of course, it seems to have been reckoned nearly indifferent whether such a test were adopted as must, humanly considered, absolve all the guilty, or one that must convict all the innocent. The ordeals of hot iron or water were, however, more commonly used, and it has been a perplexing question by what dexterity these tremendous proofs were eluded. They seem at least to have placed the decision of all judicial controversies in the hands of the clergy, who must have known the secret, whatever that might be, of satisfying the spectators that an accused person had held a mass of burning iron with impunity. For several centuries this mode of investigation was in great repute, though not without opposition from some eminent bishops. It does discredit to the memory of Charlemagne that he was one of its warmest advocates. But the judicial combat, which indeed might be reckoned one species of ordeal, gradually put an end to the rest and as the church acquired better notions of law and a code of her own she strenuously exerted herself against all these barbarous superstitions at the same time it must be admitted that the evils of superstition in the middle ages though separately considered very serious are not to be weighed against the benefits of the religion with which they were so mingled in the original principles of monastic orders, and the rules by which they ought at least to have been governed, there was a character of meekness, self-denial, and charity that could not wholly be effaced. These virtues, rather than justice and veracity, were inculcated by the religious ethics of the Middle Ages, and in the relief of indigence, it may upon the whole be asserted that the monks did not fall short of their profession. This elemosynary spirit, indeed, remarkably distinguishes both Christianity and Mohammedanism from the moral systems of Greece and Rome, which were very deficient in general humanity and sympathy with suffering nor do we find in any single instance during ancient times, if I mistake not, those public institutions for the alleviation of human miseries which have long been scattered over every part of Europe. The virtues of the monks assumed a still higher character when they stood forward as protectors of the oppressed by an established law founded on very ancient superstition, the precincts of a church afforded sanctuary to accused persons. Under a due administration of justice, this privilege would have been simply and constantly mischievous, as we properly consider it to be in those countries where it still subsists. But in the rapine and tumult of the Middle Ages, the right of sanctuary might as often be a shield to innocence as an immunity to crime. We can hardly regret, in reflecting on the desolating violence which prevailed, that there should have been some green spots in the wilderness where the feeble and the persecuted could find refuge. 
how must this right have enhanced the veneration for religious institutions how gladly must the victims of internal warfare have turned their eyes from the baronial castle the dread and scourge of the neighbourhood to those venerable walls within which not even the clamour of arms could be heard to disturb the chant of holy men and the sacred service of the altar End of section nineteen section twenty of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume seventeen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume seventeen selected poems by fitzgreen halleck seventeen ninety to eighteen sixty seven fitzgreen halleck did his share as an american poet in giving dignity to the native literature during the first half of the nineteenth century like his friend and fellow worker drake he wrote polished and pleasing verse at a time when such work was rare and not fostered by the social conditions a new englander of good puritan stock he was born july the eighth seventeen ninety in the old connecticut coast town of guilford he had such schooling as the place afforded but at fifteen became a clerk in his uncle's store where he remained until his majority his bookish ancestry or the writing eye-chore of a man predestined to letters led him while yet a school lad to scribble verses practising a prentice hand when twenty-one he went to new york entering a counting-house and only leaving it after twenty years of service for a similar position with john jacob astor held for sixteen years a long life of mercantile employment but halleck's interests lay in another direction all his spare money went for books and soon after arriving in the great city he formed the friendship with drake which lasted until the latter's death in eighteen twenty and inspired what is perhaps halleck's best short lyric halleck and drake were collaborators in the clever satiric croker papers which appearing during eighteen nineteen in the new york evening post caught the public fancy as irving and Paudling caught it with the samagundi papers the same year halleck's long satirical poem fanny was published and met with success a european trip at the age of thirty-two broadened his culture and in the poems issued in eighteen twenty seven several pieces show this influence including the familiar martial lay of marco bozaris in eighteen forty nine mr astor having granted him a small annuity the poet returned to his native guildford to live with his sister in one of the town's old-time houses and to lead a life of quiet studious retirement between brother and sister neither of whom had married a tender and beautiful friendship existed not much literary work was done by halleck during the last twenty years although his poem connecticut belongs to this period and reflects his love of his own state he died at guildford november the nineteenth eighteen sixty seven aged seventy seven full honour has been awarded him since on the eightieth anniversary of his birth a fine obelisk erected through the efforts of leading men of letters was dedicated with imposing ceremony at guildford and was the first monument to an american poet as the statue of halleck in central park new york set up in eighteen seventy seven is the first memorial of its kind
an address by bayard taylor and a poem by dr holmes on this occasion indicated the quality of the respect felt for the poet his poetical writings have been edited by james grant wilson eighteen sixty nine who at the same time prepared his biography fitzgreen halleck will always have a place in the american anthology his verse to-day strikes the ear as somewhat academic and confined the body of his work is slender nor was his range wide but as a forerunner of greater singers and within his limitations he produced poetry that is felicitous in diction skilful in the handling of metres and possessed of feeling in the lyric vein and of fire in the heroic two or three of his compositions certainly have vitality enough for a prolonged existence he cannot be overlooked in tracing the development of letters in the united states marco bozaris at midnight in his guarded tent the turk was dreaming of the hour when greece her knee in suppliance bent should tremble at his power in dreams through camp and court he bore the trophies of a conqueror in dreams his song of triumph heard then wore his monarch's signet ring then pressed that monarch's throne a king as wild his thoughts and gay of wing as eden's garden bird at midnight in the forest shades bozaris reigned his suliot band true as the steel of their tried blades heroes in heart and hand there had the persians thousands stood there had the glad earth drunk their blood on old platea's day and now there breathed that haunted air the sons of sires who conquered there with arm to strike and soul to dare as quick as far as they an hour passed on the turk awoke that bright dream was his last he woke to hear his centuries shriek to arms they come the greek the greek he woke to die midst flame and smoke and shout and groan and sabre stroke and death shots falling thick and fast as lightnings from the mountain cloud and heard with voices trumpet loud bozaris cheer his band strike till the last armed foe expires strike for your altars and your fires strike for the green graves of your sires god and your native land they fought like brave men long and well they piled that ground with moslems slain they conquered but bozaris fell bleeding at every vein his few surviving comrades saw his smile when rang their proud hurrah and the red field was won then saw in death his eyelids close calmly as to a night's repose like flowers at set of sun come to the bridal chamber death come to the mother's when she feels for the first time her first-born's breath come when the blessed seals that close the pestilence are broke and crowded cities wail its stroke come in consumption's ghastly form the earthquake shock the ocean storm come when the heart beats high and warm with banquet song and dance and wine and thou art terrible the tear the groan the knell the pall the beer and all we know or dream or fear of agony are thine but to the hero when his sword has won the battle for the free thy voice sounds like a prophet's word and in its hollow tones are heard the thanks of millions yet to be come when his task of fame is wrought come with her laurel leaf blood bought come in her crowning hour and then thy sunken eyes unearthly light 
to him is welcome as the sight of sky and stars to prisoned men thy grasp is welcome as the hand of brother in a foreign land thy summons welcome as the cry that told the indian isles were nigh to the world-seeking genoese when the land wind from woods of palm and orange groves and fields of balm blew o'er the haitian seas bozomris with the storied brave greece nurtured in her glory's time rest thee there is no prouder grave even in her own proud clime she wore no funeral weeds for thee nor bade the dark hearse wave its plume like torn branch from death's leafless tree in sorrow's pomp and pageantry the heartless luxury of the tomb but she remembers thee as one long loved and for a season gone for thee her poet's lyre is wreathed her marble wrought her music breathed for thee she rings the birthday bells of thee her babe's first lisping tells for thine her evening prayer is said at palace couch and cottage bed her soldier closing with the foe gives for thy sake a deadlier blow his plighted maiden when she fears for him the joy of her young years thinks of thy fate and checks her tears and she the mother of thy boys though in her eye and faded cheek is read the grief she will not speak the memory of her buried joys and even she who gave thee birth will by their pilgrim circled hearth talk of thy doom without a sigh for thou art freedom's now and fame's one of the few the immortal names that were not born to die robert burns there have been loftier themes than his and longer scrolls and louder lyres and lays lit up with poesies purer and holier fires yet read the names that know not death few nobler ones than burns are there and few have won a greener wreath than that which binds his hair his is that language of the heart in which the answering heart would speak thought word that bids the warm tear start or the smile light the cheek and his that music to whose tone the common pulse of man keeps time in cot or castle's mirth or moan in cold or sunny clime and who hath heard his song nor knelt before its spell with willing knee and listened and believed and felt the poet's mastery or the mind sea in calm and storm or the heart's sunshine and its showers or passion's moments bright and warm or reason's dark cold hours on fields where brave men die or do in halls where rings the banquet's mirth where mourners weep where lovers woo from throne to cottage hearth what sweet tears dim the eyes unshed what wild vows falter on the tongue when scots we hey we wallace bled or old lang syne is sung pure hopes that lift the soul above come with his cotter's hymn of praise and dreams of youth and truth and love with logan's banks and braes and when he breathes his master lay of alloway's which haunted wall all passions in our frames of clay come thronging at his call imagination's world of air and our own world its gloom and glee wit pathos poetry are there and death's sublimity and burns though brief the race he ran though rough and dark the path he trod lived died in form and soul a man the image of his god 
through care and pain and want and woe with wounds that only death could heal tortures the poor alone can know the proud alone can feel he kept his honesty and truth his independent tongue and pen and moved in manhood as in youth pride of his fellow men strong sense deep feeling passions strong a hate of tyrant and of knave a love of right a scorn of wrong of coward and of slave a kind true heart a spirit high that could not fear and would not bow were written in his manly eye and on his manly brow praise to the bard his words are driven like flower seeds by the far winds sown where'er beneath the sky of heaven the birds of fame have flown praise to the man a nation stood beside his coffin with wet eyes her brave her beautiful her good as when a loved one dies and still as on his funeral day men stand his cold earth couch around with the mute homage that we pay to consecrated ground and consecrated ground it is the last the hallowed home of one who lives upon all memories though with the buried gone such graves as his are pilgrim shrines shrines to no code or creed confined the delphian vales the palestines the meccas of the mind sages with wisdom's garland wreathed crowned kings and mitred priests of power and warriors with their bright sword sheathed the mightiest of the hour and lowlier names whose humble home is lit by fortune's dimmer star are there or wave and mountain come from countries near and far pilgrims whose wandering feet have pressed the Schweitzer's snow the arab's sand or trod the piled leaves of the west my own green forest land all ask the cottage of his birth gaze on the scenes he loved and sung and gather feelings not of earth his fields and streams among they linger by the dunes low trees and pastoral nith and wooded air and round thy sepulchres dumfries the poet's tomb is there but what to them the sculptor's art his funeral columns wreaths and urns were they not graven on the heart the name of robert burns on the death of joseph rodman drake green be the turf above thee friend of my better days none knew thee but to love thee nor name thee but to praise tears fell when thou wert dying from eyes unused to weep and long where thou art lying will tears the cold turf steep when hearts whose truth was proven like thine are laid in earth there should a wreath be woven to tell the world their worth and i who woke each morrow to clasp thy hand in mine who shared thy joy and sorrow whose weal and woe were thine it should be mine to braid it around thy faded brow but i've in vain essayed it and feel i cannot now while memory bids me weep thee nor thoughts nor words are free the grief is fixed too deeply that mourns a man like thee end of section twenty read by alan mapstone Section 21 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit 
LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. Yehuda Halevi, 1080 to Unknown, by Richard Gottheil. In the sunny lands of Spain, the Jews, outcast from their eastern homes, had found a second fatherland. Under the rule of Arabic caliphs, Orientals as they themselves were, occasion had been given them to develop that taste for literature which their continued occupation with the Bible had instilled into them. Cordova, Granada, and Toledo soon became homes of Jewish learning, in which the glory of the schools of Babylon and Palestine was well-nigh hidden. Under the influence of a quieter life, the heart of the Jew expanded, and his imagination had freedom to run its own course. The Hebrew muse, which had almost forgotten the force with which it had poured forth psalm and song in ancient days, awoke again to a sense of its power. The harp of David was once more strung to catch the outpourings of hearts thankful and gay. The priests in the temple of God, less grand outwardly now, but more fully the expression of the feelings of the individual, chanted anew Israel's songs of praise and of sanctification. Of the many poets which this new life produced, lived, as it was, among a people to whom poetry was so natural a mode of expression, to Abdul Hassan, Yehuda ben Halevi, all unite in giving the crown. Born in Toledo, Old Castile, in 1080, his songs and verses soon became so well known, and so oft recited, that the person of their author has been almost forgotten in the love shown his productions. He lived only for his pen, and no deeds are accounted him which might make the telling of his life more than of passing interest. He was learned, as most of the men of his race then were, in all the sciences of the Arabians, had made himself proficient in the language of both Koran and Bible, was learned in the practice of medicine, and facile in the discussion of philosophy. His was a thoroughly religious nature, and in joining together philosophy and poetry, and medicine, he was following a custom not unknown in the Jewish high schools. In philosophy, he communed with man about God, in poetry, with God about man, while his service to his fellow men was through his power in the healing art. I occupy myself in the hours which belong neither to the day nor to the night with the vanity of medical science, though I am unable to heal." I physic Babel, but it continues infirm, are his own words in a letter to a friend. This art he practiced in Toledo and Cordova, and in one of these places he wrote, in the Arabic tongue, a philosophical work, Kuzari, which, though perhaps bad philosophy, is a poetical and beautiful defense of his own faith against the conflicting claims of Christianity and Mohammedism. But at the early age of thirteen, his pen had commenced to run in the cadence of rhyme and meter. His first poems were upon subjects which touched the young, poems of friendship, of love, and of wine, in which he made the old sedate and stately language of the Bible shake with youthful mirth and laughter. And though he never really forsook such subjects light and gay, these poems were not the real expression of his inmost being. A strong sense of the divine presence, a romantic love for the home of his faith, in spite of its second home in Spain, have made Yehuda Halevi the chief of the national poets of Israel, whose love was rooted in the land of the patriarchs and prophets. Of all his three hundred religious poems, almost one-third of the poet's legacy, none bear the stamp of intense feeling as do these national ones. In verse after verse, he bemoans the ruins of the ancient places, bewails the exile of Israel's children, and sings the larger hope of her returned glory. So strong was the love of Zion within him that he could not rest until he had seen in the flesh that which his spiritual eye had beheld since his youth. He had already reached the age of sixty when he set out on his long journey to the Holy Land. Alone, because he had not sufficiently persuaded others up to the pitch of his own faith, and yet not entirely alone. His muse went with him, and his track was strewn with the brightest pearls which have fallen from his lips. 
he reached Palestine, but our knowledge of his further doings there is cut off. His body must have been laid in the sacred soil. But no man knoweth the place of his sepulchre. Like Elijah of old, he went up to heaven. The popular fancy has seized upon so welcome a figure, and has told how he was cut down by an Arab at the very walls of Jerusalem, after he had poured forth the Ode to Zion, which has done more than any of his other pieces to keep his memory alive, and of which Heine, of the elder poet's race, and inwardly also of his faith, has said, Tears of pearl, that on the golden thread of rhyme are strung together, from the shining forge of poetry, have come forth in song celestial. And this is the song of Zion, that Yehuda ben Halevi sang when dying on the holy ruins of Jerusalem. Yehuda Halevi has thus become the exponent of suffering Israel, the teller of its woes, the prophet of its hopes. A depth of pure feeling is revealed in him, a freedom from artificial constraint, and a power of description which we meet with nowhere among the Middle Age Hebrew poets. As a true poet, love remains his theme to the end, but the love of the fair one is exchanged for a love purer and greater, his people, his faith. But a wan and woeful maiden was his love, a mournful image of despair and desolation, who was named Jerusalem. Even in his early boyhood did he love her deeply, truly, and a thrill of passion shook him at the word Jerusalem. And that people has returned his love a thousandfold. Signed, Richard Gottheil. Ode to Zion Art thou not, Zion, fain to send forth greetings from thy sacred rock unto thy captive train, who greet thee as the remnants of thy flock? Take thou on every side, east, west, and south, and north, their greetings multiplied. Sadly he greets thee still, the prisoner of hope, who day and night sheds ceaseless tears, like dew on Hermon's hill. Would that they fell on thy mountain's height! Harsh is my voice when I bewail thy woes, but when in fancy's dream I see thy freedom, forth its cadence flows, sweet as the harps that hung by Babel's stream. My heart is so distressed for Bethel ever blessed, for Peniel and each sacred place. The holy presence there to thee is present where thy Maker opes thy gates, the gates of heaven to face. Oh, who will lead me on to seek the spots where, in far distant years, the angels in their glory dawned upon thy messengers and seers. Oh, who will give me wings that I may fly away, and there at rest from all my wanderings, the ruins of my heart among thy ruins lay. I'll bend my face unto thy soil, and hold thy stones as precious gold, and when in Hebron I have stood beside my father's tomb, then will I pace in turn thy plains and thy forest wide, until I stand in Gilead, and discern Mount Hor and Mount Abarim, neath whose crest the luminaries twain, thy guides and beacons, rest. Thy air is life unto my soul, thy grains of dust are myrrh, thy streams with honey flow. Naked and barefoot, to thy ruined fanes, how gladly would I go! To where the ark was treasured, and in dim recesses dwelt the holy cherubim, Perfect in beauty, Zion, how in thee do love and grace unite. The souls of thy companions tenderly turn unto thee. Thy joy was their delight. And weeping, they lament thy ruin now. In distant exile, for thy sacred height they long, and towards thy gates in prayer they bow. Thy flocks are scattered o'er the barren waste, yet do they not forget thy sheltering fold. Unto thy garment's fringe they cling, And haste the branches of thy palms To seize and hold. Shinar and Petros, Come they near to thee? Not are they, by thy light and right divine. To what can be compared the majesty Of thy anointed line? To what the singers, seers, and Levites thine? 
The rule of idols fails and is cast down. Thy power eternal is, from age to age, thy crown. The Lord desires thee for his dwelling place eternally. And blessed is he whom God has chosen for the grace within thy courts to rest. Happy is he that watches, drawing near, until he sees thy glorious lights arise, and over whom thy dawn breaks, full and clear, set in the orient skies. But happiest he who with exultant eyes the bliss of thy redeemed ones shall behold, and see thy youth renewed as in the days of old. Translation of Alice Lucas Separation And so we twain must part. O oh, linger yet! Let me still feed my glance upon thine eyes. Forget not, love, the days of our delight, And I our nights of bliss shall ever prize. In dreams thy shadowy image I shall see. O oh, even in my dreams, be kind to me. Though I were dead, I none the less should hear thy step, thy garment rustling on the sand. And if thou waft me greetings from the grave, I shall drink deep the breath of that cold land. Take thou my days, command this life of mine, if it can lengthen out the space of thine. No voice I hear, from lips death pale and chill, yet deep within my heart it echoes still. My frame remains, my soul to thee yearns forth, a shadow I must tarry still on earth. Back to the body dwelling here in pain, return, my soul, make haste and come again. Translation of Emma Lazarus The Earth in Spring Then day by day, her broidered gown, she changes for fresh wonder. A rich profusion of gay robes she scatters all around her. From day to day her flowers' tints change quick, like eyes that brighten. Now white like pearl, now ruby red, now emerald green they'll lighten. She turns all pale. From time to time red blushes quick or cover. She's like a fair fond bride that pours warm kisses on her lover. The beauty of her bursting spring so far exceeds my telling. Methinks sometimes she pales the stars that have in heaven their dwelling. Translation of Edward G. King Longing for Jerusalem O city of the world, with sacred splendor blessed, my spirit yearns to thee from out the far-off west. A stream of love wells forth when I recall thy day. Now is thy temple waste, thy glory passed away. Had I an eagle's wings, straight would I fly to thee. Moisten thy holy dust with wet cheeks streaming free. Ah, oh, how I long for thee, albeit thy king has gone. Albeit where balm once flowed, the serpent dwells alone. Could I but kiss thy dust, so would I fain expire. As sweet as honey then, my passion, my desire. Translation of Emma Lazarus End of section 21「Section 22 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. Philip Gilbert Hamerton, 1834 to 1894. The sneer of Disraeli that a critic is a man who has failed in the branch of work he sets up to judge is like saying that a mill race is a stream which has failed to run in its own channel, making a definition serve as an insult. The man who does not fail is too busy with his own creations to spare much time for shaping judgments on others, and so far as it implies that the failure leaves the critic no claim to be heard, 
it is shallow to the point of stupidity on the contrary the only thing which does give his verdicts weight is the fact that he has wrought enough in the given field to know its technique and its implications experience without success is the very condition of most good professional criticism the limitations and perversions involved by this are equally clear and must be allowed for mr hammerton was in this generation the best literary exponent of art to the public and of different classes of art to each other for artists are often as narrow and distorted in their estimates of other branches than their own as the public is in its estimates of all and are perhaps even more accurate and unreasonable this position he owed precisely to the fact that he was a trained and learned artist versed in the techniques of a singularly wide range of artistic methods but neither a great nor a popular artist combined of course with other qualities which marked him out for an efficient interpreter his analytic powers his remarkable freedom from bias or bigotry his catholicity of taste and sanity of mind gave him unusual insight and foresight few men have measured work or reputations with more sobriety of judgment or made fewer mistakes in prophecy the character and purpose of his writing must be borne in mind he was not instructing artists but the public even though a special wealthy and fairly cultivated public a body which as he has said is at once practically ignorant of art and sorely affronted at being taxed with such ignorance he was therefore in the general position of a schoolmaster with a voluntary school of jealous and conceited pupils his lucid and pleasing literary style his clearness of analysis his justness of spirit and a temper never ruffled even into a to cock gave him unequalled power of persuasiveness over this audience but great depth or originality of exposition would have been worse than wasted he says himself that the vulgarization of rudiments has nothing to do with the advance of science nor has it anything to do with the advance of art except and the exception is of the first importance by raising the level of the buyers of artwork hence it is unreasonable to blame him for the commonplaceness which artists fret over in his art writing it was an indispensable part of his service and influence and probably fewer are beyond the need and scope of his commonplaces than would like to acknowledge it indeed through his guiding of public taste he had much more influence even on the development of art forms themselves than is generally supposed it is due mainly to him that etching the most individual and expressive of the methods of engraving has been raised from an unfamiliar specialty to the foremost place in the favor of cultivated art lovers his literary services to art taken as a whole his quarter-century editing of the portfolio which he founded with his clear and patient analysis of current works of art and his indirect and conciliatory but all the more effective rebuffs to public ignorance and presumption his thorough technical works on etching on landscape on all the graphic arts his life of turner his thoughts on art steadily readable and clarifying and much other matter have probably done more than all other art writing of the age together to put the public mind into the only state from which anything good can be hoped for art to wit a willing recognition of its ignorance of the primary laws and limitations of artistic processes and its lack of any right to pass on their embodiments till the proper knowledge is acquired he has removed some of that ignorance 
but in the very process contrives to explain how vast a body is still left and how crude random and worthless any judgments based upon that vacuity of knowledge must be to do this and yet rouse no irritation in his pupils but leave instead a great personal liking is a signal triumph of good exposition good manners and intrinsic good feeling mr hammerton never indulges in the acrimony by which critics so often mar their influence he assumes that when his readers make mistakes they do so from misunderstanding and would be glad of knowledge courteously presented and he is rewarded by being both listened to and liked and to the uninstructed who listen teachably his incomparably lucid explanations of the principles of artistic values and sacrifices the piecemeal attempts of different forms of art to interpret nature and their insuperable boundaries the techniques of materials the compulsion to imaginative work by physical limitations and other pieces of analysis form the best of preliminary trainings in rational judgment of art and render the worst class of ignorant misjudgments wholly impossible his literary work unconnected with art was of considerable volume and equals the other in general repute and appreciation best known of all his books is the intellectual life which deserves its fame as being the chief storehouse of philosophic consolation to the vast class of literary weaklings developed by a comfortable democracy it is a perpetual healing in the hours of despondency that come to every aspiring but limited worker when he looks on his petty accomplishment by the light of his ambition it consists of a set of short conversational articles many of them in the form of letters developing the thesis that the intellectual life is not a matter of volume but of quality and tendency that it may be lived intensely and satisfyingly with little actual acquirement and no recognized position that it consists not in the amassing of facts or even in power of creation but in the constant preference of higher thought to lower in aspiration rather than attainment and that any one mind is in itself as worthy as another the single utterance that it never could have been intended that everybody should write great books naively obvious as it is was worth writing the book for as an aid to self-content it is full of the gentlest firmest most sympathetically sensible advice and suggestion and remonstrance as to the limitations of time and strength the way in which most advantages breed compensating obstacles so that conditions are far more equal than they appear the impossibility of achievement without sacrifice the need of choice among incompatible ends and many other aspects of life as related to study and production its teaching of sobriety and attainability of aim of patient utilization of means and of contentment in such goal as our powers can reach is of inestimable value in an age of a general half-education which breeds ambitions in far greater number than can be realized human intercourse is a collection of essays on life and society some of them ranking among his best the admirable chapter on the noble bohemianism is really an astray from the intellectual life the book french and english most of it first published in the atlantic monthly is a comparison of the two peoples and modes of life and thought of great charm and suggestiveness his double position as a loyal Englishman by birth and long residence and a sort of adoptive Frenchman by marriage and also long residence 
made him solicitous to clear up the misunderstandings each people had of the other and he wrote much to this end with his usual calm sense and gentlemanly urbanity five modern frenchmen is a set of excellent biographies of french artists and others chapters on animals explains itself he wrote two novels wenderholm and marmorne deserving of more reading than they receive and a number of other works besides publishing collected volumes of shorter papers and at twenty-one a volume of poems mr hammerton was born in laneside near shaw lancashire england september tenth eighteen thirty four after preparing for oxford he went to paris to study art and literature a few years later he set up a camp at loch awe scotland to paint landscapes this he described in a painter's camp in the highlands and began to gain the note as a man of letters which he vainly hoped to gain as an artist from eighteen sixty six to eighteen sixty eight he was art critic for the london saturday review in eighteen sixty nine he established the portfolio a high-grade art review addressing a public of supposedly cultivated art lovers rather than the miscellaneous mass but how little he felt himself dispensed from rudimentary exposition, and how low an estimate he set on even their connoisseurship may be learned from the first chapter of the Thoughts on Art. He married a French lady of Autonne, and spent the latter part of his life mostly there or in Boulogne. He died in the latter place, November fifth, 1894 greater geniuses in dying have deprived the world of less service and less enjoyment many of his readers felt a personal bereavement in his loss as in that of a companion with a nature at once lofty and tender a safe guide and elevating friend unfailing in charm comfort and instructiveness selection peach bloom by philip gilbert hammerton from the sylvan year there is a corner of a neglected old garden at the val sainte veronique in which grows a certain plant very abundantly that inevitably reminds us of an ancient philosopher towards the end of march it is all carpeted with young hemlock which at this stage of its existence lies almost perfectly flat upon the ground and covers it with one of the most minutely beautiful designs that can possibly be imagined the delicate division of the fresh green leaves making a pattern that would be fit for some room if a skilful manufacturer copied it our own hemlock is believed to be identical with that which caused the death of socrates but its action in northern countries is much feebler than in the warmer climate of the mediterranean in the same old abandoned garden where the hemlock grows on the walls there remain a few fruit trees and amongst these some peaches and apricots they are in full bloom towards the end of march and of all the beautiful sights to be seen at this time of the year I know of none to be compared to these old peach trees with their wreath of rosy bloom, which would be beautiful in any situation, but is especially in this, because there happen to be some mellow tinted walls behind them, the very background that a painter would delight in. There is some pretty coloring in the apricot blossoms, on account of the pink calyx and the pinkish brown of the young twigs, which has an influence on the effect but the peach is incomparably richer and after the greys of wintry trees and wintry skies the sight is gladdened beyond measure by the flush of peach blossom and the blue of the clear spring heaven but to enjoy these two fresh and pure colours to the utmost we need some quiet colouring in the picture and nothing supplies this better than such old walls 
as those of the monastic buildings at the Val Saint Veronique, walls that nature has been painting in her own way for full four hundred years, with the most delicate changes of grey and brown and dark gleamings of bronze and gold. There is something, too, which gratifies other feelings than those of simple vision in the renewal of the youth of nature contrasting with the steady decay of any ancient human work, and in the contrast between her exquisiteness, her delicacy, her freshness, as exhibited in a thing so perfect as a fresh peach blossom, with its rosy color, its almond perfume, its promise of luscious fruit, and the roughness of all that man can do, even at his best. Selection the Fascination of the Remote by Philip Gilbert Hamerton from The Life of J. M. W. Turner It has been remarked before that whereas with most men the maturing of the faculties leads from imagination to reason, from poetry to prose, this was not the case with Turner, who became more and more poetical as he advanced in life and this might in some measure account for his ever-increasing tendency to desert the foreground where objects are too near to have much enchantment about them in order to dream and make others dream of distances which seem hardly of this world the fascination of the remote for minds which have any imaginative faculty at all is so universal and so unfailing that it must be due to some cause in the depths of man's spiritual nature. It may be due to a religious instinct, which makes him forget the meanness and triviality of common life in this world, to look as far beyond it as he can to a mysterious infinity of glory, where earth itself seems to pass easily into heaven. It may be due to a progressive instinct which draws men to the future and the unknown, leading them ever to fix their gaze on the far horizon, like mariners looking for some visionary Atlantis across the spaces of the wearisome sea. Be this as it may, the enchantments of landscape distances are certainly due far more to the imagination of the beholder than to any tangible or explicable beauty of their own. It is probable that minds of a common order, which see with the bodily eyes only and have no imaginative perception, receive no impressions of the kind which affected Turner. But the conditions of modern life have developed a great sensitiveness to such impressions in minds of a higher class. It would be difficult, if not impossible, to name any important imaginative work in literature produced during the present century in which there is not some expression proving the author's sensitiveness to the poetry of distance. I will not weary the reader with quotations, but here is just one from Shelley, which owes most of its effect upon the mind to his perception of two elements of sublimity, distance and height, in which perception, as in many other mental gifts, he strikingly resembled Turner. The stanza is in the Revolt of Islam. Upon that rock a mighty column stood, whose capital seemed sculptured in the sky, which to the wanderers o'er the solitude of distant seas from ages long gone by had made a landmark or its height to fly. Scarcely the cloud, the vulture, or the blast has power, and when the shades of evening lie on earth and ocean, its carved summits cast the sunken daylight far through the aerial waste. This was written in 1817, just about the time when Turner was passing from his early manner to the sublimities of his maturity, and there is ample evidence, of which more may be said later, that Turner and Shelley were as much in sympathy as two men can be, 
when one is cultivated almost exclusively by means of literature and the other by graphic art but however great may have been the similarity of their minds whatever susceptibility to certain impressions they may have had in common the two arts which they pursued differed widely in technical conditions it may or it may not be as easy to write verses as to paint when both are to be supremely well done but it is certain that poetic description requires less realization than pictorial so that less accurate observation will suffice for it and an inferior gift of memory in the whole range of the difficulties which painters endeavor to overcome there is not one which tries their powers more severely than the representation of distant effects in landscape they can never be studied from nature for they come and go so rapidly as to permit nothing but the most inadequate memoranda they can never be really imitated being usually in such a high key of light and color as to go beyond the resources of the palette and the finest of them are so mysterious that the most piercing eyesight is baffled perceiving at the utmost but little of all that they contain the interpretation of such effects however able and intelligent it may be always requires a great deal of good will on the part of the spectator who must be content if he can read the painter's work as a sort of shorthand without finding in it any of the amusement which may be derived from the imitation of what is really imitable for all these reasons it would be a sufficiently rash enterprise for an artist to stake his prospects on the painting of distances but there is another objection even yet more serious such painting requires not only much good will in the spectator but also great knowledge freedom from vulgar prejudices and some degree of faith in the painter himself when people see a noble effect in nature there is one stock observation which they almost invariably make they always say or nearly always now if we were to see that effect in a picture we should not believe it to be possible one would think that after such a reflection on their own tendency to unbelief in art and to astonishment in the presence of nature people would be forewarned against their own injustice but it is not so they will make that observation every time they see a fine sunset or a remarkable cloud in the natural world and remain as unjust as ever to the art which represents phenomena of the same order turner had to contend against this disposition to deny the truth of everything that is not commonplace he was too proud and courageous to allow it to arrest his development and would not submit to dictation from any one as to the subjects of his larger pictures he knew the value of money and would work very hard to earn it but no money consideration whatever was permitted to interfere between him and the higher manifestations of his art selection trees in art by philip gilbert hammerton from landscape it may however not be absolutely safe to conclude that the greeks had no landscape painting because we find only conventional and decorative representations of trees on vases if it is true that the mural paintings at herculaneum and pompeii were not always essentially modern at the time when they were painted upon the wall but rather in many cases copies and reminiscences of much more ancient art it would seem possible that the painters of antiquity may have at least gone so far in the direction of true landscape painting as to have attained the notion of mass in foliage some of the pompeian pictures give large leafed shrubs seen near the figures 
with much of the liberty and naturalness in this disposal of the leaves that were afterwards fully attained by the venetians whilst many of the landscapes really show foliage in mass not so learnedly as in modern landscape painting but quite with the knowledge that masses had a light side and a dark side and a roundness which might be painted without insisting on the form of each leaf the same observation of mass is to be seen in the companion interpretation of mountains which though extremely simple and primitive and without any of the refinements of mountain form that are perceptible to ourselves exhibit nevertheless the important truth that the facets of a mountain catch the light in medieval landscape painting trees were of great importance from the first on account of the free decorative inventiveness of the medieval mind that exercised itself in illumination and tapestry and in patterns for dress for all of which leaves and flowers were the best natural materials or suggestions the history of tree drawing in the middle ages is very like its history in greece as apollo and Semele were placed on each side the laurel of which the leaves were few and distinctly individualized so adam and eve were placed on each side the apple tree which was often represented as a bare thin stem branching into a sort of flat oval at the top that was filled with distinct leaves and fruit and sometimes even surrounded by a line in other drawings or paintings the tree was allowed to develop itself more freely but the artist still attended to the individual leaves and the tree was usually kept small like the young trees in our gardens even in hunting scenes where a forest is represented as in the manuscript of the hunting book by gaston phoebus the trees have short bare trunks and a few leaves and are about the height of a man on horseback often not so high they answer in short to the trees and boxes of toys for children except that they are more prettily designed the nearest approach to foliage attained by the medieval love of the distinct leaf is in the backgrounds to tapestries and decorative paintings designed on the same principles where the leaves although individually perfect are so multiplied that the mere numbers make them appear innumerable in this way the distinct designers of the middle ages attained a sort of infinity though it is not the same as the real infinity of nature where details cannot be counted one of the best examples of this is the background to orcagna's fresco of the dream of life in the campo santo of pisa where the orange trees stand behind the figures and fill the upper part of the picture from side to side with their dense foliage studded with fruit and between their thin stems every inch of space is filled with a diaper of flat green leaves to represent the close shrubbery or underwood in the garden this is still quite medieval in spirit because the leaves are distinctly drawn and all are countable however numerous they are also decorative as primitive art was sure to be it is difficult to fix with precision the date when the idea of mass in foliage began to acquire importance and i know that if i give a date some earlier examples may be found which would seem to throw it farther back in art history but occasional precursors do not invalidate the rights of a century in which an idea first takes effectual root there is a very remarkable landscape background by giovanni bellini in his picture of the death of peter martyr in our national gallery the most elaborate example of tree painting among our older pictures the idea is to show trees in a wood with stems crossing each other and supporting an immense quantity of highly wrought foliage well in this picture the foliage is not flat 
there is a sense of mass and yet to a modern eye it is easily visible that bellini was still hampered by the medieval interest in the leaf and driven by that to bestow prodigious pains upon the individual leaves that he portrayed by thousands in the same fifteenth century a manuscript of the epistles of ovid now in the national library of paris was illuminated with subjects that have landscape backgrounds of a very advanced kind and here the foliage is completely massed with considerable breadth of shaded parts and only touches for the lights we may remember then that classical tree painting began with the stem and a reduced number of distinct leaves but attained masses of foliage in the companion paintings or earlier and that medieval painting began in the same way with the leaf and the stem but led to masses about the fifteenth century after passing through an intermediate stage in which there was a great multiplicity of distinctly painted leaves selection the noble bohemianism by philip gilbert hammerton from human intercourse amongst the common injustices of the world there have been few more complete than its reprobation of the state of mind and manner of life that have been called bohemianism and so closely is that reprobation attached to the word that i would gladly have substituted some other term for the better bohemianism had the english language provided me with one it may however be a gain to justice itself that we should be compelled to use the same expression qualified only by an adjective for two states of existence that are the good and the bad conditions of the same as it will tend to make us more charitable to those whom we must always blame and yet may blame with a more or less perfect understanding of the causes that led them into error the lower forms of bohemianism are associated with several kinds of vice and are therefore justly disliked by people who know the value of a well-regulated life and when at the worst regarded by them with feelings of positive abhorrence the vices connected with these forms of bohemianism are idleness irregularity extravagance drunkenness and immorality and besides these vices the worst bohemianism is associated with many repulsive faults that may not be exactly vices and yet are almost as much disliked by decent people these faults are slovenliness dirt a degree of carelessness in matters of business often scarcely to be distinguished from dishonesty and habitual neglect of the decorous observances that are inseparable from a high state of civilization after such an account of the worst bohemianism in which as the reader perceives i have extenuated nothing it may seem almost an act of temerity to advance the theory that this is only the bad side of a state of mind and feeling that has its good and perfectly respectable side also if this seems difficult to believe the reader has only to consider how certain other instincts of humanity have also their good and bad developments the religious and the sexual instincts in their best action are on the side of national and domestic order but in their worst action they produce sanguinary quarrels ferocious persecutions and the excesses of the most degrading sensuality again before going to the raison d'etre of bohemianism let me point to one consideration of great importance to us if we desire to think quite justly it is and has always been a characteristic of bohemianism to be extremely careless of appearances and to live outside the shelter of hypocrisy 
so its vices are far more visible than the same vices when practised by men of the world and incomparably more offensive to persons with a strong sense of what is called propriety at the time when the worst form of bohemianism was more common than it is now its most serious vices were also the vices of the best society if the bohemian drank to excess so did the nobility and gentry if the bohemian had a mistress so had the most exalted personages the bohemian was not so much blamed for being a sepulchre as for being an ill-kept sepulchre and not a whited sepulchre like the rest it was far more his slovenliness and poverty than his graver vices that made him offensive to a corrupt society with fine clothes and ceremonious manners bohemianism and philistinism are the terms by which for want of better we designate two opposite ways of estimating wealth and culture there are two categories of advantages in wealth the intellectual and the material the intellectual advantages are leisure to think and read travel and intelligent conversation the material advantages are large and comfortable houses tables well served and abundant good coats clean linen fine dresses and diamonds horses carriages servants hot-houses wine cellars shootings evidently the most perfect condition of wealth would unite both classes of advantages but this is not always or often possible and it so happens that in most situations a choice has to be made between them the bohemian is the man who with small means desires and contrives to obtain the intellectual advantages of wealth which he considers to be leisure to think and read travel and intelligent conversation the philistine is the man who whether his means are small or large devotes himself wholly to the attainment of the other set of advantages a large house good food and wine clothes horses and servants the intelligent bohemian does not despise them on the contrary when he can afford it he encourages them and often surrounds himself with beautiful things but he will not barter his mental liberty in exchange for them as the philistine does so readily if the bohemian simply prefers sordid idleness to the comfort which is the reward of industry he has no part in the higher bohemianism but combines the philistine fault of intellectual apathy with the bohemian fault of standing aloof from industrial civilization if a man abstains from furthering the industrial civilization of his country he is only excusable if he pursues some object of at least equal importance intellectual civilization really is such an object and the noble bohemianism is excusable for serving it rather than that other civilization of arts and manufactures which has such numerous servants of its own if the bohemian does not redeem his negligence of material things by superior intellectual brightness he is half a philistine he is destitute of what is best in bohemianism i had nearly written of all that is worth having in it and his contempt for material perfection has no longer any charm because it is not the sacrifice of a lower merit to a higher but the blank absence of the lower merit not compensated or condoned by the presence of anything nobler or better i have said that the intelligent bohemian is generally a man of small or moderate means whose object is to enjoy the best advantages not the most visible of riches in his view these advantages are leisure travel reading and conversation his estimate is different from that of the philistine who sets his heart on the lower advantages of riches sacrificing leisure 
travel, reading, and conversation, in order to have a larger house and more servants. But how, without riches, is the Bohemian to secure the advantages that he desires, for they also belong to riches? There lies the difficulty, and the Bohemian's way of overcoming it constitutes the romance of his existence. In absolute destitution, the intelligent Bohemian life is not possible. A little money is necessary for it, and the art and craft of Bohemianism is to get, for that small amount of money, such an amount of leisure, reading, travel, and good conversation as may suffice to make life interesting. The way in which an old-fashioned Bohemian usually set about it was this. He treated material comfort and outward appearances as matters of no consequence, accepting them when they came in his way, but enduring the privation of them gaily. He learned the art of living on a little. He spent the little that he had, first for what was really necessary, and next for what really gave him pleasure. But he spent hardly anything in deference to the usages of society. In this way he got what he wanted— his books were second-hand and ill-bound, but he had books and read them. His clothes were shabby, yet still kept him warm. He travelled in all sorts of cheap ways, and frequently on foot. He lived a good deal in some unfashionable quarters in a capital city, and saw much of art, nature, and humanity. To exemplify the true theory of Bohemianism, let me describe from memory two rooms, one of them inhabited by an English lady not at all Bohemian, the other by a German of the coarser sex, who was essentially and thoroughly Bohemian. The lady's room was not a drawing-room, being a reasonable sort of sitting-room, without any exasperating inutilities but it was extremely, excessively comfortable. Half hidden amongst its material comforts might be found a little rosewood bookcase containing a number of pretty volumes in purple Morocco that were seldom if ever opened. My German bohemian was a steady reader in six languages, and if he had seen such a room as that, he would probably have criticized it as follows. He would have said, it is rich in superfluities, but has not what is necessary. The carpet is superfluous. Plain boards are quite comfortable enough. One or two cheap chairs and tables might replace this costly furniture. That pretty rosewood bookcase holds the smallest number of books at the greatest cost, and is therefore contrary to true economy. Give me rather a sufficiency of long deal shelves all innocent of paint. What is the use of fine bindings and gilt edges? This little library is miserably poor. It is all in one language, and does not represent even English literature adequately. There are a few novels, books of poems and travels, but I find neither science nor philosophy. Such a room as that, with all its comfort, would seem to me like a prison— my mind needs wider pastures. I remember his own room, a place to make a rich Englishman shudder. One climbed up to it by a stone corkscrew stair, half ruinous, in an old medieval house. It was a large room, with a bed in one corner, and it was wholly destitute of anything resembling a carpet or a curtain. The remaining furniture consisted of two or three rush-bottom chairs, one large cheap lounging chair, and two large plain tables. There were plenty of shelves, common deal, unpainted, and on them an immense litter of books in different languages, most of them in paper covers and bought second-hand, but in readable editions. In the way of material luxury there was a pot of tobacco and if a friend dropped in for an evening, a jug of ale would make its appearance. My bohemian was shabby in his dress and unfashionable, but he had seen more 
read more, and passed more hours in intelligent conversation than many who considered themselves his superiors. The entire material side of life had been systematically neglected, in his case, in order that the intellectual side might flourish. It is hardly necessary to observe that any attempt at luxury or visible comfort, any conformity to fashion, would have been incompatible, on small means, with the intellectual existence that this German scholar enjoyed. The class in which the higher bohemianism has most steadily flourished is the artistic and literary class, and here it is visible and recognizable because there is often poverty enough to compel the choice between the objects of the intelligent bohemian and those of ordinary men. The early life of Goldsmith, for example, was that of a genuine bohemian. He had scarcely any money, and yet he contrived to get for himself what the intelligent bohemian always desires— namely, leisure to read and think, travel and interesting conversation. When penniless and unknown, he lounged about the world thinking and observing. He travelled in Holland, France, Switzerland, and Italy, not as people do in railway carriages, but in leisurely intercourse with the inhabitants. Notwithstanding his poverty, he was received by the learned in different European cities, and notably heard Voltaire and Diderot talk till three o'clock in the morning. So long as he remained faithful to the true principles of bohemianism, he was happy in his own strange and eccentric way, and all the anxieties, all the slavery of his later years, were due to his apostasy from those principles. He no longer estimated leisure at its true value, when he allowed himself to be placed in such a situation that he was compelled to toil like a slave in order to clear off work that had been already paid for such advances having been rendered necessary by expenditure on philistine luxuries he no longer enjoyed humble travel but on his later tour in france with mrs horneck and her two beautiful daughters instead of enjoying the country in his own old simple innocent way he allowed his mind to be poisoned with philistine ideas and constantly complained of the want of physical comfort though he lived far more expensively than in his youth the new apartments taken on the success of the good-natured men consisted says irving of three rooms which he furnished with mahogany sofas card-tables and bookcases with curtains mirrors and wilton carpets at the same time he went even beyond the precept of Polonius, for his garments were costlier than his purse could buy, and his entertainments were so extravagant as to give pain to his acquaintances. All this is a desertion of real bohemian principles. Goldsmith ought to have protected his own leisure, which, from the bohemian point of view, was incomparably more precious to himself than Wilton carpets and coats of Tyrian bloom. Corot, the French landscape painter, was a model of consistent bohemianism of the best kind. When his father said, You shall have eighty pounds a year, your plate at my table, and be a painter, or you shall have four thousand pounds to start with, if you will be a shopkeeper. His choice was made at once. He remained always faithful to true bohemian principles, fully understanding the value of leisure, and protecting his artistic independence by the extreme simplicity of his living. He never gave way to the modern rage for luxuries, but in his latter years, when enriched by tardy professional success and hereditary fortune, he employed his money in acts of fraternal generosity to enable others to lead the intelligent bohemian life. Wordsworth had in him a very strong element of bohemianism. 
his long pedestrian rambles, his interest in humble life and familiar intercourse with the poor, his passion for wild nature and preference of natural beauty to fine society, his simple and economical habits are enough to reveal the tendency. His plain living and high thinking is a thoroughly bohemian idea, in striking opposition to the Philistine passion for rich living and low thinking. There is a story that he was seen at a breakfast table to cut open a new volume with a greasy butter knife. To every lover of books this must seem horribly barbarous, yet at the same time it was bohemian, in that Wordsworth valued the thought only and cared nothing for the material condition of the volume. I have observed a like indifference to the material condition of books in other bohemians who took the most lively interest in their contents. I have also seen bibliophiles who had beautiful libraries in excellent preservation and who loved to fondle fine copies of books that they never read. That is Philistine. It is the preference of material perfection to intellectual values. Some practical experience of the higher bohemianism is a valuable part of education. It enables us to estimate things at their true worth, and to extract happiness from situations in which the Philistine is both dull and miserable. A true bohemian of the best kind knows the value of mere shelter, of food enough to satisfy hunger, of plain clothes that will keep him sufficiently warm, and in the things of the mind he values the liberty to use his own faculties as a kind of happiness in itself. His philosophy leads him to take an interest in talking with human beings of all sorts and conditions, and in different countries. He does not despise the poor, for whether poor or rich in his own person, he understands simplicity of life, and if the poor man lives in a small cottage, he too has probably been lodged less spaciously still in some small hut or tent. He has lived often in rough travel as the poor live every day. I maintain that such tastes and experiences are valuable both in prosperity and in adversity. If we are prosperous, they enhance our appreciation of the things around us, and yet at the same time make us really know that they are not indispensable, as so many believe them to be. If we fall into adversity, they prepare us to accept lightly and cheerfully what would be depressing privations to others. End of section 22。section 23 of the Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Chris Pyle. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. Alexander Hamilton, 1757 to 1804, by Daniel C. Gilman. Hamilton's distinction among the founders of the government of the United States is everywhere acknowledged. Washington stands alone. Next to him, in the rank with Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Jay, and Sherman, Alexander Hamilton is placed. Among these illustrious men, no claim could surpass Hamilton's. He was a gallant soldier, an eloquent orator, a persuasive writer, a skillful financier, a successful administrator, and a political philosopher practical as well as wise. He is worthy to be compared in political debate with Pitt, Burke, Fox, and Webster, in organization with Caber and Bismarck, in finance with Sully, Colbert, Robert Morris, and Gladstone. My three friends said Guizot to a young American many years ago, pointing to three portraits which hung upon the walls of his library, Aberdeen, Hamilton, and Washington. Even his opponents acknowledged his powers. 
Thus Jefferson called Hamilton the Colossus of the Federalists. And Ambrose Spencer said he was the greatest man this country ever produced. James Kent, an admirer, used terms of more discriminating praise. Alabone has collected similar tributes from Talleyrand, Guizot, and Governor Morris, Story, and Webster. Yet Hamilton was severely criticized during his life by his political enemies, and he encountered attacks from the newspapers as severe as those which befall any of our contemporaries. Lodge says of him that he was preeminently a leader of leaders. He could do the thinking of his time. No single sentence could express more completely the distinction of his genius. He could do the thinking of his time. Fortunately, a good deal of the thinking of his time is now irrevocably fixed in the Constitution, the laws, the administration, and the institutions of this country. And the name of Hamilton now stands above reproach among the immortals. His public life began precociously and ended prematurely. Before he was of age, his powers were acknowledged and his reputation was established. Before he was fifty, all was over. Born in Nevis, one of the smallest of the West Indies, the son of a Scotch merchant and a French mother, he was sent to this country for his education, and unprotected by family ties with small pecuniary resources, he entered Columbia College, New York, in 1774. From that time onward, for thirty years, he was pushed forward to one influential station after another, and he was adequate to the highest of them all. Beginning his military service as a captain of artillery, he was soon afterwards aide-de-camp and secretary to General Washington, with the rank of lieutenant colonel. At a much later period of his life, 1797, he was commissioned as a major general and served two years as a specter general at the head of the United States Army. In political life, he was always prominent, first as a receiver of continental taxes, then successively as a member of the Continental Congress, 1782, the New York Legislature, 1786, the Annapolis Convention, 1786, and finally the Constitutional Convention, and of the ratifying convention in New York. Equal but hardly greater service was rendered to the country by this extraordinary patriot in the Treasury Department of the United States, of which he was secretary for five years under Washington, from 1789 to 1794. The memoirs of Hamilton have been edited by several hands. Shortly after his death, three volumes of his works were printed. Subsequently, John C. Hamilton, the son, published a memoir in two volumes, and many years later he wrote in seven volumes a history of the United States as it may be read in the writings of Alexander Hamilton. A complete edition of Hamilton's works was edited by Henry Cabot Lodge in nine octavo volumes. In addition to the memoir just referred to, by J.C. Hamilton, there were several biographies, of which the most recent and valuable are those by John T. Morse, Jr., two volumes, 1876, Henry Cabot Lodge, American Statesman Series, 1882, and George Shea, second edition, 1880. All the standard histories of the United States, Bancroft, Hildreth, Schuler, Van Holst, Curtis, Fisk, etc., may be consulted advantageously. It is easy to form an image of the person of Hamilton, for there are several portraits in oil and a bust in marble by Giuseppe Siracci, besides the Talleyrand miniature. All these have been frequently engraved, but as valuable in another way is the description by Judge Shea of Hamilton's personal appearance, as it was remembered by some that knew and one that loved him. This sketch is so good that it would be a pity to abridge it. He was, said Judge Shea, a small, lithe figure, indistinct with life, erect and steady in gait, a military presence without the intolerable accuracy of a martinet, and his general address was graceful and nervous, indicating the beauty, energy, and activity of his mind. A bright, ruddy complexion, light-colored hair, a mouth infinite in expression, its sweet smile being most observable and most spoken of eyes lustrous with meaning and reflection, or glancing with quick, canny pleasantry, and the whole countenance decidedly Scottish, in form and expression. He was, as may be inferred, the welcome guest and cheery companion of all relations of civil and social life. His political enemies frankly spoke of his manner and conversation, and regretted its irresistible charm. 
He certainly had a correct sense of that which is appropriate to the occasion and its object, the attribute which we call good taste. His manner, with a natural change, became very calm and grave when deliberation and public care claimed his whole attention. At the time of which we now speak particularly, 1787, he was continually brooding over the state convention then at hand. Moods of engrossing thought came upon him even as he trod the crowded streets, and then his pace would become slower, his head be slightly bent downward, and with hands joined together behind he wended his way, his lips moving in concert with the thoughts forming in his mind. This habit of thinking, and this attitude, became involuntary with him as he grew in years. But without these portraits, it would be easy to discover in the incidents of Hamilton's life the characteristics of a gallant, independent, high-spirited man, who never shrunk from danger, and who placed the public interests above all private considerations. At times he was rash and unexpected, but his rashness was the result of swift and accurate reasoning and of unswerving will. His integrity was faultless and bore the severest scrutiny, sometimes under circumstances of stress. We can easily imagine that such a brave and honest knight would have been welcome to a seat at the round table of King Arthur. Recall his career. A mere boy, he leaves his West Indies home to get a college education in this country. Princeton, for technical reasons, would not receive him, and he proceeds at once, and not in vain, to the halls of King's College, now known as Columbia. Just after entering college, he goes to a mass meeting of the citizens in the open fields near the city of New York, and not quite satisfied with the arguments there set forth, he mounts the platform and, after a slight hesitation, carries with him the entire assembly. When the Revolutionary War begins, he enlists at once and takes part in the Battle of Long Island. The consequent retreat to White Plains, and the contest at Trenton and Princeton, he makes a brilliant assault upon the enemy's redoubts at Yorktown, while on the staff of Washington, a reproof from the general cuts him to the quick, and on the instant he says, We part, and so retires from military service. His standing at the bar of New York is that of a leader. When the Constitutional Convention assembles, he takes part in its deliberations, and though not entirely satisfied with the conclusions reached, he accepts them, and becomes with Jay and Madison one of the chief exponents and defenders of the new Constitution. Under Washington as president, he is placed in charge of the national finances and soon establishes the public credit on the basis which has never since been shaken. Low creatures endeavor to blackmail him and circulate scandalous stories respecting his financial management. He bravely tells the whole truth and stands absolutely acquitted of the least suspicion of official malfeasance. In 1799, when war with France is imminent, Washington, again selected as commander-in-chief, selects him as the first of three major generals on whom he must depend. Finally, when Aaron Burr challenges him, he accepts the challenge. He makes his will, meets his enemy, and falls with a mortal wound. The news of his death sent a thrill of horror through the country not unlike that which followed the assassination of Lincoln and Garfield. The story of the duel has often been told, but nowhere so vividly as in the diary of Governor Morris, recently published. His countrymen mourned the death of Hamilton as they had mourned for no other statesman except Washington. Morris's speech at the funeral, under circumstances of great popular excitement, brings to mind the speech of Brutus over the body of Caesar. Unless there had been great restraint on the part of the orator, the passions of the multitude would have been inflamed against the rival who fired the fatal shot. It is time to pass from that which is transient in Hamilton's life, to that which will endure as long as this government shall last, to the ideas suggested and embodied by the framers of the Constitution and fundamental measures. The distinction of Hamilton does not depend upon the stations that he held, however exalted they may appear, in either the political or the military service of his country. It was his thinking that made him famous, his thinking that perpetuated his influence as well as his fame, through the nine decades that have followed since his death. Even now, when his personality is obscurely remembered, his political doctrines are more firmly established than ever before. The adjustment of the democratic principles, of which Jefferson was the exponent, and the national principles which Hamilton advocated still prevails, but as Morris sagaciously says, the democratic system of Jefferson is administered in the form and on the principles of Hamilton. 
In the anxious days of the Confederation, when the old government had been thrown off, and when men were groping with conflicting motives, after a new government which should secure union with independence, national or continental authority with the preservation of state rights, Hamilton was one of the earliest to perceive the true solution to the problem. He bore his part in the debates, always inclining toward a strong federal government. The conclusions which were reached by the convention did not meet his unqualified assent, but he accepted them as the best results that could then be secured. He became their expounder and their defender. The essays which he wrote, with those of his two colleagues, Jay and Madison, were collected in a volume known as The Federalist, a volume which is of the first importance in the interpretation of the Constitution of the United States. Successive generations of judges, senators, statesmen, and publicists recur to its pages as to a commentary of the highest value. The opinion of Mr. Curtis, the historian of the Constitution, will not be questioned. These essays, he says, gave birth to American constitutional law, which was thus placed above arbitrary construction and brought into the domain of legal truth. They made it a science, and so long as the Constitution shall exist, they will continue to be resorted to as the most important source of contemporaneous interpretation which the annals of the country afford. Hamilton's confidence and the power of the press to enlighten and guide the public were balanced by grave apprehensions as to the fate of the Constitution. A nation, he said, without a national government is an awful spectacle. The establishment of a Constitution, in a time of profound peace, by the voluntary consent of a whole people, is a prodigy to the completion of which I look forward with trembling anxiety. We who have lived to see the end of a century of constitutional government, in the course of which appeal has been made to the sword, we who live secure in the unique advantages of our dual governments, find it hard even to imagine the rocks through which the ship of state was steered by the framers of the Constitution. As a financier, not less than as a statesman, Hamilton showed exceptional ability. He had the rare qualities of intellect which enabled him to perceive the legitimate sources of revenue, the proper conditions of national credit, and the best method of distributing over a term of years the payment required by the emergencies of the state. Commerce and trade were palsied, currency was wanting, confidence was shaken, councils were conflicting. These difficulties were like a stimulant to the mind of Hamilton. He mastered the situation, he proposed remedies, he secured support, he restored credit. From his time to the present, in peace and war, notwithstanding temporary embarrassments and occasional panics, the finances of the government have been sound, and its obligations accepted wherever offered. In the long line of honest and able secretaries who have administered the Treasury, Hamilton stands as the first and greatest financier. His ability was not alone that of a reasoner upon the principles of political economy. He was ingenious and wise in devising methods by which principles may be reduced to practice. The Treasury Department was to be organized. Hamilton became the organizer. While Congress imposed upon him the duty of preparing far-reaching plans for the creation of revenue, which he produced with promptness and sagacity, he also found time to devise the complex machinery that was requisite and the system of accounts. So well were these tasks performed, says Morris, that the plans still subsist, developing and growing with the nation, but at the bottom the original arrangements of Hamilton. This administrative ability was shown on a large scale, the second time, but in another field, when it became necessary in view of a foreign war that seemed impending to organize an army. It was Washington who called to this service his former comrade-in-arms, the man who had organized the Treasury at the beginning of his first administration. Here, as before, Hamilton's abilities were employed successfully. The limits of this article preclude the enumeration of Hamilton's services in many subordinate ways, for example his influence in securing the acceptance of the treaty with England. It is enough, in conclusion, to repeat the words of two great thinkers. Daniel Webster spoke as follows in 1831. He was made Secretary of the Treasury, and how he fulfilled the duties of such a place at such a time, the whole country perceived with delight and the whole world saw with admiration. He smote the rock of the national resources, and abundant streams of revenue gushed forth. He touched the dead corpse of the public credit, and it sprung upon its feet. The fabled birth of Minerva from the brain of Jove was hardly more sudden or more perfect than the financial system of the United States, 
as it burst forth from the conceptions of Alexander Hamilton. And Francis Lieber, in his Civil Liberty and Self-Government, wrote thus in 1853, The framers of our Constitution boldly conceived a federal republic, or the application of the representative principle, with its two houses, to a confederacy. It was the first instance in history. The Netherlands, which served our forefathers as models in many respects, even the name bestowed on our confederacy, furnished them with no example for this great conception. It is the chief American contribution to the common treasures of political civilization. It is that by which America will influence other parts of the world, more than by any other political institution or principle. I consider the mixture of wisdom and daring shown in the framing of our Constitution as one of the most remarkable facts in all history. End of section 23「Section 24 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Chris Pyle. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. Selected Writings of Alexander Hamilton. From the Federalist. Defense of his views of the Constitution. Thus have I, fellow citizens, executed the task I had assigned to myself. With what success, your conduct must determine. I trust at least you will admit that I have not failed in the assurance I gave you respecting the spirit with which my endeavors should be conducted. I have addressed myself purely to your judgments, and have studiously avoided those asperities which are too apt to disgrace political disputants of all parties and which have been not a little provoked by the language and conduct of the opponents of the Constitution. The charge of a conspiracy against the liberties of the people, which has been indiscriminately brought against the advocates of the plan, has something in it too wanton and too malignant not to excite the indignation of every man who feels in his own bosom a refutation of the calumny. The perpetual changes which have been rung upon the wealthy, the well-born, and the great, have been such as to inspire the disgust of all sensible men, and the unwarrantable concealments and misrepresentations which have been in various ways practiced to keep the truth from the public eye have been of a nature to demand the reprobation of all honest men. It is not impossible that these circumstances may have occasionally betrayed me into intemperances of expression which I did not intend. It is certain that I have frequently felt a struggle between sensibility and moderation, and if the former has in some instances prevailed, it must be my excuse that it has been neither often nor much. The Wisdom of Brief Presidential Terms of Office It may perhaps be asked how the shortness of the duration in office can affect the independence of the executive on the legislature, unless the one were possessed of the power of appointing or displacing the other. One answer to this inquiry may be drawn from the principle already remarked, that is, from the slender interest a man is apt to take in a short-lived advantage, and the little inducement it affords him to expose himself, on account of it, to any considerable inconvenience or hazard. Another answer, perhaps more obvious, though not more conclusive, will result from the consideration of the influence of the legislative body over the people, which might be employed to prevent the re-election of a man who, by an upright resistance to any sinister project of that body, should have made himself obnoxious to its resentment. It may be asked also whether a duration of four years would answer the end proposed, and if it would not, whether a less period, which would at least be recommended by greater security against ambitious designs, would not for that reason be preferable to a longer period, which was at the same time too short for the purpose of inspiring the desired firmness and independence of the magistrate. It cannot be affirmed that a duration of four years, or any other limited duration, would completely answer the end proposed, but it would contribute toward it in a degree which would have a material influence upon the spirit and character of the government. Between the commencement and termination of such a period, there would always be a considerable interval, in which the prospect of annihilation would be sufficiently remote not to have an improper effect upon the conduct of a man endued with a tolerable portion of fortitude, and in which he might reasonably promise himself that there will be time enough before it arrived to make the community sensible of the propriety of the measures he might incline to pursue. 
though it be probable that, as he approached the moment when the public were by a new election to signify their sense of his conduct, his confidence, and with it his firmness, would decline. Yet both the one and the other would derive support from the opportunities which his previous continuance in the station had afforded him of establishing himself in the esteem and goodwill of his constituents. He might then hazard with safety in proportion to the proofs he had given of his wisdom and integrity, and to the title he had acquired to the respect and attachment of his fellow citizens. As on the one hand a duration of four years will contribute to the firmness of the executive in a sufficient degree to render it a very valuable ingredient in the composition, so on the other it is not enough to justify any alarm for the public liberty. If a British House of Commons, from the most feeble beginnings, from the mere power of assenting or disagreeing to the imposition of a new tax, had by rapid strides reduced the prerogatives of the crown, and the privileges of nobility within the limits they conceived to be compatible with the principles of a free government, while they raised themselves to the rank and consequence of a co-equal branch of the legislature, if they had been able in one instance to abolish both the royalty and the aristocracy, and to overturn all the ancient establishments as well in the church as state, if they have been able on a recent occasion to make the monarch tremble at the prospect of an innovation attempted by them, what would be to be feared from an elective magistrate of four years' duration with the confined authorities of a President of the United States? What, but that he might be unequal to the task which the Constitution assigns him, of the distinction between a President and a Sovereign? And it appears yet more unequivocally that there is no pretense for the parallel which has been attempted between him and the King of Great Britain. But to render the contrast in this respect still more striking, it may be of use to throw the principal circumstances of dissimilitude into a closer group. The President of the United States would be an officer elected by the people for four years. The King of Great Britain is a perpetual and hereditary prince. The one would be amenable to personal punishment and disgrace. The person of the other is sacred and inviolable. The one would have a qualified negative upon the acts of the legislative body. The other has an absolute negative. The one would have a right to command the military and naval forces of the nation. The other, in addition to this right, possesses that of declaring war, and of raising and regulating fleets and armies by his own authority. The one would have a concurrent power with a branch of the legislature in the formation of treaties. The other is the sole possessor of the power of making treaties. The one would have a like concurrent authority in appointing to offices. The other is the sole author of all appointments. The one can offer no privileges whatever. The other can make denizens of aliens, noblemen of commoners, can erect corporations with all the rights incident to corporate bodies. The one can prescribe no rules concerning the commerce or currency of the nation. The other is in several respects the arbiter of commerce, and in this capacity can establish markets and fairs, can regulate weights and measures, can lay embargoes, for a limited time, can coin money, can authorize or prohibit the circulation of foreign coin. The one has no particle of spiritual jurisdiction. The other is the supreme head and governor of the national church. What answer shall we give to those who would persuade us that things so unlike resemble each other? The same that ought to be given to those who tell us that a government, the whole power of which would be in the hands of the elective and periodical servants of the people, is an aristocracy, a monarchy, and a despotism. The Militia System as Distinguished from a Standing Army Were I to deliver my sentiments to a member of the Federal Legislature from this State on the subject of a militia establishment, I should hold to him in substance the following discourse. The project of disciplining all the militia of the United States is as futile as it would be injurious, if it were capable of being carried into execution. A tolerable expertness in military movements is a business that requires time and practice. It is not a day or even a week that will suffice for the attainment of it. To oblige the great body of the yeomanry, and of the other classes of the citizens, to be under arms for the purpose of going through military exercises and evolutions, as often as might be necessary to acquire the degree of perfection, which would entitle them to the character of a well-regulated militia, would be a real grievance to the people, and a serious public inconvenience and loss. It would form an annual deduction from the productive labor of the country, to an amount which, calculating upon the present numbers of the people, 
would not fall far short of the whole expense of the civil establishments of all the states. To attempt a thing which would abridge the mass of labor and industry to so considerable an extent would be unwise, and the experiment, if made, could not succeed, because it would not long be endured. Little more can reasonably be aimed at, with respect to the people at large, than to have them properly armed and equipped. And in order to see that this be not neglected, it will be necessary to assemble them once or twice in the course of a year. But though the scheme of disciplining the whole nation must be abandoned as mischievous or impractical, yet it is a matter of the utmost importance that a well-digested plan should as soon as possible be adopted for the proper establishment of the militia. The attention of the government ought particularly to be directed to the formation of a select corps of moderate extent, upon such principles as will really fit them for service in case of need. By thus circumscribing the plan, it will be possible to have an excellent body of well-trained militia, ready to take the field whenever the defense of the state shall require it. This will not only lessen the call for military establishments, but if circumstances should at any time oblige the government to form an army of any magnitude, that army can never be formidable to the liberties of the people. While there is a large body of citizens, little if at all inferior to them in discipline and the use of arms, who stand ready to defend their own rights and those of their fellow citizens. This appears to me the only substitute that can be devised for a standing army, and the best possible security against it if it should exist. Confederacy is expressed in the federal system. Though the ancient feudal systems were not, strictly speaking, confederacies, yet they partook of the nature of that species of association. There was a common head, chieftain or sovereign, whose authority extended over the whole nation, and a number of subordinate vassals or feudatories, who had large portions of land allotted to them and numerous trains of inferior vassals or retainers who occupied and cultivated that land upon the tenure of fealty or obedience to the persons of whom they held it. Each principal vassal was a kind of sovereign within his particular demence. The consequences of the situation were a continual opposition to the authority of the sovereign, and frequent wars between the great barons or chief feudatories themselves. The power of the head of the nation was commonly too weak either to preserve the public peace or to protect the people against the oppressions of their immediate lords. This period of European affairs is emphatically styled by historians the times of feudal anarchy. When the sovereign happened to be a man of vigorous and warlike temper and of superior abilities, he would acquire personal weight and influence which answered for the time the purposes of a more regular authority. But in general, the power of the barons triumphed over that of the prince, and in many instances his dominion was entirely thrown off, and the great fiefs were erected into independent principalities or states. In those instances in which the monarch finally prevailed over his vassals, his success was chiefly owing to the tyranny of those vassals over their dependents. The barons or nobles, equally the enemies of the sovereign and the oppressors of the common people, were dreaded and detested by both, till mutual danger and mutual interest effected a union between them fatal to the power of the aristocracy. Had the nobles, by a conduct of clemency and justice, preserved the fidelity and devotion of their retainers and followers, the contest between them and the prince must almost always have ended in their favor, and in the abridgment or subversion of the royal authority. This is not an assertion founded merely in speculation or conjecture. Among other illustrations of its truth, which might be cited, Scotland will furnish a cogent example. The spirit of clanship, which was at an early day introduced into that kingdom, uniting the nobles and their dependents by ties, equivalent to those of kindred, rendered the aristocracy a constant overmatch for the power of the monarch, till the incorporation with England subdued its fierce and ungovernable spirit and reduced it within those rules of subordination, which a more rational and more energetic system of civil polity had previously established in the latter kingdom. The separate governments in a confederacy may aptly be compared with the feudal baronies, with this advantage in their favor, that from the reasons already explained they will generally possess the confidence and good will of the people, and with so important a support, will be able effectually to oppose all encroachments of the national government of the geographical aspects of the United States as related to its commerce. The relative situation of these states, the number of rivers with which they are intersected, and of bays that wash their shores, 
the facility of communication in every direction, the affinity of language and manners, the familiar habits of intercourse. All these are circumstances that would conspire to render an illicit trade between them a matter of little difficulty, and would ensure frequent evasions of the commercial regulations of each other. The separate states or confederacies would be necessitated by mutual jealousy to avoid the temptations to that kind of trade by the lowness of their duties. The temper of our governments, for a long time to come, would not permit those rigorous precautions by which the European nations guard the avenues into their respective countries, as well by land as by water, and which even there are found insufficient obstacles to the adventurous stratagems of avarice. In France there is an army of patrols, as they are called, constantly employed to secure their fiscal regulations against the inroads of the dealers in contraband trade. Mr. Necker computes the number of these patrols at upwards of 20,000. This shows the immense difficulty in preventing that species of traffic, where there is an inland communication, and places in a strong light the disadvantages with which the collection of duties in this country would be encumbered, if by disunion the states should be placed in a situation with respect to each other, resembling that of France with respect to her neighbors. The arbitrary and vexatious powers with which the patrols are necessarily armed will be intolerable in a free country. If, on the contrary, there be but one government pervading all the states, there will be, as to the principal part of our commerce, but one side to guard, the Atlantic coast. Vessels arriving directly from foreign countries, laden with valuable cargoes, would rarely choose to hazard themselves to the complicated and critical perils which would attend attempts to unlaid prior to their coming into port. They would have to dread both the dangers of the coast and of detection, as well after as before their arrival at the places of their final destination. An ordinary degree of vigilance would be competent to the prevention of any material infractions upon the rights of the revenue. A few armed vessels, judiciously stationed at the entrances of our ports, might at a small expense be made useful sentinels of the laws, and the government, having the same interest to provide against violations everywhere, the cooperation of its measures in each state would have a powerful tendency to render them effectual. Here also we should preserve, by union, an advantage which nature holds out to us and which would be relinquished by separation. The United States lie at a great distance from Europe, and at a considerable distance from all other places, with which they would have extensive connections of foreign trade. The passage from them to us in a few hours, or in a single night, as between the coasts of France and Britain, and of other neighboring nations, would be impracticable. This is a prodigious security against the direct contraband with foreign countries. But a circuitous contraband to one state, through the medium of another, will be both easy and safe. The difference between a direct importation from abroad and an indirect importation to the channel of a neighboring state in small parcels, according to time and opportunity, with the additional facilities of inland communication, must be palpable to every man of discernment. It is therefore evident that one national government would be able, at much less expense, to extend the duties on imports beyond comparison further than would be practicable to the states separately or to any partial confederacies. The standing army as a peril to a republic. The disciplined armies, always kept on foot on the continent of Europe, though they bear a malignant aspect to liberty and economy, have notwithstanding been productive of the signal advantage of rendering sudden conquest impracticable, and of preventing that rapid desolation which used to mark the progress of war prior to their introduction. The art of fortification has contributed to the same ends. The nations of Europe are encircled with chains of fortified places, which mutually obstruct invasion. Campaigns are wasted in reducing two or three frontier garrisons to gain admittance into an enemy's country. Similar impediments occur at every step to exhaust the strength and delay the progress of an invader. Formerly, an invading army would penetrate into the heart of a neighboring country almost as soon as intelligence of its approach could be received. But now a comparatively small force of disciplined troops, acting on the defensive with the aid of posts, is able to impede and finally to frustrate the enterprises of one much more considerable. The history of war in that quarter of the globe is no longer a history of nations subdued and empires overturned, but of towns taken and retaken, of battles that decide nothing, of retreats more beneficial than victories, 
of much effort and little acquisition. In this country, the scene would be altogether reversed. The jealousy of military establishments would postpone them as long as possible. The want of fortifications leaving the frontiers of one state open to another would facilitate inroads. The populous states would, with little difficulty, overrun their less populous neighbors. Conquest would be as easy to be made as difficult to be retained. War, therefore, would be desultory and predatory. Plunder and devastation ever march in the train of irregulars. The calamities of individuals would make the principal figure in the events which would characterize our military exploits. This picture is not too highly wrought, though I confess it would not long remain a just one. Safety from external danger is the most powerful dictator of national conduct. Even the ardent love of liberty will, after a time, give way to its dictates. The violent destruction of life and property incident to war, the continual effort and alarm attendant on a state of continual danger, will compel nations the most attached to liberty to resort, for repose and security, to institutions which have a tendency to destroy their civil and political rights. To be more safe, they at length become willing to run the risk of being less free. The institutions chiefly alluded to are standing armies, and the correspondent appendages of military establishments. Standing armies, it is said, are not provided against in the new Constitution, and it is therefore inferred that they may exist under it. Their existence, however, from the very terms of the proposition, is a most problematical and uncertain. But standing armies, it may be replied, must inevitably result from a dissolution of the Confederacy. Frequent war and constant apprehension, which require a state of as constant preparation, will infallibly produce them. The weaker states or confederacies would at first have recourse to them to put themselves upon an equality with their more potent neighbors. They would endeavor to supply the inferiority of population and resources by a more regular and effective system of defense, by disciplined troops, and by fortifications. They would at the same time be necessitated to strengthen the executive arm of government, in doing which their constitutions would acquire a progressive direction towards monarchy. It is of the nature of war to increase the executive at the expense of the legislative authority. The expedients, which have been mentioned, would soon give the states or confederacies that made use of them a superiority over their neighbors. Small states, or states of less natural strength, under vigorous governments and with the assistance of disciplined armies, have often triumphed over large states, or states of greater natural strength, which have been destitute of these advantages. Neither the pride nor the safety of the more important states or confederacies would permit them long to submit to this mortifying and adventitious superiority. They would quickly resort to means similar to those by which it had been effected, to reinstate themselves in their lost preeminence. Thus we should, in a little time, see established in every part of this country the same engines of despotism, which have been the scourge of the old world. This at least would be the natural course of things, and our reasonings will be the more likely to be just, in proportion as they are accommodated to this standard. Do Republics Promote Peace? Notwithstanding the concurring testimony of experience in this particular, there are still to be found visionary or designing men who stand ready to advocate the paradox of perpetual peace between the states, though dismembered and alienated from each other. The genius of republics, say they, is pacific. The spirit of commerce has a tendency to soften the manners of men and to extinguish those inflammable humors which have so often kindled into wars. Commercial republics like ours will never be disposed to waste themselves in ruinous contentions with each other. They will be governed by mutual interest, and will cultivate a spirit of mutual amity and concord. Is it not, we may ask these projectors in politics, the true interest of all nations to cultivate the same benevolent and philosophic spirit? If this be their true interest, have they in fact pursued it? Has it not, on the contrary, invariably been found that momentary passions and immediate interests have a more active and imperious control over human conduct than general or remote considerations of policy, utility, or justice. Have republics, in practice, been less addicted to war than monarchies? Are not the former administered by men as well as the latter? Are there not aversions, predilections, rivalships, and desires of unjust acquisitions, 
that affect nations as well as kings? Are not popular assemblies frequently subject to the impulses of rage, resentment, jealousy, avarice, and of other irregular and violent propensities? Is it not well known that their determinations are often governed by a few individuals in whom they place confidence, and are of course liable to be tinctured by the passions and views of those individuals? Has commerce hitherto done anything more than change the objects of war? Is not the love of wealth as domineering and enterprising a passion as that of power or glory? Have there not been as many wars founded upon commercial motives, since that has become the prevailing system of nations, as were before occasioned by the cupidity of territory or dominion? Has not the spirit of commerce in many instances administered new incentives to the appetite both for the one and for the other? Let experience, the least fallible guide of human opinions, be appealed to for an answer to these inquiries. Sparta, Athens, Rome, and Carthage were all republics, two of them, Athens and Carthage, of the commercial kind. Yet were they as often engaged in wars, offensive and defensive, as the neighboring monarchies of the same times. Sparta was little better than a well-regulated camp, and Rome was never sated of carnage and conquest. Carthage, though a commercial republic, was the aggressor in the very war that ended in her destruction. Hannibal had carried her arms into the heart of Italy and to the gates of Rome, for Scipio, in turn, gave him an overthrow in the territories of Carthage and made a conquest of the commonwealth. Venice, in later times, figured more than once in wars of ambition, till, becoming an object of terror to the other Italian states, Pope Julius II found means to accomplish that formidable league which gave a deadly blow to the power and pride of this haughty republic. The provinces of Holland, till they were overwhelmed in debts and taxes, took a leading and conspicuous part in the wars of Europe. They had furious contests with England for the dominion of the sea, and were among the most persevering and most implacable of the opponents of Louis the Fourteenth. In the government of Britain the representatives of the people composed one branch of the national legislature, Commerce has been for ages the predominant pursuit of that country. Few nations, nevertheless, have been more frequently engaged in war, and the wars in which the kingdom has been engaged have in numerous instances proceeded from the people. There have been, if I may so express it, almost as many popular as royal wars. The cries of the nation and the importunities of their representatives have upon various occasions dragged their monarchs into war, or continued them in it, contrary to their inclinations, and sometimes contrary to the real interest of the state. In that memorable struggle for superiority between the rival houses of Austria and Bourbon, which so long kept Europe in a flame, it is well known that the antipathies of the English against the French, seconding the ambition, or rather the avarice of a favorite leader, protracted the war beyond the limits marked out by sound policy, and for a considerable time in opposition to the views of the court. The wars of these two last-mentioned nations have, in a great measure, grown out of commercial considerations. The desire of supplanting, and the fear of being supplanted, either in particular branches of traffic, or in the general advantages of trade and navigation. Personal Influence in National Politics The causes of hostility among nations are innumerable. There are some which have a general and almost constant operation upon the collective bodies of society. Of this description are the love of power, or the desire of preeminence and dominion, the jealousy of power, or the desire of equality and safety. There are others which have a more circumscribed, though an equally operative influence, within their spheres. Such are the rivalships and competitions of commerce between commercial nations. And there are others, not less numerous than either of the former which take their origin entirely in private passions, in the attachments, enmities, interests, hopes, and fears of leading individuals in the communities of which they are members. Men of this class, whether the favorites of a king or of a people, have in too many instances abused the confidence they possessed, and assuming the pretext of some public motive, have not scrupled to sacrifice the national tranquility to personal advantage or personal gratification. The celebrated Pyricles, in compliance with the resentment of a prostitute, at the expense of much of the blood and treasure of his countrymen, attacked, vanquished, and destroyed the city 
of the Samnians, the same man, stimulated by a private pique, against the Megarensians, another nation of Greece, or to avoid a prosecution with which he was threatened as an accomplice in a supposed theft of the statuary Phidias, or to get rid of the accusations prepared to be brought against him for dissipating the funds of the state in the purchase of popularity, or from a combination of all these causes, was the primitive author of that famous and fatal war distinguished in the Grecian annals by the name of the Peloponnesian War, which after various vicissitudes, intermissions, and renewals, terminated in the ruin of the Athenian commonwealth. The ambitious cardinal who was prime minister to Henry VIII, permitting his vanity to aspire to the triple crown, entertained hopes of succeeding in the acquisition of that splendid prize by the influence of the emperor Charles V. To secure the favor and interest of this enterprising and powerful monarch, he precipitated England to war with France, contrary to the plainest dictates of policy, and at the hazard of the safety and independence, as well of the kingdom over which he presided by his councils, as of Europe in general. For if there ever was a sovereign who bid fair to realize the project of universal monarchy, it was the Emperor Charles V, of whose intrigues Wolsey was at once the instrument and the dupe. The influence which the bigotry of one female, the petulance of another, and the cabals of a third, had in the contemporary policy, ferments, and pacifications of a considerable part of Europe, are topics that have been too often descanted upon not to be generally known. To multiply examples of the agency of personal considerations in the production of great national events, either foreign or domestic, according to their direction, would be an unnecessary waste of time. Those who have but a superficial acquaintance with the sources from which they are to be drawn will themselves recollect a variety of instances, and those who have a tolerable knowledge of human nature will not stand in need of such lights to form their opinion either of the reality or extent of that agency. Results of the Confederation We may indeed, with propriety, be said to have reached almost the last stage of national humiliation. There is scarcely anything that can wound the pride or degrade the character of an independent nation which we do not experience. Are there engagements to the performance of which we are held by every tie respectable among men? These are the subjects of constant and unblushing violation. Do we owe debts to foreigners and to our own citizens, contracted in a time of imminent peril for the preservation of our political existence? These remain without any proper or satisfactory provision for their discharge. Have we valuable territories and important posts in the possession of a foreign power, which, by express stipulations, ought long since to have been surrendered? These are still retained to the prejudice of our interests not less than of our rights. Are we in a condition to resent or to repel the aggression? We have neither troops, nor treasury, nor government. Are we even in a condition to remonstrate with dignity, the just imputations on our own faith, in respect to the same treaty, ought first to be removed? Are we entitled by nature and compact to a free participation in the navigation of the Mississippi? Spain excludes us from it. Is public credit an indispensable resource in time of public danger? We seem to have abandoned its cause as desperate and irretrievable. Is commerce of importance to national wealth? Ours is at the lowest point of declension. Is respectability in the eyes of foreign powers a safeguard against foreign encroachments? The imbecility of our government even forbids them to treat with us. Our ambassadors abroad are the mere pageants of mimic sovereignty. Is a violent and unnatural decrease in the value of land a symptom of national distress? The price of improved land in most parts of the country is much lower than can be accounted for by the quantity of waste land at market, and can only be fully explained by that want of private and public confidence which are so alarmingly prevalent among all ranks, and which have a direct tendency to depreciate property of every kind. Is private credit the friend and patron of industry? That most useful kind which relates to borrowing and lending is reduced within the narrowest limits, and this still more from an opinion of insecurity than from the scarcity of money. To shorten an enumeration of particulars which can afford neither pleasure nor instruction, it may in general be demanded. One indication is there of national disorder, poverty, and insignificance that could befall a community 
so peculiarly blessed with natural advantages as we are, which does not form a part of the dark catalogue of our public misfortunes. Instances of the Evils of State Sovereignty From such a parade of constitutional powers, in the representatives and head of this, the German, Confederacy, the national supposition would be that it must form an exception to the general character which belongs to its kindred systems. Nothing would be further from the reality. The fundamental principle on which it rests, that the empire is a community of sovereigns, that the diet is a representation of sovereigns, and that the laws are addressed to sovereigns, renders the empire a nerveless body, incapable of regulating its own members, insecure against external dangers, and agitated with unceasing fermentations in its own bowels. The history of Germany is a history of wars between the emperor and the princes and states themselves, of the licentiousness of the strong and the oppression of the weak, of foreign intrusions and foreign intrigues, of requisitions of men and money disregarded or partially complied with, of attempts to enforce them, altogether abortive or attended with slaughter and desolation, involving the innocent with the guilty, of general imbecility, confusion, and misery. In the 16th century, the emperor, with one part of the empire on his side, was seen engaged against the other princes and states. In one of the conflicts, the emperor himself was put to flight, and very near being made prisoner by the elector of Saxony. The late king of Prussia was more than once pitted against his imperial sovereign, and commonly proved an overmatch for him. Controversies and wars among the members themselves have been so common that the German annals are crowded with the bloody pages which describe them. Previous to the Peace of Westphalia, Germany was desolated by a war of thirty years, in which the emperor, with one half of the empire, was on one side, and Sweden, with the other half, on the opposite side. Peace was at length negotiated and dictated by foreign powers, and the articles of it, to which foreign powers are parties, made a fundamental part of the Germanic constitution. The impossibility of maintaining order and dispensing justice among these sovereign subjects produced the experiment of dividing the empire into nine or ten circles or districts, of giving them an interior organization, and of charging them with the military execution of the laws against delinquent and contumacious members. This experiment has only served to demonstrate more fully the radical vice of the Constitution. Each circle is the miniature picture of the deformities of this political monster. They either fail to execute their commissions, or they do it with all the devastation and carnage of civil war. Sometimes whole circles are defaulters, and then they increase the mischief which they were instituted to remedy. It may be asked, perhaps, what has so long kept this disjointed machine from falling entirely to pieces? The answer is obvious. The weakness of most of the members, who are unwilling to expose themselves to the mercy of foreign powers, the weakness of most of the principal members, compared with the formidable powers all around them, the vast weight and influence which the emperor derives from his separate and hereditary dominions, and the interest he feels in preserving a system with which his family pride is connected, and which constitutes him the first prince in Europe, these causes support a feeble and precarious union whilst the repellent quality incident to the nature of sovereignty, and which time continually strengthens, prevents any reform whatsoever, founded on a proper consolidation. Nor is it to be imagined, if this obstacle could be surmounted, that the neighboring powers would suffer a revolution to take place which would give to the empire the force and preeminence to which it is entitled. Foreign nations have long considered themselves as interested in the changes made by events in this constitution, it have on various occasions betrayed their policy of perpetuating its anarchy and weakness. If more direct examples were wanting, Poland, as a government over local sovereigns, might not improperly be taken notice of. Nor could any proof more striking be given of the calamities flowing from such institutions. Equally unfit for self-government and self-defense, it has long been at the mercy of its powerful neighbors, who have lately had the mercy to disburden it of one-third of its people and territories. End of section 24section 25 of library of the world's best literature ancient and modern volume 17 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org 
Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. Anthony Hamilton, approximately 1646 to 1720. The author of Grammont's memoirs, usually known as Count Hamilton, was a man without a nationality. Born in Ireland of Scotch blood, grandson of the Earl of Abercorn, he was a baby when his parents followed the relics of the royal family to France after the execution of Charles I, and he remained there till 1660, his education and formative influences during childhood being wholly French, which language was really his mother tongue. At the Restoration, he returned to England and became an ornament of Charles II's court, though debarred from office for being a Catholic. James II gave him command of an Irish regiment and made him governor of Limerick, but on James's abdication, he returned to France and remained there, a notable figure in Louis XIV's court, whose wit and elastic moral atmosphere were alike congenial to him. He made a good French translation of Pope's Essay on Man, cordially acknowledged by the author. He wrote graceful poems, and in ridicule of the prevalent craze for Oriental tales, which he declared quite within the powers of anyone with the slenderest literary faculty, wrote several stories of the Arabian Nights Order, without plot or denouement, usually promising to finish in the next volume, which was never written. These stories are clever and witty enough to be still read, and some of their expressions have become stock literary quotations, but they are curios rather than living works. More can be said for another work which has permanent vitality, the memoirs of his brother-in-law, the Duke of Grammont. The latter was a conspicuous soldier and courtier during the Regency, and Hamilton's senior by twenty years. This dashing, witty profligate, with generous impulses and no conscience, was a true product of the court of Louis the Fourteenth, and that of the English Charles the Second. An aristocrat of long descent, a soldier of renown, with his laughing eyes, his dimple, and his conversational gift, he was popular everywhere. Hamilton met him first in England, whither a social imprudence had led him, and where he became engaged to his biographer's beautiful sister. Then he was recalled and started for home, unmindful of his promises. The young lady's brothers hurried after him. Chevalier, Chevalier, haven't you forgotten something at London? I beg your pardon, gentlemen, said the Chevalier. I have forgotten to marry your sister. He went back with them, married Miss Hamilton, and took her to France. The incident is characteristic of his careless, ready wit, and it did not seem to weaken Hamilton's admiring affection. Grammont's prime quality was social talent. He loved extravagant living, intrigue, and bon moi, and the life that receives most stimulus from other personalities. To write as he conversed was impossible to him, yet he had been told that the record of his life was too interesting to be lost, and his vanity liked the thought. There was talk of giving the tasks to Boileau, who wanted it, but Boileau might be severe or satiric, so Hamilton was preferred. Hamilton, in spite of his knowledge of court life in France and England, and his somewhat malicious wit, was rather taciturn and unsuccessful as a society man. He loved better the quiet of St. Germain and solitary thoughtful constitutionals in the forest. To write was easier for him than to talk. He appreciated the life in which he did not shine and could do justice to the Duke's reminiscences. The result is a brilliant picture of the court of Charles II, of that pleasure-seeking king and the beauties and fascinations of his mistresses. There are many other scandalous tales as well, involving the Duke of Buckingham, Lord and Lady Chesterfield, Grimaud himself, and other celebrities. In spirit and style, the work is wholly French, a long succession of witty, malicious gossip. The author addresses himself in the opening sentence to those who read for amusements. To such, the memoirs are perennially interesting. Nothing Venture, Nothing Have, from Grammont's Memoirs. De Grammont and his friend, Monsieur Mata, being much pressed for money, the Count relates an incident of his early youth and suggests acting on its hint to raise the sum they require. 
They had never yet conferred about the state of their finances, although the steward had acquainted each separately that he must either receive money to continue the expenses or give in his accounts. One day when the chevalier came home sooner than usual, he found Mata fast asleep in an easy chair, and being unwilling to disturb his rest, he began musing on his project. Mata awoke without his perceiving it, and having for a short time observed the deep contemplation he seemed involved in, and the profound silence between two persons who had never before held their tongues for a moment when together, he broke it by a sudden fit of laughter, which increased in proportion as the others stared at him. A merry way of waking, and ludicrous enough, said the chevalier. What is the matter, and whom do you laugh at? Faith, Chevalier, said Mata, I am laughing at a dream I had just now, which is so natural and diverting that I must make you laugh at it also. I was dreaming that we had dismissed our maitre de hotel, our cook, and our confectioner, having resolved for the remainder of the campaign to live upon others as others have lived upon us. This was my dream. Now tell me, Chevalier, on what were you musing? Poor fellow, said the Chevalier, shrugging his shoulders. You are knocked down at once and thrown into the utmost consternation and despair at some silly stories which the maitre de hotel has been telling you as well as me. What, after the figure we have made in the face of the nobility and foreigners in the army, shall we give it up and, like fools and beggars, sneak off upon the first failure of our money? Have you no sentiments of honor? Where is the dignity of France? And where is the money, said Mata? For my men say the devil may take them if there be ten crowns in the house, and I believe you have not much more, for it is above a week since I have seen you pull out your purse and count your money, an amusement you are very fond of in prosperity. I own all this, said the Chevalier, but yet I will force you to confess that you are but a mean-spirited fellow upon this occasion. What would have become of you if you had been reduced to the situation I was in at Lyon four days before I arrived here? I will tell you the story. When I returned to my mother's house, I had so much the air of a courtier and a man of the world that she began to respect me instead of chiding me for my infatuation towards the army. I became her favorite, and finding me inflexible, she only thought of keeping me with her as long as she could while my little equipage was preparing. The faithful Brennan, who had to attend me as valet de chambre, was likewise to discharge the office of governor in equerry, being perhaps the only Gaskin who was ever possessed of so much gravity and ill temper. He passed his word for my good behavior and morality, and promised my mother that he would give a good account of my person in the dangers of the war but I hope he will keep his word better as to this last article than he has done to the former. My equipage was sent away a week before me. This was so much time gained by my mother to give me good advice. At length, after having solemnly enjoined me to have the fear of God before my eyes and to love my neighbor as myself, she suffered me to depart under the protection of the Lord and the sage Brennan. At the second stage we quarreled. He had received 400 Louis d'Or for the expenses of the campaign. I wished to have the keeping of them myself, which he strenuously opposed. Thou old scoundrel, said I, is the money thine, or was it given thee for me? You suppose I must have a treasurer and receive no money without his order. I know not whether it was from a presentiment of what afterwards happened that he grew melancholy, However, it was with the greatest reluctance and the most poignant anguish that he found himself obliged to yield. One would have thought that I had wrested his very soul from him. I found myself more light and merry after I had eased him of his trust. He, on the contrary, appeared so overwhelmed with grief that it seemed as if I had laid four hundred pounds of lead upon his back instead of taking away those four hundred louis. He went on so heavily that I was forced to whip his horse myself, and turning to me now and then, Ah, sir, said he, my lady did not think it would be so. His reflections and sorrows were renewed at every stage, for instead of giving a shilling to the postboy, I gave him half a crown. Having at last reached Lyon, two soldiers stopped us at the gate of the city to carry us before the governor. 
I took one of them to conduct me to the best inn, and delivered Brennan into the hands of the other, to acquaint the commandant with the particulars of my journey and my future intentions. There are as good taverns at Lyon as at Paris, but my soldier, according to custom, carried me to a friend of his own, whose house he extolled as having the best accommodations and the greatest resort of good company in the whole town. The master of this hotel was as big as a hogshead. His name Cerise, a Swiss by birth, a poisoner by profession, and a thief by custom. He showed me into a tolerably neat room, and desired to know whether I pleased to sup by myself or at the ordinary. I chose the latter on account of the beau which the soldier had boasted of. Brennan, who was quite out of temper at the many questions which the governor had asked him, returned more surly than an old ape, and seeing that I was dressing my hair in order to go downstairs, "'What are you about now, sir?' said he. "'Are you going to tramp about the town?' No, no, have we not had tramping enough ever since the morning? Eat a bit of supper and go to bed betimes, that you may get on horseback by daybreak. Mr. Comptroller, said I, I shall neither tramp about the town, nor eat alone, nor go to bed early. I intend to sup with the company below. At the ordinary, cried he, I beseech you, sir, do not think of it. Devil take me if there be not a dozen brawling fellows playing at cards and dice, who make noise enough to drown the loudest thunder. I was grown insolent since I had seized the money, and being desirous to shake off the yoke of a governor. Do you know, Mr. Brennan, said I, that I don't like a blockhead to set up for a reasoner? Do you go to supper, if you please, but take care that I have post-horses ready before daybreak. The moment he mentioned cards and dice, I felt the money burn in my pocket. I was somewhat surprised, however, to find the room where the ordinary was served filled with odd-looking creatures. My host, after presenting me to the company, assured me that there were but eighteen or twenty of those gentlemen who would have the honor to sup with me. I approached one of the tables where they were playing and thought that I should have died with laughing. I expected to have seen good company in deep play, but I only met with two Germans playing at backgammon. Never did two country boobies play like them, but their figures beggared all description. The fellow near whom I stood was short, thick, and fat, and as round as a ball, with a rough and a prodigious high-crowned hat. Any one at a moderate distance would have taken him for the dome of a church, with the steeple on the top of it. I inquired of the host who he was. A merchant from Basel, said he, who comes hither to sell horses, but from the method he pursues I think he will not dispose of many, for he does nothing but play. Does he play deep, said I? Not now, said he. They are only playing for their reckoning while supper is getting ready. But he has no objection to play as deep as any one. Has he money, said I? As for that, replied the treacherous Cerise, would to God you had won a thousand pistoles of him, and I went your halves, we should not be long without our money." I wanted no further encouragement to meditate the ruin of the high-crowned hat. I went nearer him in order to take a closer survey. Never was such a bungler. He made blots upon blots. God knows I began to feel some remorse at winning of such an ignoramus who knew so little of the game. And I desired him to sit next me. It was a long table, and there were at least five and twenty in company, notwithstanding the landlord's promise the most execrable repast that ever was begun being finished, all the crowd insensibly dispersed except the little Swiss who kept near me and the landlord who placed himself on the other side of me. They both smoked like dragons and the Swiss was continually saying in bad French, I ask your pardon, sir, for my great freedom, at the same time blowing such whiffs of tobacco in my face as almost suffocated me. Monsieur Cerise, on the other hand, desired he might take the liberty of asking me whether I had ever been in his country, and seemed surprised that I had so genteel an air without having traveled in Switzerland. The little chub I had to encounter was full as inquisitive as the other. He desired to know whether I came from the army in Piedmont, and having told him I was going thither, he asked me whether I had a mind to buy any horses, that he had about two hundred to dispose of, and that he would sell them cheap. I began to be smoked like a gammon of bacon, 
and being quite wearied out, both with their tobacco and their questions, I asked my companion if he would play for a single pistole at backgammon while our men were supping. It was not without great ceremony that he consented, at the same time asking my pardon for his great freedom. I won the game, I gave him his revenge, and won again. We then played double or quit. I won that too, and all in the twinkling of an eye, for he grew vexed and suffered himself to be taken in, so that I began to bless my stars for my good fortune. Brennan came in about the end of the third game to put me to bed. He made a great sign of the cross, but paid no attention to the signs I made him to retire. I was forced to rise to give him that order in private. He began to reprimand me for disgracing myself by keeping company with such a low-bred wretch. It was in vain that I told him he was a great merchant, that he had a great deal of money, and that he played like a child. He, a merchant, cried Brennan. Do not believe that, sir. May the devil take me if he is not some conjurer. Hold your tongue, old fool, said I. He is no more a conjurer than you are, and that is decisive. And to prove it to you, I am resolved to win four or five hundred pistoles of him before I go to bed. With these words, I turned him out, strictly enjoining him not to return or in any manner to disturb us. The game being done, the little Swiss unbuttoned his pockets to pull out a new four pistole piece, and presenting it to me, he asked my pardon for his great freedom, and seemed as if he wished to retire. This was not what I wanted. I told him we only played for amusement, that I had no designs upon his money, and that if he pleased I would play him a single game for his four pistoles. He raised some objections, but consented at last and won back his money. I was piqued at it. I played another game. Fortune changed sides. The dice ran for him. He made no more blots. I lost the game, another game, and double or quit. We doubled the stake and played double or quit again. I was vexed. He, like a true gamester, took every bet I offered and won all before him without my getting more than six points in eight or ten games. I asked him to play a single game for 100 pistoles, but as he saw I did not stake, he told me it was late, that he must go and look after his horses, and went away, still asking my pardon for his great freedom. The cool manner of his refusal, and the politeness with which he took his leave, provoked me to such a degree that I almost could have killed him. I was so confounded at losing my money so fast, even to the last pistole, that I did not immediately consider the miserable situation to which I was reduced. I durst not go up to my chamber for fear of Brennan. By good luck, however, he was tired with waiting for me and had gone to bed. This was some consolation, though but of short continuance. As soon as I was laid down, all the fatal consequences of my adventure presented themselves to my imagination. I could not sleep. I saw all the horrors of my misfortune without being able to find any remedy. In vain did I rack my brain. It supplied me with no expedient. I feared nothing so much as daybreak, however it did come, and the cruel Brennan along with it. He was booted up to the middle and cracking a cursed whip which he held in his hand. Up, Monsieur le Chevalier, cried he, opening the curtains. The horses are at the door, and you are still asleep. We ought by this time to have ridden two stages. Give me money to pay the reckoning. Brennan, said I in a dejected tone, draw the curtains. What? cried he. Draw the curtains? Do you intend then to make your campaign at Lyon? You seem to have taken a liking to the place. And for the great merchant, you have stripped him, I suppose. No, no, Monsieur de Chevalier, this money will never do you any good. This wretch has perhaps a family, and it is his children's bread that he has been playing with, and that you have won. Was this an object to sit up all night for? What would my lady say if she knew what a life you lead? Monsieur Brennan, said I, pray draw the curtains. But instead of obeying me, one would have thought that the devil had prompted him to use the most pointed and galling terms to a person under such misfortunes. And how much have you won, said he, five hundred pistoles? What must the poor man do? Recollect, Monsieur de Chevalier, what I have said, this money will never thrive with you. It is perhaps but four hundred, three, two. 
Well, if it is but one hundred louis d'ors, continued he, seeing that I shook my head at every sum which he had named, there is no great mischief done. One hundred pistoles will not ruin him, provided you have won them fairly. Friend Brennan, said I, fetching a deep sigh, draw the curtains. I am unworthy to see daylight. Brennan was much affected by these melancholy words, but I thought he would have fainted when I told him the whole adventure. He tore his hair, made grievous lamentations, the burden of which still was, What will my lady say? And, after having exhausted his unprofitable complaints, What will become of you now, Monsieur de Chevalier? said he. What do you intend to do? Nothing, said I, for I am fit for nothing. After this, being somewhat eased after making him my confession, I thought upon several projects, to none of which could I gain his approbation. I would have had him post after my equipage to have sold some of my clothes. I was for proposing to the horse dealer to buy some horses of him at a high price on credit to sell again cheap. Brendan laughed at all these schemes, and after having had the cruelty of keeping me upon the rack for a long time, he at last extricated me. Parents are always stingy towards their poor children. My mother intended to have given me five hundred louis doors, but she kept back fifty, as well for some little repairs in the abbey as to pay for praying for me. Brennan had the charge of the other fifty, with strict injunctions not to speak of them unless upon some urgent necessity. And this, you see, soon happened. Thus you have a brief account of my first adventure. Play has hitherto favored me, for since my arrival I have had at one time, after paying all expenses, fifteen hundred louis doors. Fortune has now again become unfavorable, we must mend her. Our cash runs low, we must therefore endeavor to recruit. Nothing is more easy, said Mata. It is only to find out such another dupe as the horse dealer at Lyon. But now I think on it, has not the faithful Brennan some reserve for the last extremity? Faith, the time is now come, and we cannot do better than to make use of it. Your raillery would be very seasonable, said the Chevalier. If you knew how to extricate us out of this difficulty, you must certainly have an overflow of wit to be throwing it away upon every occasion as at present. What the devil will you always be bantering without considering what a serious situation we are reduced to? Mind what I say, I will go tomorrow to the headquarters, I will dine with the Count de Cameron, and I will invite him to supper. Where, said Mata? Here, said the Chevalier. You are mad, my poor friend, replied Mata. This is some such project as you formed at Lyon. You know we have neither money nor credit, and to re-establish our circumstances you intend to give a supper? Stupid fellow, said the Chevalier. Is it possible that, so long as we have been acquainted, you should have learned no more invention? The Count de Cameron plays at Ginn's, and so do I. We want money. He has more than he knows what to do with. I will bespeak a splendid supper. He shall pay for it. Send your maitre de hotel to me, and trouble yourself no farther, except in some precautions which it is necessary to take on such an occasion. What are they? said Mata. I will tell you, said the Chevalier, for I find one must explain to you things that are as clear as noonday. You command the guards that are here, don't you? As soon as night comes on, you shall order fifteen or twenty men under the command of your sergeant, Laplace, to be under arms and to lay themselves flat on the ground between this place and the headquarters. What the devil, cried Mata, an ambuscade? God forgive me. I believe you intend to rob the poor Savoyard. If that be your intention, I declare I will have nothing to do with it. Poor devil, said the Chevalier, the matter is this. It is very likely that we shall win his money. The Piedmontese, though otherwise good fellows, are apt to be suspicious and distrustful. He commands the horse, you know you cannot hold your tongue, and are very likely to let slip some jest or other that may vex him. Should he take it into his head that he is cheated and resent it, who knows what the consequences might be, for he is commonly attended by eight or ten horsemen. Therefore, however he may be provoked at his loss, it is proper to be in such a situation as not to dread his resentment. Embrace me, my dear Chevalier, said Mata, holding his sides and laughing. 
Embrace me, for thou art not to be matched. What a fool was I to think, when you talked to me of taking precautions, that nothing more was necessary than to prepare a table and cards, or perhaps to provide some false dice. I should never have thought of supporting a man who plays at gins by a detachment of foot. I must indeed confess that you are already a great soldier. The next day everything happened as the Chevalier Gourmand had planned it. The unfortunate Cameron fell into the snare. They supped in the most agreeable manner possible. Mata drank five or six bumpers to drown a few scruples which made him somewhat uneasy. The Chevalier de Gourmand shone as usual and almost made his guests die with laughing, whom he was soon after to make very serious. And the good nature of Cameron ate like a man whose affections were divided between good cheer and a love of play. That is to say, he hurried down his victuals that he might not lose any of the precious time which he had devoted to Gins. Supper being done, the Sergeant Laplace posted his ambuscade, and the Chevalier de Gramont engaged his man. The perfidy of Cerise and the high-crowned hat were still fresh in remembrance and enabled him to get the better of a few grains of remorse and conquer some scruples which arose in his mind. Mata, unwilling to be a, a spectator of violated hospitality, sat down in an easy chair in order to fall asleep while the chevalier was stripping the poor count of his money. They only staked three or four pistoles at first, just for amusement, but Cameron, having lost three or four times, he staked high, and the game became serious. He still lost and became outrageous. The cards flew about the room, and the exclamations awoke Mata. As his head was heavy with sleep and hot with wine, he began to laugh at the passion of the Piedmontese instead of consoling him. Faith, my poor count, said he, if I was in your place, I would play no more. Why so, said the other. I don't know, said he, but my heart tells me that your ill luck will continue. I will try that, said Cameron, calling for fresh cards. Do so, said Mata, and fell asleep again. It was but for a short time. All cards were equally unfortunate for the loser. He held none but tens or court cards, and if by chance he had gins, he was sure to be the younger hand, and therefore lost it. Again he stormed. Did I not tell you, said Mata, starting out of his sleep? All your storming is in vain. As long as you play, you will lose. Believe me, the shortest follies are the best. Leave off, for the devil may take me if it is possible for you to win. Why, said Cameron, who began to be impatient. Do you wish to know, said Mata? Why, faith, it is because we are cheating you. The Chevalier de Gramont, provoked at so ill-timed a jest, more especially as it carried along with it some appearance of truth. Monsieur Mata, said he, do you think it can be very agreeable for a man who plays with such ill luck as a count to be pestered with your insipid jests? For my part, I am so weary of the game that I would desist immediately if he was not so great a loser. Nothing is more dreaded by a losing gamester than such a threat, and the count in a softened tone told the chevalier that Monsieur Mata might say what he pleased if he did not offend him, that as to himself it did not give him the smallest uneasiness. The Chevalier de Gramont gave the Count far better treatment than he himself had experienced from the Swiss at Lyon, for he played upon credit as long as he pleased, which Cameron took so kindly that he lost 1,500 pistoles and paid them the next morning. As for Mata, he was severely reprimanded for the intemperance of his tongue. All the reason he gave for his conduct was that he made it a point of conscience not to suffer the poor Savoyard to be cheated without informing him of it. Besides, said he, it would have given me pleasure to have seen my infantry engaged with his horse if he had been inclined to mischief. This adventure, having recruited their finances, fortune favored them the remainder of the campaign, and the Chevalier de Gramont, to prove that he had only seized upon the Count's effects by way of reprisal, and to indemnify himself for the losses he had sustained at Lyon, began from this time to make the same use of his money that he has been known to do since upon all occasions. He found out the distressed in order to relieve them, officers who had lost their equipage in the war or their money at play, soldiers who were disabled in the trenches, 
In short, everyone felt the influence of his benevolence, but his manner of conferring a favor exceeded even the favor itself. Every man possessed of such amiable qualities must meet with success in all his undertakings. The soldiers knew his person and adored him. The generals were sure to meet him in every scene of action and sought his company at other times. As soon as fortune declared for him, his first care was to make restitution by desiring Cameron to go his halves in all parties where the odds were in his favor. End of section 25, read by Bryce Cries. Section 26 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. Father LeBlanc Makes a Call from But Yet a Woman by Arthur Sherburne Hardy. Arthur Sherburne Hardy, born 1847. A special taste for the abstract in mathematics, along with a practical interest in the military profession, do not generally enter into the stuff out of which romance writers and poets are made. Mr. Hardy, however, is an interesting example of the temperament that takes hold of both the real and the ideal. Successively, a hard-working professor of civil engineering and applied mathematical science, in two or three institutions, he has built up a reputation in Bayes letters by working in them with an industry that has given him a distinctive place in what he once reckoned only an avocation. Mr. Hardy was born in 1847 at Andover, Massachusetts. By school life at Neuchâtel, Switzerland, he was early put into touch with French letters and French life. After a single year at Amherst College, he entered the West Point Military Academy, graduating in 1869. He became a second lieutenant in the 3rd Artillery Regiment, saw some soldier life during 1869 and 1870, and then resigned from the service to become a professor of civil engineering at Iowa College for a brief time. In 1874, he went abroad to take a course in scientific bridge building and road constructing in Paris, returning to take a professorship in that line of instruction at the Chandler Scientific School connected with Dartmouth College. He assumed a similar professorship at Dartmouth College in 1878, this position in connection with which he published at least one established textbook, Elements of Quaternions, followed by his translation of Argonne's Imaginary Quantities, by his own analytical geometry and by other practical works in applied mathematics. He held until recently, when he became undividedly a man of letters and an editor of a well-known magazine. Mr. Hardy in literature is a novelist and a poet. His stories are three in number. The first one, But Yet a Woman, 1883, is of peculiar grace, united with firmness of construction, with a decided French touch in the style, especially as to its epigrammatic flash, and with types of careful, if delicate, definiteness prominent in it, particularly in the delineation of Father Leblanc, the philosophic and kindly curé. A story of more subtle psychologic quality the wind of destiny came a little later, its scenery and characters partly French and partly American, and its little drama a tragic one. Passe Rose, a quasi-historic novel, dealing with the days and court of Charlemagne, the heroine of it a dancing girl, with a princess as her rival in love, 
appeared first as a serial in the Atlantic Monthly in 1888, to be published as a book in 1889. It is a romance of that human quality which meets with a response in every novel reader's heart. Mr. Hardy's heroines are all charming, but he has presented us to no more winning type than this flower of a medieval day, with the hues of the southern sea in her eyes and under the rose-brown flush of her skin, the sound of its waves and the ripple of her laughter. Father LeBlanc makes a call and preaches a sermon from But Yet a Woman, copyright 1883 by author S. Hardy, and reprinted by permission of Houghton Mifflin and Company, Publishers, Boston. Father LeBlanc had a profound belief in human agencies. He loved to play the ministering angel, for his heart was a well of sympathy. There was even a latent chiding of providence at the bottom of this well sometimes, when the sight of the poor and suffering stirred its depths with pity for those lonely wayfarers who, neglected by this world, seem forgotten also of God. This was but one of those many themes which his mind, at once simple, honest, and profound, turned over and over reflectively, never seeing its one aspect except as on the way to the other. The difficulty does not lie in believing the truths of the church, he once said, but in those other things which we must believe also. Or again, belief is an edifice never completed, because we do not yet comprehend its plan. And every day some workman brings a new stone from the quarry. So that while Father LeBlanc was very devout, he was not a devotee. He flavored his religious belief with the salt of a good sense, against which he endeavored to be on his guard as he was even against his charity and compassion. The vision of Milton's fallen spirit, beating its wings vainly in a non-resisting air, drew from his heart a profound sigh. His thoughts turned very naturally to Stephanie and her journey that day, for he was on the way to secure the nineteenth volume of the Viaje de España of Ponce, for which he had been long on the search, and which awaited him at last on the Quai Voltaire. Those old books which filled the shelves of his room in the Rue Ticatone had left his purse a light one. But, said Father LeBlanc, I am not poor, since I have what I want. After possessing himself of his coveted book, he took up his way along the quay with his treasure under his arm. I have a mind to call on her, he said, still thinking of Stephanie. The art of knowing when one is needed is more difficult than that of helping. And he paused on the curbstone to watch a company of the line coming from the caserne of the Cité. A carriage, arrested a moment by the passage of the troops, approached the spot where he was standing, and he recognized Monsieur de Morzac. The priest was evidently sauntering, and Monsieur de Morzac called to his driver to stop. I see you are out for a promenade, he said. Accept this seat beside me, and take a turn with me in the boys. Father LeBlanc was not in his second childhood, for he had not yet outgrown his first. Consequently, the temptation was a strong one. But M. de Merzac was no favorite of his, and not even the fine day, nor this opportunity to enjoy it, could counterbalance M. de Merzac's company. Dislike at first sight is more common than love as discord is more common than harmony. So he excused himself as about to make a visit. 
well then that decides it he said to himself as he trudged down the quay with the gait of a man with an object in view now i must go at the door of the hotel in the boulevard st germain he stopped a moment before entering and took a deep inspiration to tell the truth the day was so fine he regretted going indoors i feel that i have a pair of lungs he said as he rang the porter's bell stephanie was not expecting a visit from father leblanc yet was glad to see him she was in that period which lies after decision and before action when having made all her preparation for an early start in the express of the next morning there was nothing to be done but sit down and wait for the hour of departure the air is so pure that i feared to find you were out and you go to-morrow yes stephanie said si dios quiere as the spaniards say but i shall be there before you i leave this evening this evening and without fatigue said the priest mysteriously drawing his volume from under his arm it is my nineteenth journey you have been to spain said stephanie taking the book but still perplexed oh never except in those leaves which you are turning and for two reasons he added laughingly the guide-books tell us that there are in spain priests by the thousand but not a single cook still you perceive that i am about to follow you and who knows shall perhaps lodge at the same inn that is a country in which nothing becomes obsolete and i have no doubt but that if you inquire for it they will show you in toboso the very fonda at which don quixote dismounted stephanie thought she heard in this pleasantry something more than was said certainly father leblanc had not even whispered though you are going away my child i shall follow you in my thoughts and in my prayers and yet that was what she heard some of his most commonplace sentences were so many half-hidden channels such as the brooks made under the grass of the meadows into which overflowed the currents of his sympathy and kindliness in spite of a strong natural reserve an invincible trust in this homely face crowned with white hairs mastered her you are very good to think of me father she said in a voice so full that it brought straight from his heart the message he had come to deliver all who suffer are my children and you suffer and that grieves me the master who took upon himself the sorrows of the world bade his followers imitate him why will you not lean a little upon me daughter i am an old man who has travelled the path before you she turned her eyes upon him and they said i do not speak but read and comfort me the sorrow is a very real thing he continued in a voice full of sweetness and authority it is neither a morbid nor an unhealthy state when it seems deepest when after all the world has failed us self also proves insufficient it may even be a blessed one i do not chide i even agree with you but i wish you also to agree with me be our life wide or narrow whether we live humbly or sit on a throne whether we dwell on our own thoughts in the midst of action or in the search of pleasure we come to the verdict of the hebrew king that verdict which i read in your face and which broods over your life all is emptiness and vanity it is not the range but the depth of our experience which convinces us and from the first we apprehend this truth dimly we own this sad statue of sorrow in the block from the outset 
before experience chisels it out for us and in our first search for happiness when we look on the splendors of the young world for what they do not contain it is this imitation of what they cannot yield in the capacity of our own natures which both allure and deceive us she seemed to be listening to the story of her own life and as we live on this conviction deepens the voices without echo and reinforce those within we are ever looking to something better than we have or are and whether we attain it or lose it there is no rest for our feet it is the man who is fooled and deluded that is to be pitied he who finds life and self sufficient is either a monster or a caricature do you not see that i do not argue with your tears but do not think to dry them in spain my child sorrow is the handmaid of god not of satan she would lead us as you did the psalmist to say who will show us any good but after having said this we may also say with him lord lift thou the light of thy countenance upon us all else is a broken cistern said father leblanc taking up his thoughts after a pause see how time deceives us he covers the sore he even heals the wound but gives no immunity from a fresh one stephanie's eyes fell god only renders us superior to calamity honestly said he lifting his hands as if he appealed to his own conscience priest of god though i am in understanding i am as a child i cannot explain i testify i witness to you this mystery that out of the very hurt which brings me low the spiritual life is developed and he added as he would the benediction to a discourse at st eustache blessed are the poor in spirit blessed are they which mourn blessed are they which hunger and thirst for these are they which shall be filled for theirs is the kingdom of heaven how much soever of gratefulness she felt for these words she could not answer them had he held her hand her answer would have been a pressure but father leblanc was not hurt by her silence though words bubbled easily over his lips none better knew the difficulty of sometimes saying thank you he sat quietly smoothing the wrinkles of his soutane over his broad knee with his eyes on the floor when you return he said at last looking up i shall ask you all the questions which are not answered in my nineteen volumes think of it at my age never to have seen the sea yet i have lain stretched out on its yellow sands in the sun listening to the music of its blue waves in the rue Tiqueton. and when i go to my window at night it is to stand on the summit of some high cliff and the roar of the city is that of the sea at its base chained as we are to our little patrimony in the rue ticketon the imagination is a free rover in space and time i wager you are surprised to hear an old man talk of imagination he said taking her share of the conversation and putting in her mouth the replies which he wished to answer imagination which is supposed to belong only to youth i say rather youth belongs to imagination which is then a wild barbary colt 
and carries one wherever it wills but at my age it has become domesticated and it is on its back that i have ridden as did sancho on that of his patient donkey over all the byways of spain and when you see some worthy colleague of mine on his ass plodding before you with a shovel hat on his head a metre in length you shall say to yourself there is my friend ahead of me her hands crossed on her knees plunged in a delicious reverie which his voice penetrated without disturbing stephanie raised her eyes to his face and smiled he took his book from the table where she had laid it and put it under his arm again he had dropped his few seeds of comfort and was ready to permit god to water them so he sought an excuse to go i am like a schoolboy he said tapping the volume with a new copy-book who cannot rest until he has written something on the first page what a good friend this book will be i count upon him in advance and his eyes spoke to hers he will not speak unless i question him we shall perchance differ profoundly but he will not reproach me i shall rifle his pockets and put him aside at my pleasure yet he will not feel neglected i shall invite him to-night to a tete-a-tete before my fire and fall asleep while he is doing his best to entertain me but when i awake his countenance will be unruffled doubtless because all the while he is aware that i still prize him what strange things we do to those whom we love absolutely madam said father leblanc rising and with a self-accusing gesture i am an inveterate sermonizer and i have not given you even the opportunity to interrupt me stephanie followed him to the door of the room and at the threshold put her hand softly upon his arm thanks father for this visit she said her voice was low it was all she said but her look and that gesture were more eloquent than words i say to you as they will say to you in spain replied father leblanc go your way with god my daughter when he had gone she went to the window and watched him as he crossed the courtyard following him out through the gates where he stopped to say something to the porter who touched his hat to him she seated herself there in the wide open window which projected over the area as did its counterpart at the other end of the room over the garden in the rear flanked by two long and narrow projections this courtyard with its large paving blocks of stone was not very inviting in its aspect it was in the other window overhanging the garden whose casement the trees brushed over which the vines swayed with the wind that she loved to sit but her thoughts were far away it was still early in the afternoon but the sun went slowly down behind the tall roofs of the neighboring houses before she rose to do what greatly surprised lisette who thought madame altogether too much of a saint for a woman who neglected mass and confession when madame was dressed and lisette had taken her place beside her in the carriage she wondered at the route taken by the coachman whose instructions she had not overheard she supposed they were going to the bois or the parc monceau and still greater was her surprise when she found herself a little later in saint eustache placing a chair for madame at the vesper service it was nearly over father leblanc himself in the pulpit was finishing his exhortation the words of the preacher gathered force from the immense space in which they were uttered from those dim aspiring vaults into which they were gathered and where they died away without a confusing murmur break your theological rocks o ritual hating brother on the king's highway and worship him after your own fashion 
for every wayfaring heart overfed upon these symbols you shall show us one starved on your formula not only for thy weaker brother to whom god has not given the brains of the doctors in the temple shall these vaults of stone be the very arches of heaven not only for thy frailer sister in the keeping of whose warm heart god has placed the sacred things of this life shall the incense of this swinging censer be the very fragrance of celestial fields that into many of thine own dignity also shall this star above the altar be the very star of bethlehem my children father leblanc was saying you put all your treasures into earthen vessels your aspirations so noble soar upward like the branches of the tree but your roots are in the earth that you must certainly leave all your faith which will not take denial all your hopes which will not be gainsaid all your wide embracing affections you place in humanity and a few frail hearts which cannot meet the infinity of your need and of your desire but all these things which must fail you and pass away which you have perchance already gauged and found wanting why will you put them in the place of heaven to which you go to live forever in the place of god whose love knows no variableness nor shadow of turning it is not i who undervalue them it is you who overestimate them measure them rightly and i shall no longer be to you a prophet of woe or a sorrowful comforter love them without sacrificing yourself to them make them the rivers that water your life and also the rivers that bear you to the infinite sea into which they shall be merged then shall this life cease to be for you a veil of tears walled about with tombs and become the pathway to your abiding country its beauties shall not satiate if you see behind them the world of spiritual beauty what will it matter to you that its fetters chafe that your soul discovers it is imprisoned when that end in which every beauty of flesh and color is engulfed is not an end but a beginning verily verily i say unto you whoso loses his life for my sake shall find it for my sake thought stephanie and father leblanc who had not seen his listener having sown the seed had left it humbly to god was himself permitted to water it end of section twenty six read by bill mosley leno county texas u s a march eighteenth twenty twenty three Section 27 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. Thomas Hardy. Thomas Hardy, born 1840, by Anna McClure Scholl. Thomas Hardy is one of that rare fellowship of novel writers who are actuated in their portrayal of life by a spirit as disinterested and as seemingly unsympathetic as the spirit of nature itself. His realism is indeed less than realism of art than of the raw material of everyday existence. His straightforward account of the changes and chances of this mortal state is unsoftened by optimistic prejudice. 
but precisely how far his creations are true to the facts of human experience is a matter of individual rather than of general judgment. An analysis of his most characteristic novels may show that their realism is after all one-sided and that they are closer exponents of a hardy theory regarding life than of life itself. What is this theory, and how is it embodied in Hardy's novels? Stating it briefly, it is that the law which governs human events is rendered just beyond calculation by an admixture of luck. There is just enough of chance in the moral order to warrant the implication of jugglery in the Ten Commandments. Acknowledging no creed, this most modern of modern novelists is eminently Calvinistic in his portrayal of men and women as predestined to misfortune or failure. As pulled about or tossed about at the impish pleasure of the God's circumstance. The keynote of his work indeed is the effect of circumstance, of luck, upon man's war with the lower elements in his nature. Some foreordained event for which he is in no wise responsible turns the tide of the battle against him, yet he is held accountable for his defeat. He reaps where he has not sown. He is overwhelmed with punishments for sins committed by others. He is literally badgered through life by the modern devil of ill luck. In a pair of blue eyes, the heroine Elfried is victimized by circumstances. The adverse star has already risen above her brow when the book opens. She goes artlessly as a child into the hopeless labyrinth of mischance from which death alone can release her. Tess is an innocent sinner, browbeaten by bad luck into a guilty one. So persistent is this evil fortune, this malign spell which might be broken by a word more or less, that Tess becomes well nigh an irresponsible being, a mere bruised flower floating on an irresistible current of doom. Between those two heroines, the one of Hardy's earliest, the other of his latest day, is a long sequence of men and women, all more or less handicapped by fortune. Their humanity is traceable with greater distinctness in their failures than in their successes. Hardy is perhaps the first novelist, except George Eliot, who has had the courage to portray failure. What he himself calls the optimistic grin which ends a story happily is never present in his work. His stories end much as the little dramas of real life end, in compromise, in the tacit acknowledgement that it is better to make the best of a bad bargain and so live on in the semblance of security than to die for the impossible. Hardy himself began to undergo life in 1840. At the age of 16, he entered upon the study of architecture. For several years he vacillated between literary pursuits and his chosen profession. His first novel, Desperate Remedies, published in 1870, showed at least that he was a good storyteller. Characteristically, the persons of the book were all engaged more or less in a tussle with adverse circumstances. But the melodramatic elements in the intricate plot remove it from the sphere of great art. Under the greenwood tree, followed fast upon desperate remedies. In this woodland story, Hardy first exhibits the fairest qualities of his genius. It is free from the taint of the battle door and shuttlecock conception of man and the almighty something in the clutch of which he wriggles. It is an idol of the fields, that wonderful grasp of rural life which marks Hardy out from his contemporaries and leaks him at times with Shakespeare, is here shown in its fullness. The smell of the primeval earth is here. Between Hardy and the rustic there is a living bond. Few authors have been able to do as he has done, to depict Hodge in his native fields in such a manner that the humorous aspect of the picture will be most apparent. Hardy's peasantry say nothing which is consciously witty. His art has discovered the unconscious humor of their homely talk. The serenade of the church choir in Under the Greenwood Tree, the gossip of the rustics opening a vault in A Pair of Blue Eyes, are rich in this elemental humor. So talk the clowns of Shakespeare. Grandfur Cantle is linked with Dogberry. Yet the clowns of Hardy have a worldly wisdom of their own. 
In The Return of the Native, the question of the advisability of church going is discussed by the natives of Edgen Heath. I ain't been there in three years, said Humphrey, for I'm so mortal sleepy of a Sunday, and tis so mortal far to get there, and when you do get there, tis such a mortal poor chance that you'll be chosen for up above, when so many baint, that I bide at home and don't go at all. Here are a few observations on dancing. You be bound to dance at Christmas because it's the time of the year. You must dance at weddings because it is the time of life. At christenings, folks will even smuggle in a reel or two if tis no further on than the first or second child. And this is not naming the songs you've got to sing. For my part, I like a good hearty funeral as well as anything. You've had splendid victuals and drink as at other parties, and even better, and it don't wear your legs to stumps and talking over a poor fellow's ways as it do to stand up in hornpipes. In A Pair of Blue Eyes, Hardy's third novel, he passes under the domination of one aspect of life which has impressed him most forcibly. Little Elfried, the blue-eyed heroine, the dainty child of the hills, formed by nature for tenderness and joy, is unlucky enough to have been beloved, before the story opens, by a village youth in her father's parish. She was not altogether unconscious of his far-off worship. She led him on a little. Through that slight girlish concession to a passing coquetry, she blights her life. Her punishment is out of all proportion to her offense. The youth pines away and dies. His mother becomes the active enemy of Alfred. She blackens a thoughtless adventure of the girls with a subsequent lover into a sin, and by means of this scandal alienates forever the one man above all others whom Elfried really loves. She in her turn tightens the miserable tangle of affairs by an over-exaggeration of her imprudence. She makes the mistakes of a schoolgirl and is punished for the sins of a woman. In The Return of the Native, it is a hero who plays this uneven game with chance, and chance, as so often happens in Hardy's novels, takes the form of a woman. It is Eustachia Vi, with pagan eyes full of nocturnal mysteries, who leads Clym Yilbright into the wilderness of love, stripped of his ambitions. Throw a woman into this bargaining matter of life, and its intricacies are increased tenfold, might be Hardy's motto in the treatment of his dainty heroines. And here a word may be said concerning these heroines. Hardy's women are even more real than his men. He understands woman nature, or rather the nature of the eternal woman, as opposed to the woman who is an artificial product of a period or of a system. Sue in Jude the Obscure is one of the striking exceptions to this rule. She is a type of the over-civilized, neurotic female who has unholy shivers over nature's pure ordinance of marriage. Happily, she has no predecessors. She has little in common with the warm, bright Bathsheba, with the tender, fair Lady Constantine, with demure little Anne, with the quaint and gentle Elizabeth Jane, with Elfried, or with the frankly human group of noble dames. Hardy's women are always lovable, and because they are so, they make men more or less irresponsible, and thus add to the confusion, the moral disorder, of which Hardy sees so much in the working out of character. In Two on a Tower, Lady Constantine draws the eyes of the boy astronomer from the stars to gaze into her own. She enters his life only to render his primitive, austere devotion to science forever impossible. Eustachia Vi leads Clime Yielbright, a devious dance in the direction of nowhere. Jude is purloined from a possible Oxford career, first by Arabella, then by Sue. But women are not altogether to blame for the mischief which is always brewing in Hardy's novels. The Mayor of Casterbridge is the story of a man hampered by himself. In a fit of drunkenness, he sells his wife and child to the highest bidder. For this hour of dissipation, he pays a lifetime of struggle and remorse. The irony of circumstance is ever present in Hardy's portrayal of the ambitions and good intentions of men and women. Their hopes and fears, so blind and yet so sweet, have always death about them to Hardy. The trickery of death, its hideous surprises, its untimely interventions. 
in life's little ironies, a middle-aged man laboring under the delusion that marriage can patch up our wrong done to a woman, heroically resolves to take this step after many years of cowardice. His melodramatic self-sacrifice to the woman once sacrificed to him is turned by the irony of circumstance into mere clumsiness since his appearance in the neglected little family ruins the chances of his daughter to make a match of smug respectability. In Fellow Townsmen, one of the Wessex tales, Lucy Saville, a middle-aged widow, says no to the man who has loved her and waited for her through many years because she does not think it good form to say yes at once. She sends a note after him, however, asking him to call again, but he has taken her at her word and has left the town forever. Such an incident has a marked resemblance to certain incidents of real life. Hardy has the courage always to tell a thing as it really happened, not as weak-hearted humanity would like it to happen. In Tess, Hardy has written the modern classic of misfortune. In Tess, the finest and most characteristic qualities of his art are focused. In the portrayal of this primitive tragedy, this spirit-rending story of a girl's struggle with destiny, Hardy has put forth his consummate effort. In Tess, the Calvinistic idea of fate, predestination, the treacherous power outside of ourselves which makes for confusion, as opposed to the rational Greek idea of pursuing punishment for sins committed, in Tess, this Calvinistic idea receives its finished embodiment. The subtle poison of the book lies in the false theory which actuated its production, not in the working out of the theory. Tess is a pure woman. The defiant subtitle is unnecessary. Only the inexperienced would wag their heads dubiously over it as they read the tale in sheltered and respectable parlors. Hardy, to the contrary, it is society, not the Almighty, which is to blame for the moral gaucherie for the malignant blunders which entrap Tess. Nature is non-moral. She herself would have put no obstacles in the way of the recuperation of this fair-souled, high-minded country lass knocked into the mud by a lustful hoof. The virginal spirit of the maiden would have regained the birthright violently snatched from her if conventional opinion in the form of Angel Clare had not intervened. This young man, half seraph, half prig, meets Tess at a dairy, miles away from the scene of her trouble. He is a gentleman's son, and the gentle nature in him is drawn to this rare wild flower sprung from the forgotten graves of the Duberville Knights. He loves the maiden Tess. On their marriage day he confesses a certain folly of his, a three days unholy fever with an unworthy woman. Tess gives back confession for confession. Claire, under the spell of false tradition, throws her from the heights which she has regained into the limbo of the hopeless. He cannot separate her body from her soul. He, the deliberate sinner, passes judgment on her, the sinned against. Rejected by love itself as unclean, Tess drifts on to her tragic doom. The mercifulness of nature and of God are alike unknown to her. Her case is against man. In Tess, Hardy has perhaps unconsciously stigmatized the man-made moral order. The soil which smells of grass and flowers in Under the Greenwood Tree, in Jude the Obscure, sends up a sour odor to the nostrils. If Tess is the classic of the unlucky, Jude is the classic of the neurotic woman. The hero has, after all, little to do with the working out of the story. His part is to a great degree passive. Like certain other heroes of Hardy, he is born under an evil star. His boyish ambition to become a student at Oxford is thwarted continually by the assertions of his lower nature, but, and this again is essentially in the spirit of Hardy, accident, chance, takes sides with his baser elements. He is tricked into marriage with the sensual Arabella. He has the misfortune to run across his cousin Sue at a time when it is most necessary for the accomplishment of his purpose that he should enter into the sexless temper of the scholar. Sue is intellectual, pseudo-passionate, morbidly pure. She is a type of the modern woman whose intellect is developed at the expense of her earthy nature. 
The awful innocence of Sue throughout the book is the innocence of the bold thinker whose flights of fancy reach to Mars, but who know nothing of the soil underfoot. It is futile to call the actions of the two bewildered children, Jude and Sue, immoral. A new adjective will have to be evolved to meet their essentially modern case. Jude is a book of an era where between one and one there is always a shadowy third. Hardy's novels of rustic life will give probably the most pleasure to coming generations. The chapters of the dairy life in Tess, the idol of the lush green meadows, will save her tragedy from oblivion. Far from the maddening crowd, with its troop of men and maidens of the fields, will give solace when a Leodician is well nigh forgotten. The trumpet major and the return of the native are revivingly sweet and clean with the breath of the sea and the heather-scented wind of the moors. In hardy stories of his beloved Wessex country there is the perennial refreshment of nature. His peasantry are primitive, their quaint humor, their wise saws, their hold upon Mother Earth might have been characteristic of the homely parents of the race in the first dawn of the world. They are representative of a magnificent antiquity. Hardy is as much in sympathy with the natural world as he is with those men and women who seem a part of the soil on which they live. He has a love of genius for the open air. Nature is a perpetual background for the scenes of his novels. And, as in Shakespeare, the aspect of nature reflects the moral atmosphere of the scene. The happiest time of Tessa's life begins in the flowery months of May and June. Her desolate existence, after she has been forsaken by her husband, coincides with the bitter, barren wintertime upon the upland moors. Elfried's love story seems well nigh a part of the processes of nature in its interchange of storm and sunshine. The majority of Hardy's people are near to nature, sensitive, passionate lovers of the sea and of the heath. His genius comprehends at once the natural, primitive man, and man the product of modern hypercultivation. In this wideness of human view lies perhaps his surest claim to greatness. Anna McClure Scholl. End of section 27. Read by Bryce Cries. Section 28 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. The Melstock Waits, from Under the Greenwood Tree, by Thomas Hardy. Shortly after ten o'clock, the singing boys arrived at the Tranter's house, which was invariably the place of meeting, and preparations were made for the start. The older men and musicians wore thick coats with stiff perpendicular collars, and colored handkerchiefs wound round and round the neck till the end came to hand, over all which they just showed their ears and noses like people looking over a wall. The remainder, stalwart, ruddy men and boys, were mainly dressed in snow-white smock frocks, embroidered upon the shoulders and breasts in ornamental forms of hearts, diamonds, and zigzags. The cider mug was emptied for the ninth time, the music books were arranged, and the pieces finally decided upon. The boys in the meantime put the old horn lanterns in order, cut candles to short lengths to fit the lanterns, and a thin fleece of snow having fallen since the early part of the evening, those who had no leggings went to the stable and wound wisps of hay round their ankles to keep the insidious flakes from the interior of their boots. Melstock was a parish of considerable acreage, the hamlets composing it lying at a much greater distance from each other than is ordinarily the case. Hence several hours were consumed in playing and singing within hearing of every family, even if but a single air were bestowed on each. There was East Melstock, the main village. Half a mile from this were the church and the vicarage, called West Melstock, and originally the most thickly populated portion. A mile northeast lay the hamlet of Lugate, 
where the tranter lived, and at other points knots of cottages beside solitary farmsteads and dairies. Old William Dewey, with a violoncello, played the bass, his grandson Dick, the treble violin, and Reuben and Michael Mayle, the tenor and second violins, respectively. The singers consisted of four men and seven boys, upon whom devolved the task of carrying and attending to the lanterns and holding the books open for the players. Directly music was the theme, old William ever and instinctively came to the front. Now mind, neighbors, he said as they all went out one by one at the door, he himself holding it ajar and regarding them with a critical face as they passed, like a shepherd counting out his sheep. You two counter boys keep your ears open to Michael's fingering, and don't ye go straying into the treble part along old Dick and his set as ye did last year. And mind this especially when we be in a rise and hail. Billy Chamlin, don't you sing quite so raving mad as you fain would. And all of you, whatever you do, keep from making a great scuffle on the ground when we go in at people's gates, but go quietly so as to strike up all of a sudden like spirits. Farmer Ledlow's first. Farmer Ledlow's first. The rest as usual. And Voss, said the tranter, terminatively. You keep house here till about half past two, then heat the methaglin and cider in the warmer you'll find turned upon the copper, and bring it with the victuals to church porch as the snow. Just before the clock struck twelve, they lighted the lanterns and started. The moon in her third quarter had risen since the snowstorm, but the dense accumulation of snow cloud weakened her power to a faint twilight, which was rather pervasive of the landscape than traceable to the sky. The breeze had gone down, and the rustle of their feet and tones of their speech echoed with an alert rebound from every post, boundary stone, and ancient wall they passed, even where the distance of the echo's origin was less than a few yards. Beyond their own slight noises, nothing was to be heard, save the occasional howl of foxes in the direction of Yalbury Wood, or the brush of a rabbit along the grass now and then as it scampered out of their way. Most of the outlying homesteads and hamlets had been visited by about two o'clock. They then passed across the home plantation toward the main village. Pursuing no recognized track, great care was necessary in walking, lest their faces should come in contact with the low-hanging boughs of the old trees, which in many spots formed dense undergrowths of interlaced branches. Times have changed from the times they used to be, said Mail, regarding nobody can tell what interesting old panoramas from an inward eye, and letting his outward glance rest on the ground because it was as convenient a position as any. People don't care much about us now. I've been thinking we must be almost the last left in the country of the old string players, barrel organs, and they next door to them that you blow with your foot have come in terribly of late years. Ah, said Bowman, shaking his head, and old William, on seeing him, did the same thing. More's the pity, replied another. Time was, long and merry ago now, when not one of the varmints had to be heard of, but it served some of the choirs right. They should have stuck to strings as we did, and kept out of clarinets and done away with serpents. If you thrive in musical religion, stick to strings, says I. Strings are well enough as far as that goes, said Mr. Spinks. There's worse things than serpents, said Mr. Penny. Old things pass away, tis true, but a serpent was a good old note. A deep, rich note was the serpent. Clarinets, however, be bad at all times, said Michael Mayle. One Christmas, years are gone now, years, I went the rounds with the, the beach choir. Twas a hard, frosty night, and the keys of all the clarinets froze. Ah, they did freeze, so that it was like drawing a cork every time a key was opened. The players all them had to go into hedgers and ditchers chimney corner and thaw their clarinets every now and then. An icicle of spit hung down from the end of every man's clarinet, a span long, and as to fingers, well there, if you'll believe me, we had no fingers at all to our knowledge. I can well bring back to my mind, said Mr. Penny, what I said to poor Joseph Rhyme, who took the trivial part in High Story Church for two and forty year when they thought of having clarinets there. Joseph, I said, says I, depend upon it. If so you be have them tooting clarinets, you'll spoil the whole set out. Clarinets were not made for the service of Providence. 
You can see it by looking at them, I said. And what came out? Well, my dear souls, the person set up a barrel organ on his own account within two years of the time I spoke, and the old choir went to nothing. As far as look is concerned, said the tranter, I don't for my part see that the fiddle is much nearer heaven than a clarinet. Tis farther off. There's always a rakish, scampish countenance about a fiddle that seems to say the wicked one had a hand in making on it. While angels may be supposed to play clarinets in heaven, or summit like em, if you may believe pictures. Robert Penny, you were in the right, broke in the eldest Dewey. They should have stuck the strings. Your brass man is brass, well and good. Your reed man is reed, well and good. Your percussion man is percussion, good again. But I don't care who hears me say it, nothing will speak to your heart with the sweetness of the man of strings. Strings forever, said little Jimmy. Strings alone would have held their ground against all the newcomers in creation. True, true, said Bowman. But the clarinets was death. Death they was, said Mr. Penny. And harmoniums, William continued in a louder voice and getting excited by these signs of approval. Harmoniums and barrel organs. Ah, and groans from Spinks. Be miserable. What shall I call them? Miserable. Sinners, suggested Jimmy, who made large strides like the men and did not lag behind like the other little boys. Miserable machines for such a divine thing as music. Right, William, and so they be, said the choir with earnest unanimity. By this time they were crossing to a wicket in the direction of the school, which, standing on a slight eminence on the opposite side of a cross lane, now rose in unvarying and dark flatness against the sky. The instruments were retuned, and all the band entered the enclosure, and joined by old William to keep upon the grass. Number 78, he softly gave out as they formed round in a semicircle, the boys opening the lanterns to get clearer light and directing their rays on the books, then passed forth into the quiet night an ancient and well-worn hymn, embodying Christianity in words peculiarly fitting the simple and honest hearts of the quaint characters who sang them so earnestly. Remember Adam's fall, O thou man, Remember Adam's fall from heaven to hell. Remember Adam's fall, how he hath condemned all, in hell perpetual, therefore to dwell. Remember God's goodness, O thou man. Remember God's goodness, his promise made. Remember God's goodness, he sent his son sinless, our ails for to redress, our hearts to aid. In Bethlehem he was born, O thou man. In Bethlehem he was born, for mankind's sake. In Bethlehem he was born, Christmas day in the morn. Our Savior did not scorn our faults to take. Give thanks to God alway, O thou man. Give thanks to God alway with heartfelt joy. Give thanks to God alway on this our joyful day. Let all men sing and say, Holy, Holy. Having concluded the last note, they listened for a minute or two, but found that no sound issued from the schoolhouse. Forty breaths, and then, Oh, what unbounded goodness, number 59, said William. This was duly gone through, and no notice whatever seemed to be taken of the performance. Surely tisn't an empty house, as befell us in the year 39 and 43, said old Dewey, with much disappointment. Perhaps you just come from some noble city and sneers at our doings, the tranter whispered. Odd rabbit her, said Mr. Penny, with an annihilating look at the corner of the school chimney. I don't quite stomach her, if this is it. Your plain music well done is as worthy as your other sort done bad, I believe, souls, so say I. Forty breaths, and then the last, said the leader, authoritatively. Rejoice ye, tenants of the earth, number sixty-four. At the close, waiting yet another minute, he said in a clear, loud voice, as he had said in the village at that hour and season for the previous forty years, A Merry Christmas to ye! When the expected stillness consequent upon the exclamation had nearly died out of them all, an increasing light made itself visible at one of the windows of the upper floor. 
It came so close to the blind that the exact position of the flame could be perceived from the outside. Remaining steady for an instant, the blind went upward from before it, revealing to thirty concentrated eyes a young girl, framed as a picture by the window architrave and unconsciously illuminating her countenance to a vivid brightness by a candle she held in her left hand, close to her face, her right hand being extended to the side of the window. She was wrapped in a white robe of some kind, while down her shoulders fell a twining profusion of marvelously rich hair in a wild disorder which proclaimed it to be only during the invisible hours of the night that such a condition was discoverable. Her bright eyes were looking into the gray world outside with an uncertain expression, oscillating between courage and shyness, which, as she recognized a semicircular group of dark forms gathered before her, transformed itself into a pleasant resolution. Opening the window, she said, lightly and warmly, Thank you, singers. Thank you. Together went the window quickly and quietly, and the blind started downward on its return to its place. Her fair forehead and eyes vanished, her little mouth, her neck and shoulders, all of her. Then the spot of candlelight shone nebulously as before. Then it moved away. How pretty, exclaimed Dick Dewey. If she'd been real waxwork, she couldn't have been comelier, said Michael Mayle. As near a thing to a spiritual vision as ever I wish to see, said Tranter Dewey fervently. Oh, sich I never, never see, said Leaf. All the rest, after clearing their throats and adjusting their hats, agreed that such a sight was worth singing for. Now to Farmer Shiner's and then replenish our insides, father, said the Tranter. Well, all my heart, said old William, shouldering his bass viol. Farmer Shiner's was a queer lump of a house, standing at the corner of a lane that ran obliquely to the principal thoroughfare. The upper windows were much wider than they were high, and this feature, together with a broad bay window where the door might have been expected, gave it by day the aspect of a human countenance turned askance and wearing a sly and wicked leer. Tonight nothing was visible but the outline of the roof upon the sky. The front of this building was reached and the preliminaries arranged as usual. Forty breasts and number thirty-two behold the morning star, said old William. They had reached the end of the second verse, and the fiddlers were doing the up bow stroke previously to pouring forth the opening chord of the third verse, when, without a light appearing or any signal being given, a roaring voice exclaimed, Shut up! Don't make your blaring row here! A fellow with a headache enough to split likes a quiet night. Slam went the window. Hello, that's an ugly blow for we artists, said the tranter in a keenly appreciative voice and turning to his companions. Finish the carol, all who will be friends of harmony, said old William commandingly, and they continued to the end. Forty breasts and number nineteen, said William firmly. Give it him well, the choir can't be insulted in this manner. A light now flashed into existence. The window opened, and the farmer stood revealed as one in a terrific passion. Drown him, drown him, the tranter cried, fiddling frantically. Play fortissimi and drown his spaking. Fortissimi, said Michael Mayle, and the music and singing waxed so loud that it was impossible to know what Mr. Shiner had said, was saying, or was about to say, but wildly flinging his arms and body about in the form of capital X's and Y's, he appeared to utter enough invectives to consign the whole parish to perdition. Very unseemly, very, said old William as they retired. Never such a dreadful scene in the whole round of my carol practice, never. And he a churchwarden. Only a drop of drink got into his head, said the tranter. Man's well enough when he's in his religious frame. He's in his worldly frame now. Must ask un to our bit of a party tomorrow night, I suppose, and so put in in track again. We bear no mortal man ill will. They now crossed twenty acres to proceed to the lower village, and met Voss with the hot mead and bread and cheese as they were crossing the churchyard. This determined them to eat and drink before proceeding further, and they entered the belfry. The lanterns were open, and the whole body sat round against the walls on benches and whatever else was available, and made a hearty meal. In the pauses of conversation, 
could be heard through the floor overhead a little world of undertones and creaks from the halting clockwork, which never spread further than the tower they were born in, and raised in the more meditative minds the fancy that here lay the direct pathway of time. Having done eating and drinking, the instruments were again tuned, and once more the party emerged into the night air. The gallery of Melstock Church had a status and sentient of its own. A stranger there was regarded with a feeling altogether differing from that entertained towards him by the congregation below, banished from the nave as an intruder whom no originality could make interesting, he was received above as a curiosity that no unfitness could render dull. The gallery, too, looked down upon and knew the habits of the nave to its remotest peculiarity and had an extensive stock of exclusive information about it. While the nave knew nothing of the gallery people beyond their loud-sounding minims and chest notes, such topics as the clerk was always chewing tobacco except at the moment of crying amen, that he had a dust hole in his pew, that during the sermon certain young daughters of the village had left off caring to read anything so mild as the marriage service for some years, and now regularly studied the one which chronologically follows it, that a pair of lovers touch fingers through a knot hole between their pews in the manner ordained by the great exemplars, Paramus and Thisbe, that Mrs. Ledlow, the farmer's wife, counted her money and reckoned her week's marketing expenses during the first lesson, all news to those below, were stale subjects here. Old William sat in the center of the front row, his violoncello between his knees and two singers on each hand. Behind him, on the left, came the treble singers and Dick, and on the right the tranter and the tenors. Farther back was old male with the altos and supernumeraries. But before they had taken their places, and while they were standing in a circle at the back of the gallery practicing a psalm or two, Dick cast his eyes over his grandfather's shoulder and saw the vision of the past night enter the porch door as methodically as if she had never been a vision at all. A new atmosphere seemed suddenly to be puffed into the ancient edifice by her movement, which made Dick's body and soul tingle with novel sensations. Directed by Shiner, the churchwarden, she proceeded to the short aisle on the north side of the chancel, a spot now allotted to a throng of Sunday school girls, and distinctly visible from the gallery front by looking under the curb of the furthermost arch on that side. Before this moment the church had seemed comparatively empty, now it was thronged, and as Miss Fancy rose from her knees and looked around her for a permanent place in which to deposit herself, Finally choosing the remotest corner, Dick began to breathe more freely the warm new air she had brought with her, to feel rushings of blood, and to have impressions that there was a tie between her and himself visible to all the congregation. Ever afterward, the young man could recollect individually each part of the service of that bright Christmas morning, and the minute occurrences which took place as its hours slowly drew along. The duties of that day dividing themselves by a complete line from the service of other times. The tunes they that morning essayed remained with him for years, apart from all others. Also the text, also the appearance of the layer of dust upon the capitals of the piers, that the holly bough in the chancel archway was hung a little out of the center. All the ideas, in short, that creep into the mind when reason is only exercising its lowest activity through the eye. By chance or by fate, another young man who attended Melstock Church on that Christmas morning had towards the end of the service the same instinctive perception of an interesting presence in the shape of the same bright maiden, though his emotion reached a far less developed stage. And there was this difference, too, that the person in question was surprised at his condition and sedulously endeavored to reduce himself to his normal state of mind. He was the young vicar, Mr. Maybold. End of section 28, read by Bryce Kreis. Section 29 of Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Rita Boutros. Library of the World's Best Literature, Ancient and Modern, Volume 17. Excerpts by Thomas Hardy, Part 2. Selection. Sociability in the Malt House, from Far from the Madding Crowd. Gabriel's nose was greeted by an atmosphere laden with the sweet smell of new malt. The conversation, which seemed to have been concerning the origin of the fire, immediately ceased, and every one ocularly criticized him, to the degree expressed, by contracting the flesh of their foreheads, and looking at him with narrow eyelids, as if he had been a light too strong for their sight. Several exclaimed meditatively, after this operation had been completed, "'Oh, tis the new shepherd, I believe. We thought we heard a hand pawn about the door for the bobbin, but weren't sure twere not a dead leaf blowed across,' said another. "'Come in, shepherd. Sure ye be welcome, though we don't know your name.' "'Gabriel Oak, that's my name, neighbors. The ancient maltster, sitting in the midst, turned at this, his turning being as the turning of a rusty crane. "'That's never Gable Oak's grandson over at Norcombe, never,' he said, as a formula expressive of surprise, which nobody was supposed for a moment to take literally.' "'My father and my grandfather were old men of the name of Gabriel,' said the shepherd placidly. "'Thought I knowed the man's face as I seed him on the rick. Thought I did. And where be ye trade now to now, shepherd?' "'Oh, I'm thinking abidin' here,' said Mr. Oak. "'Knowed your grandfather for years and years,' continued the maltster the words coming forth of their own accord as if the momentum previously imparted had been sufficient ah and did you knowed your grandmother and her too likewise knowed your father when he was a child why my boy jacob there and your father were sworn brothers that they were sure weren't ye jacob ay sure said his son a young man about sixty-five, with a semi-bald head and one tooth in the left centre of his upper jaw, which made much of itself by standing prominent, like a milestone in a bank. But twas Joe had most to do with him. However, my son William must a knowed the very man afore us, didn't ye, Billy, afore ye left Norcombe? No, twas Andrew says jacob's son billy a child of forty or thereabouts who manifested the peculiarity of possessing a cheerful soul in a gloomy body and whose whiskers were assuming a chinchilla shade here and there i can mind andrew said oak as being a man in the place when i was quite a child I, the other day, I and my youngest daughter, Liddy, were over at my grandson's christening, continued Billy. We were talking about this very family, and twas only last purification day in this very world, when the use money is gied away to the second best poor folk. You know, shepherd, and I can mind the day, because they all had to traipse up to the vestry. "'Yes, this very man's family. "'Come, shepherd, and drink. "'Tis gape and swaller with us. "'A drop of summit, but not of much account,' "'said the maltster, removing from the fire his eyes, "'which were vermilion red, "'and bleared by gazing into it for so many years. "'Take up the God forgive me, Jacob. "'See if tis warm, Jacob.' Jacob stooped to the God forgive me, which was a two-handled tall mug, standing in the ashes, cracked and charred with heat. It was rather furred with extraneous matter about the outside, especially in the crevices of the handles, the innermost curves of which may not have seen daylight for several years by reason of this incrustation thereon formed of ashes accidentally wetted with cider and baked hard. But to the mind of any sensible drinker the cup was no worse for that, being incontestably clean on the inside and about the rim. 
it may be observed that such a class of mug is called a god forgive me in weatherbury and its vicinity for uncertain reasons probably because its size makes any given toper feel ashamed of himself when he sees its bottom in drinking it empty jacob on receiving the order to see if the liquor was warm enough placidly dipped his forefinger into it by way of thermometer and having pronounced it nearly of the proper degree raised the cup and very civilly attempted to dust some of the ashes from the bottom with the skirt of his smock frock because shepherd oak was a stranger a clean cup for the shepherd said the maltster commandingly no not at all said gabriel in a reproving tone of considerateness i never fuss about dirt in its pure state and when i know what sort it is taking the mug he drank an inch or more from the depths of its contents and duly passed it to the next man oh, i wouldn't think of giving such trouble to neighbours in washing up when there is so much work to be done in the world already continued oak in a moister tone after recovering from the stoppage of breath which is occasioned by pulls at large mugs a right sensible man said jacob true true it can't be gainsaid observed a brisk young man mark clark by name a genial and pleasant gentleman whom to meet anywhere in your travels was to know to know was to drink with and to drink with was unfortunately to pay for and here's a mouthful of bread and bacon that missus have sent shepherd the cider will go down better with a bit of victuals don't ye chaw quite close shepherd for i let the bacon fall in the road outside as i was bringin it along and maybe tis rather gritty there tis clean dirt and we all know what that is as you say and you bain't a particular man we see shepherd true true not at all said the friendly oak don't let your teeth quite meet and you won't feel the sandiness at all ah tis wonderful what can be done by contrivance my own mind exactly neighbour oh he's his grandfather's own grandson his grandfather were just such a nice unparticular man said the maltster drink henry frey drink magnanimously said jan coggin a person who held st simonian notions of share and share alike where liquor was concerned as the vessel showed signs of approaching him in its gradual revolution among them having at this moment reached the end of a wistful gaze into mid-air henry did not refuse he was a man of more than middle age with eyebrows high up in his forehead who laid it down that the law of the world was bad with a long-suffering look through his listeners at the world alluded to as it presented itself to his imagination he always signed his name annery strenuously insisting upon that spelling and if any passing schoolmaster ventured to remark that the second e was superfluous and old-fashioned he received the reply that h e n e r y was the name he was christened and the name he would stick to in the tone of one to whom orthographical differences were matters which had a great deal to do with personal character mr jan coggan who had passed the cup to enery was a crimson man with a spacious countenance and private glimmer in his eye whose name had appeared on the marriage register of weatherbury and neighbouring parishes as best man and chief witness in countless unions of the previous twenty years he also very frequently filled the post of head godfather in baptisms of the subtly jovial kind come mark clark come there is plenty more in the barrel said jan ay that i will tis my only doctor replied mr clark who twenty years younger than jan coggan revolved in the same orbit he secreted mirth on all occasions for special discharge at popular parties 
why joseph poor grass he hadn't had a drop said mr coggan to a self-conscious man in the background thrusting the cup towards him such a modest man as he is said jacob smallbury why ye've hardly had strength of eye enough to look in our young missus face so i hear joseph all looked at joseph poorgrass with pitying reproach no i've hardly looked at her at all simpered joseph reducing his body smaller whilst talking apparently from a meek sense of undue prominence and when i seed her twas nothing but blushes with me poor feller said mr clark tis a curious nature for a man said jan coggan yes continued joseph poorgrass his shyness which was so painful as a defect filling him with a mild complacency now that it was regarded as an interesting study twere blush 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 with me every minute of the time when she was speaking to me oh, i believe ye joseph poorgrass for we all know ye to be a very bashful man tis a awkward gift for a man poor soul said the maltster and how long have ye suffered from it joseph oh ever since i was a boy yes mother was concerned to her heart about it yes but twas all not did ye ever go into the world to try and stop it joseph poorgrass oh i tried all sorts of company they took me to green hill fair and into a great large jerry go nimble show where there were women folk riding round standing upon horses with hardly anything on but their smocks but it didn't cure me a morsel and then i was put errand man at the women's skittle alley at the back of the tailor's arms in casterbridge twas a horrible evil situation and a very curious place for a good man oh, i had to stand and look baddy people in the face from morning till night but twas no use oh, i was just as bad as ever after all blushes have been in the family for generations there tis a happy providence that i be no worse and i feel the blessing true said jacob smallbury deepening his thoughts to a profounder view of the subject tis a thought to look at that ye might have been worse but even as you be tis a very bad affliction for ye joseph for ye see shepherd though tis very well for a woman dang it all tis awkward for a man like him poor feller he appealed to the shepherd by a feeling glance tis tis said gabriel recovering from a meditation yes very awkward for the man ay and he's very timid too observed jan coggan once he had been working late at yelbury bottom and had had a drap of drink and lost his way as he was coming home along through yelbury wood didn't she master poor grass no 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 not that story expostulated the modest man forcing a laugh to bury his concern and so a lost himself quite continued mr coggan with an impassive face implying that a true narrative like time and tide must run its course and would respect no man and as he was coming along in the middle of the night much afeard and not able to find his way out of the trees no how a cried out man a lost man a lost a owl in a tree happened to be crying woo 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 as owls do you know shepherd gabriel nodded and joseph all in a tremble said joseph poor grass of weatherbury sir no no now that's too much said the timid man becoming a man of brazen courage all of a sudden i didn't say sir i'll take my oath i didn't say joseph poor grass o weatherbury sir no no what's right is right and i never said sir to the bird knowing very well that no man of a gentleman's rank would be hollering there at that time o night joseph poor grass of weatherbury 
that's every word i said and i shouldn't have said that if it hadn't been for keeper day's metheglin there twas a merciful thing attended where it did the question of which was right being tacitly waived by the company jan went on meditatively and he's the fearfulest man ain't ye joseph ay another time ye were lost by lammin down gate weren't ye joseph i was replied poor grass as if there were some conditions too serious even for modesty to remember itself under this being one yes that were the middle of the night too the gate would not open try how he would and knowing there was the devil's hand in it he kneeled down ay said joseph acquiring confidence from the warmth of the fire the cider and a perception of the narrative capabilities of the experience alluded to my art died within me that time but i kneeled down and said the lord's prayer and then the belief right through and then the ten commandments in earnest prayer but no the gate wouldn't open and then i went on with dearly beloved brethren and thinks i this makes four and tis all i know out of book and if this don't do it nothing will and i'm a lost man well when i got to sayin after me i rose from my knees and found the gate would open yes neighbours the gate opened the same as ever a meditation on the obvious inference was indulged in by all and during its continuance each directed his vision into the ash pit which glowed like a desert in the tropics under a vertical sun shaping their eyes long and liny partly because of the light partly from the depth of the subject discussed gabriel broke the silence what sort of a place is this to live at and what sort of a mistress is she to work under gabriel's bosom thrilled gently as he thus slipped under the notice of the assembly the innermost subject of his heart we dunno little love her nothing she only showed herself a few days ago her uncle was took bad and the doctor was called with his world-wide skill but you couldn't save the man as i take it she's going to keep on the farm that's about the shape of it i believe said jan coggan i tis a very good family i'd as soon be under em as under one here and there her uncle was a very fair sort of man did you know in shepherd a bachelor man not at all i used to go to his house a courtin my first wife charlotte who was his dairy mate well a very good-hearted man were farmer everdeen and i being a respectable young fellow was allowed to call and see her and drink as much ale as i liked but not to carry away any outside my skin i mean of course ay ay jan coggan we know your meanin and so you see twas beautiful ale and i wish to value his kindness as much as i could and not to be so ill-mannered as to drink only a thimbleful which would have been insultin the man's generosity true master coggan twould so corroborated mark clark and so i used to eat a lot of salt fish afore goin and then by the time i got there i was as dry as a lime basket so thoroughly dry that that ale would slip down ah twould slip down sweet happy times heavenly times such lovely drunks as i used to have at that house you can mind jacob you used to go with me sometimes i can i can said jacob that one too that we had at buck's head on a white monday was a pretty tipple twas but for a drunk of really a noble class that brought you no nearer to the dark man than you were afore you begun there was none like those in farmer everdeen's kitchen not a single damned allowed no not a bare poor one even at the most cheerful moment when all were blindest though the good old word of sin thrown in here and there at such times is a great relief to a merry soul 
true said the maltster nater requires her swearin at the regular times or she's not herself and unholy exclamations is a necessity of life gabriel thought fit to change the subject you must be a very aged man malter to have sons growed up so old and ancient he remarked father so old that i can't mind his age can ye father interposed jacob and he's growed terrible crooked too lately jacob continued surveying his father's figure which was rather more bowed than his own really one may say that father there is three double crooked folk will last a long while said the maltster grimly and not in the best humour shepherd would like to hear the pedigree of your life father wouldn't ye shepherd i that i should said gabriel with the heartiness of a man who had longed to hear it for several months what may your age be malter the maltster cleared his throat in an exaggerated form for emphasis and elongating his gaze to the remotest point of the ash pit said in the slow speech justifiable when the importance of a subject is so generally felt that any mannerism must be tolerated in getting at it well i don't mind the year i were born in but perhaps i can reckon up the places i've lived at and so get it that way i bowed at upper long puddle across there nodding to the north till i were eleven i bowed seven at kingsbere nodding to the east where i took to malton i went there from to norcombe and malted there two and twenty years and two and twenty years i was there turn up hoen and arviston i i know that old place norcombe years afore you were thought of master oak oak smiled a corroboration of the fact then i malted at durnover four year and four year turn up owen and i was fourteen times eleven months at millpond st jude's nodding northwest by north all oh, twills wouldn't tire me for more than eleven months at a time to keep me from being chargeable to the parish if so be i was disabled then i was three year at melstock and i've been here one and thirty year come candlemas how much is that hundred and seventeen chuckled another old gentleman given to mental arithmetic and little conversation who had hitherto sat unobserved in a corner well then that's my age said the maltster emphatically oh no father said jacob your turn up owen were in the summer and your malton in the winter of the same years and you don't ought to count both halves father chalk it all i lived through the summers didn't i that's my question i suppose you'll say next i be in no age at all to speak of sure we shan't said gabriel soothingly ye be a very old aged person malter attested jan coggan also soothingly we all know that and ye must have a wonderful talented constitution to be able to live so long mustn't ye neighbours true true ye must malter wonderful said the meeting unanimously the maltster being now pacified was even generous enough to voluntarily disparage in a slight degree the virtue of having lived a great many years by mentioning that the cup they were drinking out of was three years older than he while the cup was being examined the end of gabriel oak's flute became visible over his smock frock pocket and enery fray exclaimed surely shepherd i seed you blown into a great flute by now at casterbridge you did said gabriel blushing faintly i've been in great trouble neighbours and was driven to it i used not to be so poor as i be now never mind art said mark clark you should take it careless like shepherd and your time will come 
but we could thank ye for a tune if ye bain't too tired neither drum nor trumpet have i heard this christmas said jan coggan come raise a tune master oak ay that i will said gabriel readily pulling out his flute and putting it together a poor tool neighbours but such as i can do ye shall have and welcome oak then struck up jockey to the fair and played that sparkling melody three times through accenting the notes in the third round in a most artistic and lively manner by bending his body in small jerks and tapping with his foot to beat time ye can blow the flute very well that a can said a young married man who having no individuality worth mentioning was known as susan tall's husband he continued admiringly oi does leaf as not be able to blow into a flute as well as that he's a clever man and tis a true comfort for us to have such a shepherd murmured joseph poorgrass in a soft cadence we ought to feel real thanksgiving that he's not a player of baddy songs instead of these merry tunes for twould have been just as easy for god to have made the shepherd a loose low man a man of iniquity so to speak it as what he is yes for our wives and daughters sakes we should feel real thanksgiving true true real thanksgiving dashed in mark clark conclusively not feeling it to be of any consequence to his opinion that he had only heard about a word and three-quarters of what joseph had said yes added joseph beginning to feel like a man in the bible for evil do thrive so in these times that ye may be as much deceived in the cleanest shaved and whitest shirted men as in the raggedest tramp upon the turnpike if i may term it so ay i can mind your face now shepherd said henry fray criticising gabriel with misty eyes as he entered upon his second tune yes now i see ye blowin into the flute i know ye to be the same man i see play at casterbridge for your mouth were scrimped up and your eyes a starin out like a strangled man's just as they be now tis a pity that playin the flute should make a man look such a scarecrow observed mr mark clark with additional criticism of gabriel's countenance the latter person jerking out with the ghastly grimace required by the instrument the chorus of dame durden twas moll and bet and doll and kate and dorothy draggletail i hope you don't mind that young man mark clark's bad manners in naming your features whispered joseph to gabriel privately no not at all said mr oak for by nature ye be a very handsome man shepherd continued joseph poorgrass with winning suavity ay that ye be shepherd said the company thank ye very much said oak in the modest tone good manners demanded thinking however that he would never let bathsheba see him playing the flute selection the grave diggers by thomas hardy from a pair of blue eyes all eyes were turned to the entrance as stephen spoke and the ancient-mannered conclave scrutinized him inquiringly why tis our stephen said his father rising from his seat and still retaining the frothy mug in his left hand he swung forward his right for a grasp your mother is expectin ye thought you had a come afore dark but you'll wait and go home with me i have all but done for the day and was going directly yes tis master steffy sure enough glad to see you so soon again master smith said martin canister chastening the gladness expressed in his words by a strict neutrality of countenance in order to harmonize the feeling as much as possible with the solemnity of a family vault the same to you martin and you william said stephen nodding around to the rest 
who, having their mouths full of bread and cheese, were of necessity compelled to reply merely by compressing their eyes to friendly lines and wrinkles. "'And who is dead?' Stephen repeated. "'Lady Luxellian, poor gentlewoman, as we all shall,' said the under-mason. "'Aye, and we be going to enlarge the vault to make room for her.' "'When did she die?' "'Early this morning,' his father replied, with an appearance of recurring to a chronic thought. "'Yes, this morning. Martin have been tollin' ever since, almost. There, twas expected. She was very limber. "'Ah, poor soul, this morning,' resumed the under-mason, a marvellously old man, whose skin seemed so much too large for his body that it would not stay in position.' She must know by this time whether she's to go up or down, poor woman. What was her age? Not more than seven or eight, and twenty by candlelight. But, Lord, by day I was forty a hour an hour. Aye, night-time or day-time makes a difference of twenty years to rich females, observed Martin. She was one and thirty, really said john smith i had it from them that no not more than that i looked very bad poor lady in faith you might say she was dead for years afore i would own it as my old father used to say dead but wouldn't drop down i see her poor soul said a labourer from behind some removed coffins only but last valentine's day of all the world I was arming crook with my lord. I says to myself, you be ticketed churchyard, my noble lady, although you don't dream on it. I suppose my lord will write to all the other lords anointed in the nation, to let em know that she that was is now no more. Tis done and past. I see a bundle of letters go off an hour after the death, such wonderful black rims as their letters had, half an inch wide at the very least. Too much, observed Martin. In short, tis out of the question that a human being can be so mournful as black edges half an inch wide. I'm sure people don't feel more than a very narrow border when they feels most of all. And there are two little girls, are they or not? said Stephen. Nice, clean little faces, left motherless now. They used to come to Parson Swan Courts to play with Miss Elfright when I was there, said William Worm. Ah, oh, they did so's. The latter sentence was introduced to add the necessary melancholy to a remark which intrinsically could hardly be made to possess enough for the occasion. Yes, continued Worm, they'd run upstairs, they'd run down, flitting about with her everywhere. Very fond of her they were. Ah, well, fonder than ever they were of their mother, so tis said here and there, added a labourer. Well, you see, tis natural. Lady Luxellian stood aloof from em so, was so drowsy-like, that they couldn't love her in the jolly companion way children want to like folks only last winter i seed miss elfride talking to my lady and the two children and miss elfride wiped their noses for em so careful my lady never once seeing that it wanted doing and naturally children take to people that's their best friend be as twill the woman is dead and gone and we must make a place for her said john Come, lads, drink up your ale, and we'll just rid this corner, so as to have all clear for beginning at the wall, as soon as tis light to-morrow. Stephen then asked where Lady Luxellian was to lie. Here, said his father, we're going to set back this wall and make a recess, and tis enough for us to do before the funeral. When my lord's mother died, she said— john the place must be enlarged before another can be put in but i never expected twould be twould be wanted so soon better move lord george first i suppose simeon 
He pointed with his foot to a heavy coffin, covered with what had originally been red velvet, the color of which could only just be distinguished now. "'Just as ye think best, Master John,' replied the shriveled mason. "'Ah, poor Lord George!' he continued, looking contemplatively at the huge coffin. He and I were as bitter enemies once as any could be, when one is a lord and t'other only a mortal man. Poor fella! He'd clap his hand upon my shoulder, and cuss me as familiar and neighborly as if he'd been a common chap. Ay, a cussed me up hill and a cussed me down, and then I would rave out again, and the gold clamps of his fine new teeth would glisten in the sun like fetters of brass, while I, being a small man and poor, was fain to say nothing at all. Such a strappin' fine gentleman as he was, too. Yes, so I rather liked him sometimes. But once now and then, when I looked at his towering height, I'd think in my inside, what a weight you'll be, my lord, for our arms to lower under the aisle of Endelstow Church some day. "'And was he?' inquired a young labourer. "'He was. He was five hundred weight, if it were a pound. What with his lead and his oak and his handles and his one thing and t'other. Here the ancient man slapped his hand upon the cover, with a force that caused a rattle among the bones inside. "'He half broke me back when I took his feet to lower him down the steps there. "'Ah, saith I to John there,' Didn't I, John, that ever one man's glory should be such a weight upon another man? But there, I liked my Lord George sometimes. "'Tis a strange thought,' said another, "'that while they be all here under one roof, a snug united family o' Luxullians, they be really scattered miles away from one another, in the form of good sheep and wicked goats, isn't it?' true tis a thought to look at and that one if he's gone upward don't know what his wife is doing no more than the man in the moon if she's gone downward and that some unfortunate one in the hot place is a hollering across to a lucky one up in the clouds and quite forgetting their bodies be boxed close together all the time ay tis a thought to look at too that i can say hello close to fiery lord george and they can't hear me and that i be eatin my onion close to dainty lady jane's nose and she can't smell me what do em put all their heads one way for inquired a young man because tis churchyard law you simple the law the livin is that a man shall be upright and downright and the law of the dead is that a man shall be east and west Every state of society have its laws. We must break the law with a few of the poor souls, however. Come, a buckle too, said the master mason, and they set to work anew. End of section 29